Kimorio, integrating mental health uh, into primary care, as well as help for co-chair and co-founder and co-chair of the Latinx Mental Health Advocacy Concilio. I'm calling in support of the Social Connectivity Initiative, and I'm really glad to see that loneliness is finally being addressed as a public health issue. Uh, we at, at the Social Health White Memorial and our clinics have uh, seen a lot of the loneliness issues come uh, uh, with our patients, especially uh, with seniors and young people. So I'm really in support of the Social Connectivity Initiative. I'm really happy to see that loneliness is being addressed and thank you, board, uh, and I appreciate the fact that you're really no, taking like, serious yes, action around like, this. So thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Donald Harlan. And please state the regular agenda item you are addressing today and whether you will address on general public comment. You may begin. Yes, uh, I'm Donald Harlan. Uh, I'd like to address uh, agenda special district uh, number number two, item 2D, and uh, number three, uh, number one and two, uh, number four, um, number five, number six, number eight, number 12, number 18, number 15, and uh, pipeline stuff. Um, Okay, there's, uh, there's, I'm really concerned about the uh, public number three, public hearings one and two, the wetlands conservation easement amendment and the hearing on the green zone program. Uh, those properties uh, are owned by somebody, but not an inch of land in California isn't owned by somebody. You can't declare something open or vacant land and then have the counties try and build something on that. If you guys really need that, you really need to pay the owner for that. Uh, these green zone program projects are a real uh, illegal thing that you guys are doing there. Uh, the Department of Regional Planning shouldn't be trying to claim that property. They don't even know who to ask to buy that property if they wanted to buy that property. That's how bad it is. They're not in the trust. They're not trusted to have the information of who owns that property. So they're declaring an open and vacant land. And you know what? They don't pay the owner of the land. They're paying themselves that the LA County Board of Supervisors is supposed to protect us from that. And they need to stop them from doing that. Uh, then, uh, um, agenda item, uh, three, the consent calendar. If there's so much corruptions and problems in the city government, I mean, uh, uh, and the uh, county, maybe they need to be uh, prevented from adding people, appointing people to commissions and committees and special districts. Um, also, uh, the concern about Bruce's Beach, about them trying to hand land to somebody when a problem's already been settled, uh, they shouldn't be allowed to do that. Uh, also, uh, they need to be stopped. That one needs to be stopped or delayed. I'm a little concerned about them jamming so many agenda items. Excuse me, your time has expired. May we have the next speaker, please? Jamming so many agenda items. Our next participant is Michelle Graham. Please state the regular agenda item you will be addressing today and whether or not you will address on general public comment. You may begin. Hi, um, I'm Marshall Graham. I'm speaking on item 25. Um, Again. I wanted to speak on, uh, yeah, I just wanted to know if you guys could hear me. Um, I'm a security officer at a LA mental health. I just moved to this location, but I was at Martin Luther King before. Um, my issues were, we don't have health care over here. We're working with the public. I can't afford it. Uh, $300 a month. That's basically like groceries. Can't afford it. Uh, just wanted to extend the contract, keep it with uh, our company, just make it better. I've been working here for two years and it's, it, it's 
the pandemic just made it even worse. They are not giving us, you know, health care, as I said before. People are coughing on us. We're not giving medians or PPE. It's been it's been really rough. Excuse me, your time has expired. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Roy Humphreys. Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you will address on general public comment. You may begin. Uh, comment on our items CS2, S1, and general public comment. On uh, CS2, uh, department heads, so forth, the department roads on the Baldwin Park need to be terminated. On the uh, American Rescue Plan report, why isn't the report published on the site here so that Peterson? Uh, such as myself can review it so we can make some comment during the comment period. And uh, general public comment, I wish to recognize Cynthia Humphrey's contribution to my 35 years endeavor to unite Roland Heights and realize its potential. Cindy has an engaging style that little, ev literally everybody loves. She realized that Roland Heights has its limitations and you can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. I was able to bring 1965 voting rights to Roland Unified School District. She said, why do you do this? Those people hate you. I noted Dr. King and those two Jewish students in New York who were uh, lost their lives were hated too. I'm in good company. Cindy made it all possible. Yes, Cindy is my wife. Thank you. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Joy Ori. Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you will address on general public comment. You may begin. Thank you. My name is Joy Ori and I am addressing general public comment. As a resident of Saugus for 32 years, I'm extremely concerned with the county's upcoming determination of where to house the DJJ males convicted for the most serious violent crimes against persons. To support the rehabilitation of the Youth Justice Reimagined in LA model, the most timely approach for the county is to use Barry J. Nindorf as the primary location. It's the least disruption option for the care needs and supervision. I request the board commit to reimagining Barry J. Nindorf to serve as the LA model. This is the most timely and efficient, and the October 1st report of the California Board of State and Community Corrections specifies the renovations needed to do this. This will meet the complex needs for the DJJ population. Let's make it happen. We remain opposed to the repurposing of Camps Scott and Scudder. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Tana Dine Quivrell. Uh, please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you will address on general public comment. You may begin. Tana Dine, your line is open. Go ahead, please. Moving to our next speaker, our next participant is Laura Torres. Uh, once again, please state the regular okay. agenda items you're speaking on. Hi, my name's I'm going in favor for 31B, the article number. And then I'm an employee of John Denier, and we've been in strike for 51 days. And we've been asking for better wages and affordable health care because what they're offering us is not reasonable with the, how the economy is right now. So we're barely making and me to pay our bill. So that's what we were wanting to have better, well, better wages for all the overwork they have us do. We have families and sometimes we are not able to be with our families because they have us overworking here up to like 12 hours a day. And we're just asking for a fair rate for the work that we do for them. Thank you. Next speaker, please. May we have the next speaker?
Our next speaker will come from the line of Laura Torres. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. Please begin. Please begin. Um, next, we're going to go to the line of Gerson Montano. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address general public comment. You may begin. Apologize for the for the, the difficulties. We're going to go to the line of John Blickenstaff. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. Please begin. The regular item is the Barry J. Nydorf Juvenile Hall uh, as the most appropriate location and also on general public comment. First of all, I would like to thank you for this opportunity and I'd like to focus on two key words, what is most effective and what is most caring. And the board has the opportunity now to address both of these issues on the J, uh, DJJ topic. Fiscal resources and the opportunity must blend together to enhance the existing programs and develop a model of effective caring services for youth in LA County and beyond. The rational support for the Barry J. Nydorf Juvenile Hall is based on the fact that most of these youth being served are already there. This option is the least disruptive to their care and supervision. I believe that LA County should commit to re-imaging the Barry J. Nydorf and expanding beyond campus Kilpatrick, develop this location as uh, the ability to serve as the LA County model in a positive way. The site selection will meet the existing specifications for renovation and the update of the Very J. Nydorf program and facility. And you can adopt this location, which enables the development of the service, which is most timely, effective, efficient, and caring. Please exercise this opportunity to select the site and make the commitments to the development and implementation of this program, which will serve as a model of service to J DJJ youth in LA County, an exemplary program characterized by effective and caring services of which we can be proud. Thank you. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Tim Hepburn. Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you will address some general public comment. You may begin. My name is Tim Hepburn. I am Mayor Laverne. Uh, I'm uh, just on general comment, public comment. Uh, good morning, County Supervisors, and uh, happy holidays to you all. Uh, I'm going to talk about the DJJ realignment uh, for the mail, um, youth mail. Uh, we, uh, we as a community in the city of Laverne have been extremely generous with LA County with our David and Margaret Holmes, Leroy Haynes Holmes, and also Applebaugh Page for over 60 plus years. And we feel that uh, while the, we understand the youth need a place to go, I think that the Barry J. Nidar facility will suit that purpose and to reimagine that. Also the Los Padrinos and the Campus Kilpatrick. As I say, we have done our fair share. We think that youth to be uh, to be uh, rehabilitated is extremely important as we've done in for many, many years, over 60 years with the Affleball page. We would really appreciate your reconsideration that our community when uh, the uh, campus page uh, and uh, Affleball page was formed, it was plus 60 plus years ago and it was citrus. There are now thousands of homes up there, all residential, community parks, and also schools. So we really appreciate you to reconsider and uh, put this at the Barry J. Nidorf, Los Padrinos for Campus Kilpatrick. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Grace Yu. Please state the regular agenda item you are addressing today and whether you will address some general public comment. You may begin. I'll be speaking on item number four. Good morning, supervisors. My name is Grace Yu, and I'm the Public Affairs Specialist at St. Barnabas Senior Services. 
we've been serving the older adult population since 1908. I just wanted to quote from the National Institute on Aging that's on the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services website. Research has linked social isolation and loneliness to higher risk for a variety of physical and mental conditions, high blood pressure, heart disease, obesity, a weakened immune system, anxiety, depression, cognitive decline, Alzheimer's disease, and even death. We're calling in because we know how important this social connectivity initiative is. Loneliness is a huge public concern. And as you know, LA County's older population growth is uh, immense. By 2030, 2.1 million people in LA County will be over the age of 60. And the social isolation and loneliness is really impactive onto older adults. And we are grateful Excuse me, that your the time county has expired. supervisors are looking Can we have the next speaker, please? To allow for this. Thank you so much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, as a reminder to address the board, if you have not already done so, please press one and zero at this time. Do not press one zero a second time or you will be removed from the queue. We'll now hear the Spanish interpretation of this reminder. Como recordatorio, para dirigirse a la Junta, si aún no lo ha hecho, presione 1 y luego 0 en este momento. No presione 1 y luego 0 por segunda vez o será eliminado de la fila. Gracias. Thank you. Next speaker, please. And our next participant is um, Gerardo. Gerardo, um, sorry about your last name. I can't quite pronounce that. Yeah, please state the regular agenda item you'll be addressing. And if you're addressing a general public comment, you may begin. Uh, yeah, how are you doing? My name is Gerardo Marquezuma. Um, I'm addressing item number 31B. And we, I work for John Deneer Rich Products. We've been on strike for about 51 days. And uh, we're striking for fair wages and affordable health care. Uh, we make ice cream cakes for Walmart, Cold Stone, Safeway, for a lot of different stores. And all, all we need is affordable health care, especially now in the pandemic. Um, so that's basically what, what we're striking for. I appreciate it. Thank you. Our Thanks. next participant is Christina Lujan. Please state the regular agenda item you're addressing and whether you will address on general public comment. You may begin. My name is Christina Lujan. I'm addressing item 31B. Um, I am a, a worker at John Deneer. I am currently on strike for 51 days now and we're fighting for better wages and affordable health care. Um, anything that can be done in favor of us, helping us so we can have a rapid solution so we can get ourselves back to work would be greatly appreciated. And that's just what we're wanting. All we want is a better wage and affordable insurance for our families. And we hope we can get a rapid solution. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Eric Frieden. Please state the regular agenda item you're addressing today and whether you will address a general public comment, you may begin. Uh, I'll speak on several items, 30, 31A, uh, one, two, four. I'll just go into the items, okay? Thank you. So item 30 caught my attention because, you know, you're a board of supervisors that handles the legal battling for the county and uh, the Los Angeles Times Communications Company, the newspaper, had filed several Public Record Act requests with the county. That's something that people like myself in the journalism field and in the public who want to pay attention to what's going on with the county government do in order to see what's happening. And you completely denied any access to email addresses regarding the sheriff's department where you had um, there were electronic information on homicides which is not revealing a personnel record, but they wouldn't reveal that. All sorts of disgusting denials, which has been at the Los Angeles County Chamber of Secrets, which is the back room where you meet half the time now in closed session. Uh, and the people are being screwed. So now we're giving the Times 265000 to settle the case. 
But what really caught my attention was we spent over 260000 fighting the case. So this is over a half a million dollars. Now, you know, it, Nicole Davis Tinkham uh, processes the orders down at the wrongdoing department at county council. It's appalling. They, they were supposed to give me records on Richard Droyan, who was the consultant uh, guy in charge of the civilian overs the, the prior civilian oversight commission, which was called the CCJV. And they simply denied it. I had to get a lawyer, and then they paid the lawyer $35,000 and gave me the record. So I just find this kind of behavior appalling. It's like they will do wrong unless you lawyer up. Now, lawyering up is what Skip Miller has done with the sheriff's department. And sliding down to the next item, uh, you have a huge hornet's nest uh, in the area where Matrice Richardson walked off and fell into the canyon or was killed, murdered probably, obviously. Um, and there's an item on the agenda to reestablish the reward for that horrible case from 2009. And a young African-American, very promising young person, uh, had some kind of a psychotic break, seemed like at Joffrey's. If you look at the ABC News report that's coming on next Monday, uh, ABC 7, I don't quite understand if these things are linked. It is very strange, the timing. But the county wants to introduce sheriff ideas the various because you're battling endlessly with them, along with Skip Miller, who's defending him. I mean, this represents Ms. Mitchell a conflict of interest. Okay, so I think that it's time to tell the people, here's what we've been paying Skip Miller for the various cases, including the Alliance lawsuit, including the church shutting people down in churches from, you know, over COVID. These behaviors, which are then fought legally in cases where we lose, we lose the case. Why do we lose the cases? Because we're assuming the wrongheaded legal stance in many cases because that's what the county feels is the least cost for the county. But the cost and integrity is unsupportable. It's not an, at, at all acceptable. And Excuse me, your time has expired. May we have the next speaker, please? What about my general public? Our next participant is Rihanna Schmidt. Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you will address on general public comment. You may begin. Good morning, uh, honorable chair and board members of the Board of Supervisors. My name is Raina Schmitz. I'm here in support of the strikers. I have been doing this for the last five weeks, not as long as they have um, on the strike, but I see the injustice of what's happening, of what John Denier is doing to their employees. Uh, they need social justice. They need a good contract. They're not being unreasonable in their asking. They're asking for a dollar wage per hour. They're asking that the employer continue providing their medical pension benefits and to also uh, contribute to their pension. Um, I was aware that for the last eight years, they have been paying a fine, but not the pension for these employees. Uh, this needs to be investigated. Uh, the stress level of these workers is amazing. They're making them uh, box uh, up to 35 cakes per minute in boxes. Uh, millions of dollars come out of this uh, corporation of this plant, and the workers are struggling to make a, a decent living. They're barely making $16 an hour. People who have worked in this company for up to 30, 35 years, 20 years, uh, most of them grandparents and grandmothers, and they're bringing their grandkids. Excuse me, your life. time has expired. It's very, very sad. May we have the next speaker, please? Oh, shoot, yes. Yeah. Our next participant is Tracy Gonzalez. Please state Tracy the regular Gonzalez. agenda items you are addressing today and whether you're okay. addressing them. Comment, you may begin. Hi, uh, my name is Tracy Gonzalez. I'm a resident of the city of Laverne, and I'm speaking in general comment to oppose the changes to Camp Afaba Page in Laverne. Um, from low-level juvenile offenders to high-level violent offender adults, violent murders, rapists, and more, 18 to 25-year-old adults. I know this entire issue and the reimagining of the juvenile justice system was thrust upon all of us by the state, and I appreciate Supervisors Barger, uh, Barger and Solis changing the direction of this issue a few months back to allow for the public to be involved. And uh, the city of Laverne is involved, awake, well-informed, and we do not want these changes. These facilities are located near our homes, schools, and higher high fire risk area and well below par to house such offenders safely for them and our community. 
If you're looking for the most effective use of the money to reimagine facilities, be smart and use Barry J. Uh, Nidor, Nidor, that is already slated for upgrading. I'm asking you direct your resources to that end and tell the JJCC, JJRBG subcommittee, Laverne is not an option. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Pamela Berry. Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you will address on general public comment. You may begin. Good morning. I am calling regarding general public comment on the Barry G. Nidorf as the most appropriate uh, for the DJJ move uh, to county facilities. I recommend the board support reimagining the location at Barry J. Nidorf as least disruptive, more suited to the type of housing, closer to the support systems of the youth, and better suited with minimal additional expense. Uh, the LA County Sheriff's Safety Assessment Report um, regarding the various different options, had limited information on Paige Alperbaugh, and knowing more would take the safety level to red versus yellow. One item states that there are two routes of evacuation in case of fire, and that is not accurate. Paige Alperbaugh is at the end of a one-mile road that leads to a T-intersection where they could have different options. The camps and the one-mile road is surrounded by brush areas, hiking areas, and some homes. And that one mile road, Stevens Ranch Road, is the only way out until they reach Golden Hills Road. Prior evacuations uh, had been, there had been fire on either side of Stevens Ranch Road. And there are also ridges and brush along Esperanza from there down. Esperanza is only a small road and is a feeder for all neighborhoods. Excuse me, your time has expired. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Martha Rodriguez. Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you will address on general public comment. You may begin. Oh, sí, mi nombre es Marta Rodríguez. Hablo del 31B. Estamos, estoy, soy una trabajadora que está en huelga de um, la producción de John Deney. Llevamos 51 días. Queremos un mejor contrato, mejor sueldo y una buena aseguranza we will now hear the Spanish interpretation. Good morning, my name is Martha Rodriguez. I'm here speaking on item 31B. I am a worker who is on strike. We've been on strike for 51 days. Um, I'm calling because I want to say that we are looking for and seeking a better contract, better wages, as well as insurance, and we need your support. Thank you. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Donald Harlan. And please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. I'd like to. Which includes 27 and 8, 49. Agenda item number six, which is are on pages 9, 10 of the agenda. And uh, also page 11 about Bruce's Beach, number eight, and general public comment. Begin. Okay. Uh, I'm a little concerned about the uh, supervisors and the LA County Board of Supervisors. They're allowed to pr approve permits for their uh, pipelines, but uh, they don't have the owner of some of these pipelines. It seems that. Uh, Somebody illegally in the Board of Supervisors, instead of uh, controlling who's uh, controlling who's working there uh, or being a national security interest, that instead they wanted to rent those pipelines or lease them for themselves, uh, that they're not paying the owners of that. And that it's very interesting that several um, uh, several illegal oil wells popped up, people drilling for oil on other people's property illegally as a political favor. That there's a national security interest in that one, number five, that uh, maybe they're doing a lot more in the LA County Board of Supervisors than they're supposed to. Okay, so I'm going to agenda item number six, which is page 10, 
the sale of Mission Canyon Landfill to Berkeley Hall. I'm really concerned that uh, there's a property grab there that uh, when you look at the L.A. County Assessor's Report on that, it says that the report's been modified and that the uh, the uh, report's out of sequence, that somebody's there trying to change things illegally. It says in there, unverified sale, and definitely you shouldn't be handing property to anybody over there. That Excuse me, your time has expired. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Don Scalzo. Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you will address on general public comment. You may begin. Don Scalzo, your line is open. You may be muted on your end. You, are calling. you may enter it at any time. For operator's assistance, right. please dial Our next participant is a Little Brainard. Lily Brainard, I apologize. Uh, Lily Brainard, please state the regular agenda items you are addressing and whether you address a general public comment. You may begin. Hi, uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Lily Brenner, a uh, citizen of the Vern. I am a comment regarding the DJJ rehabilitation. Uh, and I oppose the I oppose I oppose the plan if possible happen in our uh, campaign. And then actually, you know, uh, I speak for myself or maybe speak for some moms uh, who has kids here, not able to make it because of walking hours right now. So uh, our cities have been very supportive for the other two camps for many years. I, my family already lived here more than 20 years. So why we choose here? Because it's a very nice town, very low crime rate for many, many years. So, but now it, what happened is really lack of transparency. So uh, we know about it from media. And then actually, you know, in the December 7th, the meeting of NASA, more than 200 people uh, show up to oppose and then December 18, we have a protest in Laverne and make the big news and the CBS play three times at night and the NBC. So, so many people first time heard about that. It's a, maybe more people will know about it in the Christmas season. So I know it's a easy, everybody is not easy to make decisions. I mean, uh, for the, uh, <clears throat> by uh, all the supervisor, I know you guys are let, let official, you want to give the best for the, Excuse me, your time has expired. May we have the next speaker, please? Thank you. Our next participant is Lauren Sutton. Please state the regular agenda items you will be addressing today, and if you will be addressing on very general public comment, you may begin. Hi, um, I'm addressing 31A. My name is Lauren Sutton, as you know, I, I am the aunt of Maitrese Richardson, who was murdered in 2009 after having been released from the Lost Hill Sheriff's Station in the middle of the night without means to care for herself. I am calling to strongly encourage Holly Mitchell and the Board of Supervisors to reinstate the 25,000 reward um, that was established in 2009 and expired in October of 2010 um, for information leading to the solving of her murder and investigation um, is very important. And this reward is important in encouraging somebody from the public to come forward with information that will lead to finding who murdered her. Thank you very much for this consideration. And I hope that we will move forward with the $25,000 reward. That is so important. Thank you so much. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? As a reminder to address the board, if you have not already done so, please press one and zero at this time. Do not press one and zero a second time or you will be removed from the queue. We will now hear the Spanish interpretation of this reminder. Como recordatorio, para dirigirse a la junta, si uno la ha hecho, presione uno luego cero en este momento. No presione uno luego cero por segunda vez o será eliminado de la fila. Gracias. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Don Scalgo. Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today. And if you will be addressing on general public comment, you may begin. Hi, my name is Don Scalzo and I'll be addressing on general public comment. I wanted to call to support the use of Barry Jane Nydorf as the DJJ facility for serious youth offenders. They already have established visitation procedures they have established housing, they're centrally located and or easily accessible to many major cities in LA County. 
that facility, Barry J. Neidorf, can most effectively support the LA model in a timely manner, providing the least amount of disruption to the youth. Please reimagine Barry J. Neidorf, invest in programming there, and discontinue consideration of Camp Scott Scudder. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Danita Bellchamp. Please uh, state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you will address in general public comment. You may begin. Good morning, Board of Supervisors, and happy holidays to all. I'm addressing item number four, social connectivity initiative, as well as number 34, general comment. It's uh, nice to see that the county has recognized loneliness and social isolation as official um, illnesses that um, teenagers and, and really all age people um, may suffer from. But this leads me into number four. If in fact that these um, young adults are being diagnosed with loneliness and social isolation, housing them for the DJJ and the CYTF program at Camp's Afrobra page is at the highest point of the city in Laverne, away from, quote, normal city life. It will be contributing more so to the isolation of these juveniles and adults, as a previous caller mentioned, from 18 to 25. But you'll be contributing to that. So putting those people there at that location would be contradictory to your item number four. Um, the camps are adjacent to hiking trails and bike paths, which lead all the way to Mount Baldy, Azusa Canyon, Glendora Mountain Road. These, they should not be at that location. It is a high fire hazard area, as another caller spoke of. There's only one ingress, egress available to that. What is the protocol for evacuation? We know that Barry J. Nordoff location would require less maintenance and would cost less money to the county with the $24 million allocation for bringing the property up to uh, what is required for a level four offender. I thank the board for their time for listening. Have a good day. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Jennifer Simonson. Please state the regular agenda item you're addressing today, and if you'll be addressing on general public comment, you may continue, you may begin. Hello, my name is Jennifer Simison. I'm a resident of Laverne. I will be addressing item 34, general comment, and I wanted to um, support and um, back up the community members that have been talking about how Barry J. Nordoff is a much better opportunity location for the juvenile justice. Our town is been here 42 years. It's an amazing community that, and we honestly work with the children early with the um, David Margaret home and the Haynes and even Camp Appleba Page. We are there supporting a community to help healthy children stay healthy. And I think that's the best thing we can do as far as handling high security. There is, it's not in our valley whip. And so I want to be here to have you please make sure you um, recommend that the Barry J. Nordoff and even expanding the Kilpatrick, because I know if you build a bigger school, you can have, there's plenty of beds for there. Um, in listening to the POC meeting yesterday, they also did a, say that how Camp Afaba Page is doing such a good job for the, for the young youth that are not high risk. And I would say, why would we stop something that's working? So please, um, I support our mayor and our past mayor and the things that we've said. And I please hope that you guys consider that um, Barry J. Nordoff would be the best place to um, prime location for the Excuse department. me, your time has expired. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Grace Elliott. Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you will address on general public comment. You may begin. Yes, I'm addressing on general public comment. Um, I concur that the county should reimagine Barry J. Nightoff Juvenile Hall as the most appropriate location for DJJ youth. Um, I live in Saugus, my husband and I. 
opposed to housing violent convicted criminals in the middle of our residential community. I live a few feet away from the entrance of the facility. At meetings, we residents have voiced our opposition to housing violent offenders with convictions of murder, rape, robbery, drugs, burglary, arson, and many other incidences of gang-related criminal activity in the middle of our residential area. Camp Scott and Scudder have received low scores and recommendations have been made not to house these felons in our residential community. Uh, we wonder why trade vehicles and private vehicles are constantly at Camp uh, Scott and Scudder and why they received almost a million dollars for revamping the facility. Um, we uh, see lights on at all hours and um, if no decision has been made to house violent Excuse offenders, me, your time has expired. Uh, why is this Can we being have the next done? speaker, please? Our next participant is Mary Chester. Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you will address them. General public comment. You may begin. Thank you. Good morning, supervisors. I'm uh, very, very grateful to be addressing you today. My name is Mary Chester, and I am a resident of Santa Clarita, and I am calling in regarding the general public comment about Barry J. Nydorf um, being the location to house the DJJ students. My perspective may be a little different than most because I've actually been going to that court for 30 years. I retired from the school district. I'm very familiar with some of the camps and with juvenile hall. And my perspective is more of a sociological perspective, but the behavior of people once they get to the courthouse changes. There's a different respect. They're different in the parking lot than they are on the street. It is an ideal location because it's a hub of public service and a hub of law enforcement. The youth, the campus is beautiful. It's got, it's a positive aesthetic, the same thing you would want for a child of yours to finally step aside and come off of that, that terrible um, train ride to committing other crimes and be given a chance. It is a beautiful facility. It is such a secure facility. The public defender's office Excuse is me, your time has expired. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Michelle Wong. I'm sorry, yes, Michelle Wong, uh, please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you will address a general public comment, you may begin. Yes, hi. My name is Michelle Wong. I am a physician of Chinese medicine, and I'm speaking on item number four on loneliness and social isolation. I'm very much in uh, favor of this initiative. I really appreciate that this is being addressed on a county level. I had worked with the Department of Mental Health as well as the um, Michio Okada Association, MOA Wellness Center in Delray <clears throat> to do a project called Sharing Tea, Sharing Hope in, in and around uh, Los Angeles County at different um, Asian American uh, centered um, events. Unfortunately, COVID-19 had uh, put a big dent on that project, but we were able to move it into a virtual stage. But it really brings me to the fact that after all this time, nonprofits that have been working with seniors, with youth, are at a really critical time um, to be able to offer their services. And I'm afraid some of them are closing, closing up shop. And, closing up their facilities, and I really would love for there to be more of a discussion. Excuse me, your time has expired. Local and we have the next speaker, please. As a reminder to address the board, if you have not already done so, please press 1 and 0 at this time. Do not press 1 and 0 a second time, or you will be removed from the queue. We will now hear the Spanish interpretation of this reminder. 
Como recordatorio, para dirigirse a la Junta, si aún no lo ha hecho, presione 1 luego 0 en este momento. No presione 1 luego 0 por segunda vez o será eliminado de la fila. Gracias. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Kevin Adler. Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you will address on general public comment. You may begin. Hi, this is Kevin Adler, and I'm speaking in public comment as part of in favor of item four, the social connectivity initiative. I want to speak about it as it relates to our neighbors experiencing homelessness. Uh, I run a nonprofit called Miracle Messages. We help people who are experiencing homelessness rebuild their social support systems and their financial security. And we've helped over 500 individuals who are homeless reconnect to loved ones. Uh, we have a phone buddy program that matches individuals, many of whom are in shelter in place hotels with volunteers for weekly calls and texts. We also have launched one of the first basic income programs that have built on the relationships and trust that come with connectivity. Uh, I want to say one thing and really one thing to emphasize that relational poverty is a form of poverty. Relational poverty is a form of poverty. And we often overlook the impacts of social isolation, loneliness, stigma, disconnectedness among our neighbors experiencing homelessness, But when we work to help individuals who are unhoused reconnect to family, friends, or community members, um, everyone wins. And we have seen individuals get housed. We've seen individuals get work placements, find employment, feel good about themselves, lower rates. Excuse me, your time has expired. Depression. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Ron Ferreira. Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you will address on general public comment. You may begin. Um, yes, I'll be speaking on uh, 31-B uh, on the Baker's Union strike in Santa Fe Springs. I want to first uh, applaud the supervisors for uh, this letter, especially Uh, Supervisor Hahn and Solis for drafting this motion. Um, I am the president of the Los Angeles County Federation of Labor and uh, the LA Labor Movement stands in staunch support. But a little bit about the strikers. We're talking about minimum wage workers. We're talking about workers that uh, are work going poor, that are expected to pay you know, a portion of their health and welfare expected to work 14 to 16 hours a day on on an assembly line that you know it with speeds on the belts that are basically unmanageable uh they have to endure harassment and just in a personal note personal point of privilege i was actually on the strike line when the company turned the sprinklers on the workers so we stand in full support of this letter and again Uh, it's time to send uh, John Bornet a message from, from the County Board of Supervisors and uh, their customers, Baskin Robbins. When we are enjoying... Excuse me, your desserts, time has expired. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Maria Granados. Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you will address on general public comment. You may begin. Yes. Good morning, everyone. My name is Maria Granados, and I'm here to address item number 34, general comment in support of the use of Barry J. Nidoff as the most appropriate facility for the high-risk youth. Um, I've been a resident for the, is the city of Laverne for almost 10 years, and I will say that Camp Afrobla Page should not be used to house the high-risk youth. Um, The facility is right next to the trails that my family uses, as well as many, many other people. These trails connect to many different cities, as one of the residents uh, mentioned in the previous call. The trails also connect to lots of homes, thousands of homes, including schools, including the schools that my children attend. The trails are a great hiding spot. They connect to areas that have heavy brush. So... Um, the location is also in high fire risk areas with narrow roads to get up and down the facility. Um, and 
as it is, you know, the city is known for being a safe city. When we purchased our home, we didn't sign up for having like a high risk facility in our backyard. And the fact that this was something that most of us learned about just the past couple of weeks is unacceptable. So I support the use of the existing facility, Barry J. Nardoff, as the most appropriate facility. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Daryl Mays. Please address, uh, state the regular agenda items you are addressing today, and whether you'll address in general public comment, when you begin. I'm addressing uh, item number 25, uh, for general public uh, thing, and uh, my name is Daryl Mays. I work at LAC, USC County Hospital as a security officer. For almost two years since I've gotten to this location, I've had to refuse work in certain areas where there's more risk of exposure to COVID because I am afraid of getting sick. I have an existing heart condition and I need my health care. I had to bury my mother and brother in July, so health care is extremely important to me. I'm currently paying almost $100 a week just for my own coverage. It has been an extremely difficult year. We've gotten sick. Uh, seeing co-workers get sick and lost family members to this pandemic. We have made sacrifices to keep LA County running and we want to stop being treated as second class workers. We need affordable health care and we thank Supervisor Solis and Han for introducing the health care for contracting employees motion. Thank you. Thank you. May we have the next speaker please? Madam Chair, there are no other speakers in queue to address the board. Uh, thank you very much. To ensure that we allow the full 90 minutes for public comment, the call-in line will remain open until 11.07 a.m. Uh, we'll take any other callers that come in by that time. And so we thank you for your patience and ask that you stand by. Uh, given the fact that that's Excuse a full... Me, yes. Yes, we do have more more uh, people queuing up now to address the board. Okay. Go right ahead and let them in. Okay. And uh, our next participant is Sue Fisher. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today. And if you'll be addressing a general public comment, you may begin. Thank you very much. My name is Sue Fisher, and I am commenting on general comments. Um, I, have a mem I am a 30-year uh, resident of Santa Clarita. My neighborhood is approximately 600 feet across a two-lane road from Camp Scudder and Scott. I have been listening to all of the subcommittee meetings since May and waiting for answers until I finally got them the other day, listening to the Laverne meeting. Um, we have pretty much the same demographic and geographical area, many, many uh, trails in the mountains, high fire and actual flood plain. Um, and it has been used for a low risk camp for the 30 years that I've been here without incident. Why you would make it into a high risk facility, I don't understand, but I also support using uh, Barry J. Nidorf. It sounds perfect. It would be safe for all those intended, and I appreciate the fact that you are letting us speak on this. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next speaker is Hello? Hello, please begin. Hi, this is Rosemary Zayas. I did want to say I also have five other people here who would like to give a comment on agenda item two in favor. Hi, your line is open. Please begin. Hi, uh, my name is Rosemary Zayas, and I'm calling on behalf of agenda item number two. Um, in regards to the Green Zones Ordinance, I did want to state that I live in unincorporated county of LA, 
Um, and I am in support of the Green Zones Ordinance Program because we need to improve the public health and quality of life of residents in unincorporated communities that have been disproportionately and historically impacted by multiple polluting facilities and uses. Um, I really want to emphasize it was our communities that laid the foundation for the Green Zones policy in 2016 through our organizing that shut down Central Middle and Kiwana Park. Um, and I just really want to share that. I, I believe we need ordinance, ordinances like this one to pass because it is a step in the right direction to hold these industries accountable and redu reduce pollution exposure in our communities. Um, we need to improve the public health and quality of life in unincorporated communities of LA County. This includes prohibiting additional industrial use in green zones, expanding the 500 foot buffer, rezoning additional properties and promoting green jobs that do not pose risk to their workers or neighboring communities. So I strongly urge the Board of Supervisors to move us forward and pass this ordinance. Thank you. Please allow the next speaker to speak. Okay. My name is Erica Bautista and I am in support of the Green Zone program because we need to improve the public health quality of life of the residents and unincorporated have been disproportionately and historically impacted by multiple pollution facilities and uses. The Green Zone Ordinance would offer a true protection for communities' health and, the, and I personally living so close to Central Metal Inc. This is an important topic for me as I would like my family and community to be healthy. Um, we need ordinance like this one to pass because it is, a step, it is a step in the right direction to make the industry accountable and reduce pollution exposure in our communities. I strongly urge the Board of Supervisors to move us forward and pass this ordinance. Hola, buenos días. Mi nombre es Lorena Navarro y soy residente de la ciudad de Guanalpar. Apoyo el, el programa de zonas verdes porque necesitamos mejorar la salud pública y la calidad de vida de los residentes en comunidades no incorporadas que han sido impactadas históricamente, desproporcionadas en múltiples instalaciones y usos contaminantes. Fueron nuestras comunidades las que sentaron las bases para la política de GZ en 2016 a través de nuestra organización que cerró Central Meral. Los sitios tóxicos no se han usado como usos de reciclaje y desechos sólidos. Dentro de, un, dentro, dentro de nuestros vecindarios, como está ocurriendo ahora con Central Meral, que ahora están usando, con otro, siguen trabajando, pero con otro nombre. Entonces necesitamos que la ordenanza de zonas verdes sea aprobada para proteger nuestras comunidades. Gracias. We will now hear the English interpretation. My name is Lorena, and I am here to, uh, to support the Green Zone Ordinance, and that is because we need to have public security, and it is important to protect the historical parts of Walnut Park, where I live, and also to keep the political bases in place and within our neighborhoods because Central Metal is still working here under a different name and we want to support the green zone because we want to keep our communities safe and clean. Thank you. Thank you. We'll hear your next speaker address. Hola, muy buenos días. Mi nombre es Gabriel Guerrero y estoy aquí para apoyar a las zonas verdes. Queremos Queremos que se realice ese cierre de la ordenanza para mejorar nuestra salud y aquí de nuestras comunidades. Y yo soy de CBE, Community for Better Environment. Estamos apoyando. Nosotros logramos cerrar a Central Metals el 2016. Está contaminando, este recicladora estaban contaminando con muchos metales y muchos tóxicos a todos los alrededores de ahí de Walnut Park y también de Flores Firestone. Yo vivo en la ciudad de Southgate, que está al ladito, pero a todos nos afecta. Yo tengo muchas familiares en esta ciudad, en esta zona, también en Walnut Park. So, yo apoyo en la número dos para las zonas verdes, que se cierre y el, apoyo la ordenanza también. Gracias. 
Thank you. We'll hear the English interpretation. Good morning. My name is Gabriel Herrero, and I'm here to support also the green zones because they are better for the health of our community. I'm also here representing CBE, Communities for a Better Environment, and we're here also to support the green zone because the recycling uh, metal company is throwing toxic into our community, and we also want to make sure that we are supporting because I'm actually from uh, Florence Firestone area, but I have family in Walnut Park, and even though I'm just right next door in South Gate, um, this also affects us. So we're here to support the green zone. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear the English inter. I'm sorry. We'll, we'll hear your next speaker. Hola, buenos días. Mi nombre es Jacqueline Cárdenas. So vivo um, cerca de, vivo en la ciudad de Los Ángeles. Um, apoyo a, al programa de zonas verdes porque necesitamos mejorar la salud pública y la calidad de vida de los residentes de comunidades no incorporadas que han sido impactadas histórica y desproporcionadamente por múltiples instalaciones y usos contaminantes. Uh, pertenezco a CBI, apoyo a CBI, so, y necesitamos que se aprueben ordenanzas como esta porque es un paso, una decisión correcta para responsabilidad, responsabilizar a estas industrias y reducir la, los, la exposición de las contaminaciones en nuestras comunidades. So, yo apoyo, nosotros necesitamos promover buenos empleos verdes con salarios que asisten Thank you. Now hear the English interpretation. Hello, my name is Jacqueline Cardenas, and I'm here also to support the Green Zone Ordinance and for it to be approved for the health and the well-being of the public with our communities to have uh, non-toxic community installations. I also support CBE and I'm here to support the passing of this um, restriction for the in this industry that's polluting our area. And I'm also here to promote green jobs and good salaries so that we can continue creating green zone communities. Thank you. AT&T, may we please have the next speaker? Our next speaker, our next speaker will come from the line of Anthony Thomas. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today, and whether you'll address general public comment. You may begin. Good morning. My name is Anthony Thomas. I'm addressing agenda item number 25. I am a, um, I'm a security officer at Harvard UCLA, and I applaud the efforts of Supervisors Solis and Hahn to give us access to affordable health care. I currently pay approximately $214 a week to access our employer's health plan. And that's about 856 a month. But in order to make any of that work, we need our jobs. So my coworkers and I are strongly in support of extending the contract so that we can have access to a quality of life. And at the front line of the front line, we're exposed to threats from the pandemic and the general public. And we just feel that we would like consideration as far as maintaining our jobs and access to health benefits. Thank you for your consideration. Have a great day. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Hey, our, next line of, our next speaker will come from the line of Margarita Durrett. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address general public comment, you may begin. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? And please begin. Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can yes. hear you. Hello? Oh, sorry, sorry. 
My name is Margarita Derrett. I'm here calling, representing the office of Senator Lina Gonzalez, and we are in support for the strong green, uh, support in the uh, strong green zone program ordinance. I represent the communities of Cudahy, Maywood, Florence, Firestone, Walnut Park, and South Los Angeles. Our senator uh, wrote a letter. We submitted it. Uh, we are in strong support of the green zones uh, program ordinance. Ordinance. This is a community. Uh, from the 33th district. Uh, she urges uh, the Board of Supervisors uh, of the region planning to ensure the creation of the Green Zones Ordinance that address the concerns of local communities, residents experiencing environmental uh, injustice. Uh, for too long, these residents in, uh, in the incorporated communities of Florence, Firestone, and Walnut Park have dealt with the impact of inconsistent land use practice, homes, Next to recycling, a strong green zone ordinance must prevent pollution companies from entering already overbearing communities and hold a strong, uh, hold them ones and that are bad neighbors accountable. For example, Central Metal Inc., CIMI, a matter Excuse of me, your time has expired. In, in May we have the next Walmart. speaker, please? Okay. As a reminder, if you wish to address the board, please press one then zero at this time. Do not press one and zero a second time or you'll be removed from the queue. We will now hear the Spanish interpretation of this reminder. Como recordatorio, para dirigirse a la Junta, si aún no la ha hecho, presione uno luego cero en este momento. No presione uno luego cero por segunda vez o será eliminado de la fila. Gracias. Your next speaker, please. Our next participant will come from the line of Red Hunt. Please state the regular agenda items you wish to address today and whether you'll address on general public comment, you may begin. Yeah, uh, this is the Red Chief Hunt. Uh, I'll be talking on aid and uh, general public comment. Uh, general, uh, general public comment starting with that housing for health contract with Exodus is um, doesn't have any guidelines and we get, getting ready to have some problems with that contract. I would like to see it. I would like to see have Mitchell and Han send me the contract paperwork because if it doesn't have any guidelines, it's not you know, uh, It's a lot of mistakes being made that Exodus doesn't inextricably intertwine with Housing for Health with that. They don't do any work to be uh, a patient program managers and things like that or patient coordinators and stuff like this. So that contract has a lot of uh, 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 a conflict of interest with, with, with housing for health when the staff doesn't know, uh, if the, if the staff doesn't know what the mission statement is for housing for health. I'm kind of concerned about that. And then with Bruce's uh, uh, beach, uh, just returning people back their property and make sure it runs smoothly. Thank you. I am the Honorable Ninth Circuit winner, Red Chief. Uh, thank you. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next speaker will come from the line of Robin Walker. Please state the regular agenda items you wish to address today and whether you'll address general public comment. You may begin. Hi, this is Robin Walker. Um, I am addressing the general comment. I'm from Laverne, California and asking the Board of Supervisors to reevaluate sending um, criminal violent 17 to 25 year olds to the after ball page facility. I believe that you're putting the community at risk in many ways. We've got track, cross country kids that have been running those trails for years. And um, I have heard stories when we had our last big fire of um, juvenile inmates running uh, out of the camp. And uh, we have a park just at the base of the road there where kids um, and teenagers are hanging out in schools and you're putting um, the residents at risk. These officers will have no pepper spray, the barbi will be removed, these will be um, easily able to escape. Also, there's no public transportation in order to get to these facilities other, and you, you would have to go through miles of residential. Excuse me, your uh, time has addition. expired. May we have the next speaker, please? Okay. Our next participant will come from the line of Joe Gabaldon. Please state the regular agenda items you wish to address today and whether you'll address general public comment. You may begin. Hello, um, I'm addressing the general comment regarding uh, the camps, Atherbaugh and Page. 
And um, my opinion is that the current process allows for the those that are in a rehabilitative environment at uh, Nordoff that they focus their attention to making that location uh, a more uh, conducive uh, location for, for all of the needs uh, without the disruption of being transferred to new facilities that would require that those persons in that very sensitive state of, of rehabilitation would have to be starting from scratch, being transferred between camp or facility throughout the county. So um, my suggestion is that they focus on making the location that they're using as their primary starting point, the better location for the long run than to look for alternate facilities that may require um, extensive um, improvements and would disrupt the uh, rehabilitation efforts of those uh, persons in those uh, facilities. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant will come from the line of Mathis Ogian. Please state the regular agenda items you wish to address today and whether you'll address general public comment. You may begin. Good morning, Chair, members of the Board of Supervisors. My name is Matisse Hagobian. I'm the Intergovernmental Relations Analyst for the City of Santa Cruz. I'd like to address general public comment this morning. Uh, on behalf of the City of Santa Cruz, and as we have expressed in previous correspondence to this body, we urge the Board of Supervisors to designate Campus Kilpatrick as the uh, permanent facility for male youth serious offenders. Um, we've identified significant environmental and safety concerns in previous correspondence to both the subcommittee and, and to the board. Um, and there have been several reports that have been published since uh, that have reaffirmed our concerns, including the Youth Justice Reimagined Report the uh, the uh, scorecard that was developed by a, a motion earlier this year by the board, um, all assessing that Camp Scott is an unsuitable facility. And so we really hope that when the item is considered next year, uh, that the board takes uh, the correct action and adopts Campus Kilpatrick as a permanent site. Thank you. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Next speaker will come from the line of Tammy Peters. Please state the regular agenda items you wish to address today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Hi, my name is Tammy Peters. I'm calling to make a public comment on the Atherbaugh Page Youth Facility. With the youth facilities we already house, in addition to the gold line coming in, our 9.4 square mile city can't handle a level four facility. We already do our fair share and the rest of the county needs to do theirs. Not only can our police not handle the needs of everything I mentioned, some wildlife at that camp <clears throat> also can't handle the construction that will be ongoing for up to three years. In particular, we have a male bald eagle who resides at that camp, and one picture shows a possible mate. This national bird was just taken off the endangered species list in 2007, and construction would disrupt nests. Residents have taken pictures of. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. And chairperson, at this time, we have no one else in queue. Thank you very much for that. And again, to ensure that we allow the full 90 minutes for public comment, uh, the line will remain open until 11.07. And we'll take any other callers that come in by that time. Thank you for your patience. And again, please stand by. Thank you. And Chairperson, we do have a couple queued up. Uh, next, we're going to go to the line of Roy Marson. Please state the regular agenda items you wish to address today and whether you'll address general public comment. You may begin. Good morning, Supervisors. My name is Roy Marson. I'm a resident since 1973, and I have commercial greenhouses and a wholesale nursery in Bouquet Canyon. And I'm representing the people of Bouquet Canyon, which is about 2,500 strong were voiced basically against Camp Scudder Scott. Camp Scudder Scott has always been, not against Camp Scudder Scott, being made into adult uh, felon uh, agency. Um, <clears throat> I, I really want to emphasize the, the Nordoff, Nightoff uh, facility. It's already set up for this. It's in a more, more rural area. We're in a growing area here. 
and the city of Santa Cruz is pushing against us. We're still in the county, and uh, and I, we've always had a very favorable uh, um, um, association with Camp Scudder Scott. Churches involved on it and so forth, getting involved with the young students. I question the ability of county <clears throat> of the state facilities putting 12 and 25 year olds together. It's a questionable thing. It's like a, uh, a excuse me, your time has camp. expired. May we have the next speaker, Thank please? You. Our next speaker then will come from the line of Lattice Sutton. Please state the regular agenda items you wish to address today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Yes, good afternoon. My name is Latice Sutton. I am the mother of murder victim Mitrice Richardson. And I am um, speaking on agenda item 31A. Thank you, Supervisor Mitchell, for your motion to reestablish the $10,000 reward for the apprehension and conviction of those responsible for my daughter's murder. Reestablishment of this reward is needed, critically needed, to encourage someone to come forward with information regarding my daughter's murder. Mitrice was a resident and a daughter of Los Angeles, and we need to do all we can to encourage someone to come forward. I thank you for your, your consideration and your time. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Thank you. And Chairperson, once again, at this time, we have no one else in queue. Again, we'll uh, keep the line open until 11.07. And it seems like every time I say that, someone pushes star one. So uh, know that you have until 11.07 to make public comment. Uh, we will keep the line open until then.
We have five minutes remaining for public comment. So please press one and zero at this time. Now press one zero a second time. We will be renewed from the queue. We will now hear the Spanish interpretation of this reminder. Como recordatorio para dirigirse a la junta, si aún no lo ha hecho, presione uno luego cero en este momento. No presione uno luego cero por segunda vez o será eliminado de la fila. Gracias. Our next participant is Brad Butcher. Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today. And if you'll be addressing on general public comment, please, you may begin. Yes, I would like to make a general public comment. Uh, my name is Brad Butcher. And looking through uh, some of the attributes of some of these facilities that are being considered for transfer of DJJ uh, personnel, youth, uh, I noticed the Barry J. Niedorf facility has some attributes that uh, are, are unique and not really easily replaceable, particularly with their proximity to community colleges, vocational schools. They also have an uh, ample number of classrooms and, and uh, possible expandable facilities. I've always been a strong proponent of education and vocational training for self-esteem, confidence, and success. So, you know, to me, it looks like bigger picture, uh, this facility has some very good attributes and it looks very secure as well. So that other missing ingredient of uh, the, the citizens and the welfare of the community and safety that uh, we want to preserve so we have success, you know, any kind of tragic event could stop what I believe is a very good thing that we're trying to do in rehabilitation. So big picture, it looks like a good- Excuse me, your time has expired. Yeah, that's it for me. May we have Thank the next you. speaker, please? There are no other speakers in the queue to address the board. Our time for public speakers has ended, and we want to thank all that called in to speak. If you were unable to provide verbal comments, you may submit written comments as indicated on the agenda. We'll continue to accept all written comments that come in during the meeting, which will become a part of the official record. Executive officer, please indicate the agenda items, uh, the agenda item numbers on which we will be voting today. Thank you, Madam Chair. The item, following items are before you. 
1D and 2D, 3, 6, 9 through 24, 26. On items 27, 28, and 29, Supervisor Mitchell is abstaining from the vote. Item 30 and item 31A. Thank you. Moved by Supervisor Kuhl, seconded by Supervisor Barger to approve these items. Executive Officer, please call the roll. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuhl. Aye. Supervisor Kuhl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you. Before we take a public comment on the public hearing items, the executive officer will read uh, short titles of each public hearing item. Executive officer, please swear in those who plan to testify before the board on the public hearing items. Thank you, Madam Chair. For those who plan to testify before the board on the public hearing items, please prepare to be sworn in. In the testimony you may give before this board, you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Item number one is a hearing on the execution of a master agreement with the Mountains Restoration Trust to amend the existing conservation easement at La Sierra Canyon wetlands to exclude the land to be exchanged with Seminole Springs Mobile Home Park Incorporated and the land to be sold to the Las Virginas Municipal Water District. There is no departmental statement and no correspondence was received. Item number two is a hearing on project number 2018-003209 to adopt the green zones program by amending the county general plan and county code title 22 planning and zoning to ensure consistency with the proposed revisions to the zoning code and changes to policies change the zoning of industrial parcels within various unincorporated communities and amend the maps for various zone districts and other changes in line with state laws and goals for waste diversion and emissions reduction. A written departmental statement was provided and correspondence was received. We'll now take public comment on the public hearing items one and two. Executive officer, please read the call-in information that was also provided on the agenda and explain the speaking rules to those members of the public who are calling in to address the board. As indicated on the agenda, members of the public wishing to offer public comment on items one and two should call 877-226-8163 and use participant code number 852 761. To repeat, please call 877 226 8163 and use participant code number 852 761. Do not call that number if you only want to listen to the meeting. To listen only, please call 877 873 8017 and follow the instructions. Members of the public calling in, when it's your turn to speak, please state your name and which public hearing items you wish to speak on. We will allocate five minutes for all public comment on all public hearing items. Each person will have one minute for one public hearing item and two minutes for two public hearing items. We will continue to accept all written comments that come in during the meeting, which will become part of the record. When speaking on the public hearing items, you must be on topic. Our goal is to get through as many speakers as we can. If you're not speaking on topic, or if we cannot tell if you're speaking on a public hearing item, you will get one warning from county council or the chair. If you do not immediately or clearly get on topic, or if you stray off topic again, you will forfeit the rest of your time and the chair will move on to the next speaker. Please note that if you're also listening to the board meeting on a computer or speakerphone, you will need to turn down the volume on those devices as soon as the moderator calls on you. If you don't turn the volume down, there will be an echo. Moderator, may we have the first speaker, please. As a reminder to address the board, if you have not already done so, please press one then zero at this time. Do not press one and zero a second time or you'll be removed from the queue. We will now hear the Spanish interpretation of this reminder. Como recordatorio, para dirigirse a la Junta, si aún no la ha hecho, presione 1 luego 0 en este momento. 
no presione 1, luego 0 por segunda vez o será eliminado de la fila. Gracias. Thank you. May we have the first speaker, please? Our first participant is Chris Wilson. Please state the public hearing agenda items you are addressing today. You may begin. Good morning, Chair and Supervisors. My name is Chris Wilson, representing LA BizFed. I wish to express our strong concern and opposition to the public hearing item number two regarding the currently proposed Green Zones program. While we appreciate that some of the scaling back in this proposed ordinance, we remain deeply troubled that this proposed ordinance would still seek to impose new requirements on commercial, industrial, and distribution facilities. BizFed agrees on sustainable ways to improve our overall environment. However, placing and creating additional burdens on working class families is not the appropriate route to take. This underscores a significant misunderstanding on how commercial and industrial facilities operate. Moreover, this policy will hurt our supply chain stifle the goods movement and the trickle down effect that will hurt local and small businesses. It is also important to note that much of this zero emission technology is still not available for most operations for at least five years. This is only one of the many examples of what is wrong with this proposed ordinance and the business community stands ready in any way that we can help to avoid the impractical outcomes and unintended consequences that this ordinance seeks to propose. Thank you, supervisors. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Edward Antonini. Please state the regular public hearing agenda items that you are addressing today. You may begin. Good morning, my name is Edward Antonini. I'm the president of Angelos Block. I'm speaking on behalf of uh, agenda item two, the green zones. I'm uh, calling in to voice my opposition to the ordinance. Um, as I said, I'm a local business owner in Gardena on Redondo Beach Boulevard, and I have worked with staff at LA County Regional Planning for over a year, but with no success in uh, mitigating the problems with this ordinance. Uh, it seems that uh, you want to throw the baby out with the bathwater because you have one or two bad apples that have uh, uh, polluted the environment. Uh, our business is not one of them. We are held to strict environmental regulation and um, you fail to understand the benefits of holding us to it, to all the conditions in our CUP process. Instead, you just want to downzone the property, which doesn't work. Um, uh, I've listened to countless hearings and public comment, and I don't appreciate being called an environmental racist. I think those are very egregious terms, and that does not describe our business. Um, you're trying to provide environmental justice for the neighborhood, yet you punish law-abiding citizens, and yet Excuse you me, allow time has expired. squalor May we have the next speaker, please? condition in front of my business to go unabated. So I would ask that you do your job. Your time has expired. County, May we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Jose Conejo. Please state the public he agenda, hearing agenda items we'll be addressing today. You may begin. Thank you, Supervisors. I'm calling on behalf of NAOP SoCal. We are the we have a thousand members in the Los Angeles and Orange County area. We are opposed to this requirement of the green zones that outdoor operations between the hours of 6 p.m. and 8 a.m. This is a uh, critical disruption to the goods movement. This will put more truck traffic right at the time when we have the biggest peak hour traffic. It's going to be uh, make the pollution from the uh, traffic on the roads even worse because you'll have more trucks sitting idling because they will be stuck in traffic. And I will ask you to please uh, remove this version of or this um, section of the of the ordinance. Uh, there are lots of other issues with this ordinance, but for this moment, this is one of the biggest uh, problems that we have. This hour of operations time is just going to make traffic that much worse. And it's going to con put more congestion on the road at a time when our goods movement is stalled, it's not moving, and we're having trouble getting things out of the port. So I ask you to please uh, make an amendment and remove this uh, 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. prohibition to allow for better goods movement. You're reducing the amount of time that um, businesses can operate for 10 hours. And that doesn't include lunchtime. It doesn't include all those things that have to be taken care of. 
So I thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Ariana Rodriguez. Please state the public hearing agenda items you are addressing today. You may begin. Hello, my name is Ariana Rodriguez and I'm a longtime resident of District 1, uh, Supervisor Solis' district. Um, I'm speaking on agenda item number two, the Green Zones Ordinance, and I'm really, really begging you guys to pass this ordinance uh, and provide some level of accountability on behalf of community for uh, these businesses that pollute us every day. Every day it's, you know, alternating smells here in city terrace between garbage and, um, you know, chemical artificial flavors, um, open doors, things like that. Uh, and Green Zones is just a first step to provide any level of accountability and mitigation. Um, this truly is an environmental justice and environmental racism issue, right? We were built this way because we were historically green, uh, red line. Um, and so it really is time to address, uh, you know, where community is, is right next to industrial um, and provide us some kind of relief. And so we really appreciate you uh, standing with us and um, taking your responsibility to protect community. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Karina Sanchez. Please state the public hearing agenda items you are addressing today. You may begin. Yes, hello. My name is Karina Sanchez. I'm addressing um, item number two, Green Zones. I'm a longtime resident of East LA. Uh, we need Green Zones to be approved today. No excuses. The community has worked for too long and too hard for this ordinance not to be passed today. Industry doesn't want this ordinance to be approved. Of course they don't. They don't live in our communities. They only care about the bottom line. It's time to be held accountable. It's time to respect our lives and our health. Polluters do not contribute to our economic development in our communities. Just come here to City Terrace and you'll see firsthand. They do not protect our working class communities, period. We need this ordinance to be approved in order to put our communities on the right path to achieving environmental justice. Our communities have suffered for too long from environmental injustice. Our local zoning codes and land use policies historically have been tools for segregating people and concentrating pollution in our working class communities. We are also plagued by weak enforcement rules and oversight. We are communities overburdened by multiple sources of pollution, blight, and economic depression. History of noncompliance has caused mistrust that cannot be overturned. As you know, we desperately need this Green Zones Ordinance to be approved today. By not approving the ordinance, you are perpetuating environmental injustice and violence. We need the board to approve the Green Zones Ordinance today. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Delia Ortega. Please state the public agenda items you will are addressing today. You may begin. Hey, I'm Delia Ortega. I'm addressing item number two, um, the Green Zones. Um, and I'm just calling to voice my support um, of passing the ordinance. I grew up in unincorporated Walnut Park right off of Santa Fe and have, have lived my whole life by like witnessing a lot of these serial polluters and a lot of the incompatible land use that we have throughout. I was also part of the ground keeping effort uh, where we documented just like how many companies, how many polluters we have next to schools, daycares, homes, churches, right? And so I think it's really critical to prevent future field polluters from taking advantage of like the current zoning situation um, and also to address the current issues. And so I strongly urge for us to prioritize environmental justice, to prioritize health and wellness um, and pass the Green Zones Ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Eric Previn. Please state the public hearing agenda items you are addressing today. You may begin. Yeah, for the green zone thing, you know, regarding recycling and waste management facilities, the ordinance establishes new definitions for organic waste and recycling, new permitting processes, and development standards for recycling and solid waste uses countywide. But you know, they had a meeting on this on September of 2021 when the board, you know, the board has been meeting in a very unusual way. They don't have public meetings anymore. 
So it's very, very worrisome that they would pass something like this on December 21st in the morning. I just find it, you know, uh, the process doesn't seem appropriate. And also the fact that you have been burning time on the clock when there are members of the public like myself who wanted to speak on other items. You have 35 items on your agenda today. That was earlier. Let's go on to the, the first item, which is the Las Virginis, the Seminole Springs item. Here you have, if you can believe it, they had to take down some trees to clear the way for during the storms or the fire. And there's been a problem. So now we're doing a land swap. Now land swaps where the county and this entity always benefit the entity. The county always does a deal that looks like it's good because the county only cares about not spending any money on its responsibility and typically allows people to get away with murder. I'll give you an example. Please, you me, your time has expired. Effort. May we have the next speaker, please? No, I have two minutes. I have two minutes, I believe. Hello, Patrick Soon. I have a reminder to address the board. If you've not already done so, please press one and zero at this time. Do not press one zero a second time. You'll be moved from the queue. Um, we will now hear the Spanish interpretation of this reminder. Como recordatorio para dirigirse a la junta, si aún no lo ha hecho, presione uno luego cero en este momento. No presione uno luego cero por segunda vez o será eliminado de la fila. Gracias. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Mark Lopez. Please state the public hearing agenda items you are addressing today. You may begin. Hi, I'm calling to address item number two. Uh, my name is Mark Lopez and I'm a resident of unincorporated East Los Angeles. I'm also with East Star Communities for Environmental Justice. Um, I just uh, urge the, the supervisors to confirm the recommendation of the Planning Commission who had several public hearings after engaging hundreds of community members and other stakeholders over the last couple of years to begin the process of transforming sacrifice zones, our community, to green zones. Uh, the planning department has been responsive to the people and polluters and made adjustments. None of these um, represent drastic changes. Uh, we're talking about a slow transition that will take years to fully implement. And, and these changes are critical for beginning the process of reversing the effect of historical environmental racism, which the status quo upholds. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Sonia Ramos. Please state the public hearing agenda items you are addressing today. You may begin. Uh, my name is Sonia. Can you hear me? And item number two. Yes, we can. Please begin. Okay, uh, my name is Sonia and I'm also from Ramon. I'm from East LA City Terrace. As, as you can see, uh, green zones is important for our community because for many years we have been saturated with pollution from different layers. And if businesses are with the community, they will be okay with green zones because green zones is not only gonna look for the buck, but for the community that their neighbors with. It's not okay to have constant illnesses in our community, dogs dying from cancer, and all the injustices that happen because businesses prefer a buck over people. So please, I urge the board to please, please pass this green zone. It's a beginning to future equality and lack of racism in, in our environment. I plead you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Madam Chair, there are no other speakers in the queue to address the board. Thank you very much. Our time for public speakers on the public hearings has ended, and we want to thank all that called in to speak. If you were unable to provide your verbal comments, you may submit written comments as indicated on the agenda, and we'll continue to accept all written comments that come in during the meeting, which will become a part of the public record. Today, colleagues will begin with the public hearing items one and two, followed by the set matters, items S1 and S2, then items four, five, seven, eight, 25, and finishing with item 31B. We'll now take up public hearing on, public hearing item number one, hearing on the La Sierra Canyon Wetlands Conservation Easement Amendment. 
Are there any supervisors that would like to make remarks? Seeing none, I would appreciate to, I would, it would be appropriate for us to close the public hearing and vote on this item. Item one is before us. Moved by Supervisor Kuehl, seconded by Supervisor Hahn. Madam Executive Officer, please call the roll. Item one is before you, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Solis. I'm, I'm sorry, Supervisor Mitchell. <laughs> Mitchell, I. Supervisor Mitchell, I. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you. We'll move on to public hearing item two, uh, the hearing on the Green Zones Program, project number 2018-003209. Uh, supervisors, we've got staff available if you have any questions, and I see the hands of Supervisor Hahn, who will be followed by Supervisor Salee. Supervisor Hahn. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I really wanted to speak in favor of th what we're doing here with creating uh, these green zones. You know, before I was elected to the board uh, back in uh, December of 2015, when, of course, uh, my, my colleagues, uh, Supervisor Solis and um, Supervisor Kuehl, uh, there was a motion to, to address the environmental justice of unincorporated areas of LA County. And now here we are six years later with an update from regional planning. And you know, this is so important because there have been years um, and decades of mistrust surrounding environmental issues around the county. And the establishment of these green zones will help to right those wrongs. You know, for too long, and I know I'm not the only one that's gonna say this this morning, but for too long, our residents have really suffered due to the negative effects of toxic industry located close to homes and schools. And we heard from many of them uh, during uh, public comment. Um, and I appreciate all those who called in today to talk about it. These green zones are not, you know, a rushed item, right? They've been a long time in the making. And I really want to thank Amy Bodek. I want to thank her team at Regional Planning for bringing to fruition our board's vision to create new green zones um, in unincorporated LA. And I know this was a countywide effort that involved many local agencies, community partners, residents to get to this point where this board is being asked to approve the program uh, and move it forward. Toxic pollutants near homes and schools are a serious threat um, to the health and well-being of our communities. I wanted to just say I understand some of the business owners that called in and felt like they were good actors and why are they sort of being punished. But I would say even good actors who operate, um, uh, you know, these kinds of industrial uses um, can have accidents. And to have that near um, homes and schools uh, is a problem. So even good actors sometimes have a bad acting, uh, you know, plant or or a use. So I, it's nothing personal. It's just that it doesn't belong next to our homes and our schools. And you know what I love about this? Because this, this is the power of planning. This is why planning is at the heart and soul of the quality of life for our residents. And we're using planning today to protect our communities and make our neighborhoods safe and healthier. In my new district um, and part of my old district, uh, we're getting uh, a couple of these new green zones. Um, West Whittier, Los Nietos will become a green zone as well as Walnut Park. Um, so thank you to everyone for bringing us to this day. This is the power of planning. This is powerful, but it's on the side uh, of our residents and our communities that it's gonna have the most impact. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Solis. Yes, thank you. Also, uh, I also want to uh, recognize the Department of Regional Planning, our director, Amy Bodek, and for the department's uh, effort in helping us get here. This was a really heavy lift for us. And as you know, we started back in 2015 uh, on this board motion. I was happy to 
be uh, one of the authors of that. And it's helping us to address the real issue at hand, which is environmental justice. And we heard that quite eloquently for many of the witnesses that called in today, representing these areas in the unincorporated parts of uh, Walnut Park, Lawrence Firestone, and of course, City Terrace. And I do want to make it clear that this has been a work in progress, and there has been several, several efforts to really get groomed, truthing studies done in a very meaningful way. And I, too, believe that it has to be a continued effort along the part of the County of Los Angeles to make sure that we are really recognizing and lifting up voices, even if you're not an incorporated city and you are in an unincorporated area of the county, you need to have representation and a voice. So I am so grateful to all the community stakeholders that provided not only their input today, but over the last few years in making sure that this board took action in a very meaningful manner. I'm very grateful to those community stakeholders for providing excellent and meaningful input, not just today, but for the past few years. The green zones ordinance and program before us are very much aligned with all the efforts that I know my office and many of you have been working on including all our stakeholders from City Terrace and Walnut Park. But more importantly, City Terrace is right now under siege because of so many businesses that are not appropriately, um, how could I say, following the line, uh, lines of regulations that they, as a part of doing business, are following. So we know that this is very important for us. I also want to say that the concerns expressed by our residents in, Bal in uh, Walnut Park regarding Central Metal have been over many, many years. We were very fortunate also this past year to be visited by the new EPA administrator who himself came out, walked the community with Congresswoman Baragan, came to Walnut Park, spoke to residents from the surrounding Southeast communities that I represented. Over the years, you know that the county has investigated multiple complaints of violations, including illegal storage of hazardous waste, contaminated soil piles, failure to minimize hazards, and unpermitted expansion of operations. Residents have repeatedly reported foul orders, metallic taste in their mouth, loud noises, severe vibrations, and increased truck traffic almost 24 hours. In 2016, I shuttled residents from Walnut Park in buses so that they could voice their concerns at our county's regional planning commission meeting where they were considering renewing the Central Metals Conditional Use Permit, the CUP. But given the testimony from those residents, the Regional Planning Commission denied Central Metals' request. Central Metals' business operations ceased in the summer of 2019. But unfortunately, hazardous material remains on the property. And to that end, LA County Fire Health Hazardous Materials Division was the lead in ensuring that all hazardous material was removed from the site which was completed in February, just recently in February of 2020. Shortly thereafter, a new tenant came in known as Fleet Yards, Inc. and began storing shipping containers on the site. Both Central Metal, the property owner, and Fleet Yards, the tenant, were cited for outside storage of shipping containers not in compliance. And in July of 2020, Fleet Yards vacated the site and Central Metal was no longer in violation of the zoning code. However, Fleet Yards has now submitted a formal application to establish a truck, trailer, and shipping container storage site in that location. So more work to be done. I urge uh, my members to support, our members and colleagues on the board to support uh, this hearing item on the Green Zones program. And really want to give kudos to all those that called in and to the stakeholders at hand that made this possible. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Any other call, uh, Supervisor Kuehl? Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. I want to echo the, echo the comments of my colleagues. Um, I, I think that uh, sometimes people representing their own interests, which they are, in a sense, required to do in order to keep their businesses going, uh, we can't blame them. Uh, they want to say this will impact me personally and my business personally, but one of the interesting things about a government like ours, and I may I just say the fact that we represent each of us a large swath of the county also means that we are, without exception, uh, people who represent these areas that are significantly impacted. 
Um, I think if I were only called upon to represent the West Side and there were no problems there, um, you know, it would be harder to really understand than it is having the representation of these areas as well. This has been an advantage to business over the years, not to have to take care uh, of what they do, to be able to pollute with impunity, to be able to really ignore regulations. And I'm very proud of what our planning uh, department has done and the way in which they have done it. They have taken their time as we asked them to years ago, um, Supervisor Solis, and you know wanted this looked into and got a report that uh, it really helps if you can just pollute with impunity and other people suffer. But it's our job, the five of us, to say, no, the people we represent should not be suffering without any limitation. And I think this is a reasonable approach. I love the green zones approach uh, in these unincorporated areas and I strongly support it. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you. Any other comments? Seeing none, it would be appropriate for us to close the public hearing and vote on this item. Item two is before us. Moved by Supervisor Solis, seconded by Supervisor Hahn to approve the item. Executive officer, please call the roll. Item two is before you, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you. We'll move on to now item S1, the American Rescue Plan funding report, something that we've um, asked be a um, standing agenda item to give us all the opportunity to hear reports from today. We're going to hear, of course, from our chief executive officer. Tisha Davenport, and she will be joined by Dr. Uh, D'Artagnan Scorza, who's the Executive Director of Racial Equity. Good morning, Madam Chair, and thank you, Board of Supervisors. Um, can we pull up the uh, PowerPoint, please? Thank you. So let me start off by thanking the board for the opportunity to update the board on the county's implementation of phase one of our spending plan under the American Rescue Plan. Today, I intend to do uh, two things. One is to contextualize the county's efforts to develop and implement um, an ARP compliant programs, ARP being an acronym ARP for the American Rescue Plan and then provide the board with the current status of programs that your board approved earlier this year. I wanna start out by noting that ARP is different than prior federal pandemic related stimulus packages that we've received in the county. Uh, the ARP implementing regulations require us in the county to think quite differently about our program design from how we develop programs to how we contract these programs and also how we track outputs and outcomes. Can we have the first slide, please? While we're moving to the next slide, um, on that slide, you will see, uh, yes, where have we been? So I wanna take a moment just to remind the board how we started our ARC journey. You may recall that on July 27th, your board adopted phase one of the spending plan for ARC which allocated $975 million of the 1.9 billion that we expect to receive in the county um, as part of our, our spending plan. Phase one of the spending plan covers three pillars, which you see on the slide. The first pillar related to emerging from the pandemic better than before. Those are really investments that are designed to increase housing for people experiencing homelessness. To create, more, to create more affordable housing, to reduce the digital divide, and to build wealth in communities that have historically been left out of generational wealth gains. It's also important to note here that in this tranche, your board has previously allocated approximately $87 million in, endorse, in investments to support the Care First Community, um, Care First Jails Last Community Investments. 
The second slide are the second pillar, building a bridge to an equitable recovery. Under these programs, they are essentially deployed, designed to deploy supportive services through an equity lens to jumpstart recovery for those who have suffered the most. It really focuses on stabilizing factors for those that are hardest hit by the pandemic, including small businesses and entrepreneurs, the arts and the creative and the and the creative economy. Um, it also includes programs to create opportunities for more stable employment and also to provide much needed services for families, including food security, child care, along with other services. And then there's the last pillar, fiscal stability and the social safety net. Essentially, the programs in this area shores up LA County safety net to ensure that it remains on firm financial footing as we emerge from the pandemic, as well as to position ourselves to continue to fight the pandemic. In total, 81 programs are funded through the ARP phase one spending plan administered by 17 departments across the county from parks and recs to library to public health and health services. And as I stated earlier, the county is slated to receive $1.9 billion in total. We received the first $975 million in May of 2021 and the second tranche of $975 million we're expecting to receive in May of 2022. Can we go to the next slide, please? The next slide um, talks about our innovative and equity-based approach. It's important to note that the focus on equity investments is meaningless without effective equity-based structures around which to design, implement, and track program outcomes. I won't go into detail on each of the board actions listed on this slide, but I wanted to highlight the many actions your board has taken to ensure county departments have the tools to make equity-based decisions when they design their ARP-funded programs. For example, in response to your board's actions, the CEO's Anti-Racism, Diversity, and Inclusion Initiative has developed a powerful data-driven COVID-19 Vulnerability and Recovery Index. With already support, Departments are harnessing this tool to identify populations and geographic areas most in need of services, and they can sort the data based on the type of program being considered. So for example, a small business grant program will filter data differently than a program designed to provide meals to food insecure populations. This equity tool is the backbone of the county's ARP program design efforts. Your board also approved an ARP compliant yet streamlined solicitation process on November 30th that will reduce the size of the solicitation document as well as the form contracts to a little less than 10 pages each, including only the necessary provisions to move programs forward while appropriately protecting the county's interests. This innovation in streamlining our contracting process is also expected to reduce the time for solicitation to two to three months rather than the 12 to 15 traditional month process. This is critical if we are to timely launch our programs to meet the needs that exist today. Can we have the next slide, please? As I said at the top of the presentation, ARP is different, and we've learned lessons along the way. ARP is a complex funding stream, and we continue to innovate as we design, develop, and implement. For example, unlike the CARES Act, ARP regulations require that contracts go through a certain solicitation process. That's different than the CARES Act Coronavirus Relief Fund. We did not have that solicitation requirement. This solicitation requirement therefore limits our flexibility. And that is why the streamlined processes that I mentioned earlier are so important. In addition to the solicitation process limiting our flexibility, it also provides an opportunity for county departments to apply an equity lens to the solicitation process itself so that even our contracting process is as inclusive as possible. 
By way of context, I think it's important to know that the county is not alone in trying to find the right path forward for designing ARP compliant programs and implementing them. Essentially, all other counties in the state are in the same boat. As a recent CSAC survey shows, California State Association of Counties, of the counties that responded to the survey regarding um, ARP implementation, about 65% of those that responded indicated that they have obligated 25% or less of their ARP funding. And about 95% of the respondents that they had spent less than 25% of their ARC funds with all the work completed. This information is important just to let the board know that as we move to design, develop, and implement ARC funds, the county is not an outlier. And I would argue that we're probably further along than some of our similarly situated uh, counterparts who have received um, larger ARP allocations. This also is very important in terms of the timeline for delivery. You may recall that under the coronavirus relief funds, we essentially had about a year to spend those funds and the original deadline was December of 2020 uh, before it was extended. Under ARP, we actually have until uh, December of 2024 to encumber those funds. And in certain situations, we actually have until December of 2026 to actually spend down all of the ARP funding. There are two additional slides on this presentation uh, that goes into deeper detail related to deployment of ARP programs. And so I will now turn the remainder of the presentation over to Dr. Sorza, the Executive Director of the County's Anti-Racism, Diversity and Inclusion Initiative. Dr. Sforza, who has been boots on the ground with departments to design and launch the board approved ARP programs uh, will walk the board through uh, a status on our implementation efforts. Thank you so much, Ms. Davenport, and good morning, supervisors. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Now, to truly recover from the COVID-19 pandemic and support the communities most impacted by this crisis, the county has taken an innovative approach to recovery, which expands upon our ongoing commitments to achieve equity, as well as ensures we are designing and tracking outcomes that focus on prioritizing highly impacted communities and delivering services that address their needs. As we continue to build our collective muscle to advance equity centered and data driven approaches in this recovery, we have learned many lessons along the way. However, while the changes we are advancing through our equity center approach takes time, we have also achieved some uh, significant process, uh, progress to date. Uh, Artie has worked closely with the Internal Services Department to develop an Equity Explorer mapping tool uh, that our CEO has referred to, an ARC dashboard that displays ARC project allocations and key project indicators. As projects begin reporting on their outcomes, the dashboard would also include performance data by project, spend tracking, location of services and contractors, as well as equity metrics. We are currently aggregating and verifying data to display the dashboard publicly at the top of the year. As previously noted, RD is conducting extensive trainings and workshops for each department to ensure alignment of our projects with federal guidelines and board directives so that we can strengthen capacity to advance our equity driven efforts. We've developed a series of equity tools and built systems to streamline project accounting, tracking and reporting in partnership with auditor controller, ISD and CEO budget and special projects. Some of these tools are being leveraged to support other initiatives, including the county's Care First, Jail's Last Community Investments Initiative. ARD is also ensuring all relevant updates, resources, and opportunities related to ARP are available via our website, um, via the CEO's website, which was launched earlier this year. Individuals and organizations can see details about the spending plan and the county's equity center approach, access contracting opportunities and solicitations as they come online, and we'll soon be able to access our public facing dashboard and mapping resources. We're launching an internal website for county departments to access templates, trainings, and videos to support with their ARP projects. And finally, as it relates to contracting, RD is currently working with the Center for Strategic Partnerships to engage philanthropy to help reduce barriers for community based organizations and small businesses who are striving to secure county contracts and funding opportunities. As we are aware, the county's contracting process. Uh, can sometimes be complicated. However, 
with the recent approval of your boards um, of the board's motion to uh, streamline contracting, uh, <clears throat> we have been able to ensure with the added requirements from the federal government uh, that philanthropy and community partners can receive the support needed to ensure that they have equitable access to these opportunities. Our teams have worked closely to streamline the contracting process with CEO and county council in recognition of these challenges. And while we recognize that many of the CBOs and smaller contracts trying to benefit from these efforts reside in communities most disproportionately impacted by the pandemic and by, the, and, and by other crises, we aim to serve these communities and further advance our equity goals. Next slide. We're continuing to work with county departments and initiatives to align with federal and county requirements as we approach this work in a new way. While the federal guidelines include rigorous evaluation, um, calls for intentional community engagement, and demand strategic efforts to increase awareness of our services across diverse audiences, RD is working closely and is proud of the hard work our departments have engaged in to align their projects with these requirements. Many of the programs are currently in the project design phase utilizing these equity tools, and nine of those programs have been authorized to launch totaling $90 million, uh, $90,200,000, including homelessness and housing services, as well as small business rent relief, among others. We've learned key lessons during the process and have received incredible feedback from our departments, uh, which has served to, to, to provide positive input. Um, and think about how we can both reduce the additional steps needed and some of the, the uh, back and forth required during the feedback process and project design process, as our goals have been to not only strengthen this process and ensure that we are able to uh, uh, meet the requirements of the federal government, as well as uh, not compromise the board's directives, but allow us to speed up that process to get funds out the door as soon as possible. With that being said, we like to close by, by, by adding that for many departments, advancing equity-based program design requires a paradigm shift in terms of how we think about how we deliver services, who we deliver them to, and how we measure our impact. Thank you. Now I'll turn it back over to our CEO. Thank you, Madam Chair and Supervisors. That concludes our presentation and we would be happy to uh, answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much and it was just for the depth and the quality of the slides in your presentation, which is why I wanted um, to make sure that we add this as a special order to allow us, uh, us all as board members and the general public to understand the uniqueness of this funding. I am so proud. Your pride is the wrong word. I am relieved as not only a member of this board of supervisors, but as a county resident that the county had the infrastructure and that we were ready um, to launch these funds um, in an equitable, appropriate way. Your slides four and five that talked about our dashboards and your mapping process, the work with the departments, um, our contracting sensitivity, having run a CBO, uh, contracting with the county certainly wasn't easy. So I applaud the work of both of you. Uh, Dr. Scores, uh, congratulations on the uh, new addition to your family. Uh, appreciate you both making the presentation. Um, it was um, very helpful and we look forward to hearing from you as we as a board and the members of the public can track the progress um, on the execution of these grants and the spending of this, these federal dollars. These federal dollars that certainly have strings attached, you made that clear. Supervisor Solis, you had questions? Yes, thank you very much, Madam Chair. And I too wanna thank uh, our CEO, Bija Davenport and Dr. Scorza for your presentation. And um, you know, like, like all of us, I know we are really um, ready to see this implementation uh, begin as soon as possible and, and by helping to expedite the contracting process so we can get the funding out to the, to our uh, very much necessitated uh, communities out there. Um, I did have some questions if you could just clarify for the audience and for us regarding the 87.7 million in CFCI funding, uh, Measure J funding, would you please remind us of the kinds of programs and services that will be provided through this funding? That's that's one of my first questions. Yes, thank you, Supervisor. So the 87.7 million, um, those, those investments are comprised primarily of two categories. 
Uh, one of the categories is a list of programs that was actually uh, suggested by the uh, Measure J or the um, Care First Community Investment Advisory Board. Um, and the second uh, area of programs include programs that were not necessarily recommended by the advisory board, but were consistent. So for example, they represent investments in communities uh, that we know uh, have concentrated disadvantage. They focus on uh, job training, um, support for small businesses, as well as opportunities for uh, housing and employment. So those are two general categories. And if, the, if it's your uh, wish, I could actually provide a little bit more detail on the names of some of those programs. If you could just send those along to us, I think could be helpful. Yes, for, for we can us, that would be great. And then my next question is, um, how will our communities actually be notified to engage and who will be targeted for these particular engagement uh, conferences or, or uh, sessions that will be put together? And then I have a final question. Yes, I'll take the first part of that supervisor and I'll let Dr. Scorza answer the, uh, the second part. So there are uh, two, uh, I guess, platforms that are proceeding at the same time. So one is on the Care First Community Investment uh, platform, and we have listed those opportunities on the website for ATI. The second piece are the ARP funded programs uh, that aren't necessarily Care First Community Investment, and those programs should be listed um, on the county's uh, website as those solicitations and those opportunities uh, become available. And let me just ask Dr. Scores if I need to add anything to that. Thank you, um, CEO, uh, Ms. Uh, Davenport. Uh, Supervisor, that's absolutely correct. Both uh, websites house these programs. Uh, and in partnership with ISD, we've also been able to flag any subsequent uh, requests for proposals that will come from departments or solicitations that will come from departments so that communities can be notified However, one of the reasons why we're working closely with the Center for Strategic Partnerships is to ensure that we're able to provide technical assistance and outreach to those community-based organizations. In addition to that, um, our calls for departments to develop a community engagement plan and outreach plan. And so in our project design process, we're working closely with departments to ensure that they are uh, developing that community engagement and outreach plan. And as um, your board may be aware, when the commercial rent relief program was, uh, was launched, there was a lot of outreach that many of your board offices did to help meet the needs of folk in our community. That type of work will be needed moving forward for many of our departments, uh, and RD is working closely to ensure that departments uh, are incorporating those strategies in their outreach and design process. Right, right, and thank you so much. I know it's gonna be somewhat cumbersome to really try to reach out to our um, mom and pop small businesses. I know that was a challenge for us on the renters relief as well as getting out some of our grants and in part because many of our uh, constituents are immigrant based and they're monolingual. So I want to just underscore how important it's going to be to talk and speak in their different languages. So API community has a variation of different uh, di dialects and, and uh, different uh, types of languages as well as as well as I, I think many others as we're going to find. So just hope that we can have a really robust effort in providing those outreach uh, opportunities in a way that is very meaningful and that we kind of grade ourselves on how well we do as well, because that's going to be equally important. And then just the technical assistance, it should also be uh, matched uh, appropriately for any of these grants that go out, especially to new CBOs that may find themselves competing with bigger CBOs that have traditionally received an abundance of funding. Now we really want to break that open and allow for new uh, venture uh, organizations to help fill the gap that is so, so large here in the County of Los Angeles. So I wanna thank you for the presentation and I look forward as we move forward to having this information available in an easy manner as our, our chairwoman has constantly said, it's good to have it up on a dashboard so everyone can see it. Thank you both for your presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Supervisor Hahn. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and uh, I agree. Thank you for designating this um, as a set item for our meetings. Uh, and thank you to uh, Dr. Scorza and our CEO for their presentations this morning. Um, you know, government has to be transparent in our uh, decision making. And today is a perfect example 
of how we can help the general public understand um, what's been happening with the nearly $1 billion in the American Rescue Plan funding that the county received in phase one. And I know we're working on various efforts around making contracting better, streamlining the solicitation process, building capacity for our small mom and pop uh, organizations. And uh, all of this work is in parallel with our Care First community investments. Um, these are all great efforts. It's a massive undertaking, uh, but I just wanted to emphasize again, you know, that uh, we've got to get this money out to uh, our communities and to those um, who really need to be rescued uh, after uh, this devastating pandemic. And uh, for too long, our community pro providers have been kept at arm's length sometimes for um, local, state, and federal dollars. And we know that it's these organizations on the ground that uh, make the collective impact in every community um, across this county. So uh, I didn't really hear it mentioned, but I, I know at one time we were talking about a third party administrator where we could sort of park the money and then they could really work on getting it out um, to these organizations. I'm just going to ask, where are we with that? Um, have we have we hired a third party administrator? Are we not going in that route anymore? Um, and then maybe someone could give me a little more specific timeline on when we think this money will reach our communities. Yes, thank you for that, Supervisor. So uh, there are again two uh, parallel platforms here. Um, on the third party administrator for the Care First Community Investment, uh, that um, solicitation is still in progress. Uh, as a matter of fact, it was just re-released um, one day this week, um, and it is expected to be open for a couple of weeks uh, so that we can, again, uh, get a third party administrator on board with the hope of getting the money out to the community-based um, organizations, as you suggested. And then on the other side with the uh, ARP funding that will be moving through the departments in addition to streamlining the process, we have a hybrid model. So we've streamlined the process so that we can contract with our small community-based organizations. We have a 10-page contract, so it's not 100 pages where people have to kind of mull through it. And then departments will also have the opportunity to contract with a third-party administrator should they choose to do so. We can provide in our next update uh, as we get information from the departments what their intent is. Uh, all the programs are a little bit different. Uh, some of them might be easier to contract with a community-based organization and then others it probably makes more sense to do a TPA. We will include updates on that as that information becomes available in our future updates. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Kuehl. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. I um, I wanted to comment on how unique this whole approach is in terms of uh, looking, uh, casting an equity lens on so much of what we are called upon to do, uh, not only as a response to this pandemic, but in terms of other kinds of reforms in which we are all participating in the uh, justice reforms, for instance, which is really what the Care First Community Investment Money was primarily about. Um, it means that we want to try to understand need and not just have it be top down from the county. And that has been our approach really over the past five years at least. Um, like the chair, I'm very proud of this approach. Uh, I think that the uh, unanimity that we have found on this board in agreeing on that lens, on adding alternatives to incarceration as a very strong functioning unit, on adding Dr. Scorza's unit, anti-racism as a very strong element in the CEO's office, um, I think sends a very strong message about what we mean to do. It's not just, oh, we've got a bunch of money, let's give it all, you know, without asking. Um, the balance that we try to strike, I think we'll be talking about for a long time because we have expertise in our departments. 
and we have people who provide services in our departments and we have trusted them to allocate both within and without the departments. Now we are looking in a slightly different way at a more central approach to working with our community-based organizations that I think is the right way to go. Um, I know it's gonna be bumpy a little bit at first because we know that the expertise is in the community, but not always uh, looking as organized as we would like it to look in terms of reporting back to us, in terms of accountability that we require. And I think that's going to be the major challenge. But honestly, um, you know, having run a couple of nonprofits and uh, uh, community based organists been on their boards, I have to say this is it's it's a breath of fresh air and I don't see it in a lot of other counties, but I would really recommend it to them because this is the way that services get to those who need it most. So thank you very much for the report. Uh, for the thinking, for finding a way to augment the Care First Community Investment Funds with ARP money. I think it was very um, necessary and uh, a great positive step. So thanks to the CEO, uh, thanks to Dr. Scorza, thanks to Judge Armistead who has participated and all of the community people who made this happen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Any other comments? Supervisor Barger. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I want to thank uh, Fizia and Dr. Scorza as well, but I also want to thank you, Supervisor Mitchell, for your leadership in bringing this to the Board of Supervisors as an item that we're going to discuss regularly. I think it's important. I think with the amount of money that we're talking about, it's important to have that accountability, but also to have that transparency in terms of how it's being allocated. And, you know, as it relates to the website and communication, I am all about streamlining the contracting process. I mean, this has been a struggle long before we got this infusion of money. And, uh, you know, I use the example of the Weingart um, when, they, when they provided a report, it was identified repetitive, duplicative requirements for monitoring contracts within each department. And so you had contracts with mental health and maybe public health and, and maybe another department and each one had to have their own monitor who was required to validate when in fact you could streamline that process and accomplish what needs to be done and that is accountability across the board. So I think that you know engaging the, uh, the philanthropy as well as the CBOs and smaller contractors is gonna really shed light on what we can do better, but also remembering that we have a lot of money on the table and the potential for fraud is real and we need to make sure we have a balanced approach that is sensitive to those mom and pop, so small CBOs that want to apply for this money, but because the the contracting, getting even to become a contractor becomes so difficult and so confusing, they opt not to do it. And I think we have an opportunity to really um, transform how we do it and at the same time, um, ensure that there's accountability across the board. So again, I wanna thank you for this. I look forward to hearing the presentations. I think this is an exciting opportunity um, and, um, I just really commend everybody for what they put forward. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, and and I'd like to uh, thank County Council. Um, you know, I'm I'm still new at this and learning every day. And uh, thank you for the technical catch. Um, that much like our standing report from Public Health, um, we added language to the motion um, for this standing report to make sure that in the event based on the information is shared, that is shared, we, we choose to take action that we can. So thank you, County Council, for um, adding that. Um, so we'll be consistent um, with actions taken by this board previously. I appreciate that. This, is, this report is received and filed. Hearing and seeing no objections, that will be the order. We'll now hear, we'll move on to um, S2, our public health order. And we'll hear a presentation from Drs. Barbara Ferrer, Director of Public Health, and Dr. Christina Galley, Director of Health Services. Dr. Ferrer, we'll begin with you. Has Dr. Ferrer joined us? 
Hi, this is Barbara. Can you hear me now? We can hear you now. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, good morning, uh, supervisors, or really good afternoon. I, I appreciate the opportunity to thank you once again for your leadership and support during this ongoing pandemic and to update you today on the emergence of the Omicron variant in LA County and public health response. Today, I'll provide an update as well on the emerging science on Omicron, our local metrics by vaccination status, including some comparisons to previous surges, and share information about a modeling study and how it informs our contingency planning. I'll close with our recommendations on how to reduce spread, <clears throat> sorry, as we enter a winter surge during the holidays. I'll take the first slide. The Omicron variant continues to be of major global concern. As we're all aware, this variant has been particularly worrisome because its large number of mutations raises the possibility that it's going to behave differently from Delta in a manner that can cause some serious public health threats. What we've learned over the past week is that compared with Delta, Omicron multiplies and gets transmitted faster than Delta. It also shows signs of having reduced immune protection, both from vaccines and prior infection. So far, it appears disease caused by Omicron has similar severity to that of the disease that's caused by the Delta variant. Yesterday, the CDC noted that Omicron is responsible for 73% of new, case, new cases across the country. And here in LA County, we've obviously seen big increases in the number of confirmed Omicron specimens. As of yesterday, uh, we've uh, we had confirmed Omicron variants uh, associated with 99 cases. I think that's already up to 104 this morning. None of our cases are known to have been hospitalized or to have passed away. Next slide. We're just learning a lot about Omicron, unfortunately, very quickly. Some highlights from the past week of science on Omicron include findings that this variant is about three times as likely to cause an infection as the Delta variants. And as I noted earlier, immunity from past COVID infection does not prevent Omicron infections well. In a study conducted in the United Kingdom, the risk of reinfection with Omicron variant was five times the risk of reinfection with other variants. Some good news that we're learning is that the mRNA vaccines and boosters, those are Pfizer and Moderna, still provide some protection for preventing Omicron infection and hospitalization. A South African study demonstrated that two doses of the Pfizer vaccine had 34% effectiveness at preventing Omicron infection, and that receiving a booster raised vaccine effectiveness to 75%. Another South African study showed that two doses of the Pfizer vaccine also had 70% effectiveness at preventing Omicron hospitalizations. Because severe illness is what causes the most individual suffering and the greatest likelihood of overwhelming our healthcare systems, it's critically important to know that vaccination and booster doses continue to make a significant difference in health outcomes. Next slide. COVID rates related to the Omicron variant are rising rapidly all over the world. On this slide, you can see the daily new confirmed COVID cases per million people in the United Kingdom. That's shown in that top pink line. The United States, which is shown in the middle brown line. And in South Africa, which is shown in the green line. Although the measured case rate in the United States overall remains relatively low, Cases in individual localities are spiking. In New York City, the case rate is 870 cases per million people per day, with total daily cases the highest they've ever been since the beginning of the pandemic. Meanwhile, here in LA County, between December 11th and 17, we saw about 212 new cases per million people per day. The data from New York City is sobering because of the very rapid increase in cases, tripling in less than a week, and because often surges that start in one part of the country are then seen across many other states within a short while. Next slide. 
I do want to just uh, also take an opportunity to update you on our numbers. Uh, these are yesterday's numbers, but I just got today's numbers and uh, sad to report an additional 25 people have passed away. This brings the total number of deaths to 27,473 across our county. The suffering from this pandemic is unimaginable. And to everyone who's grieving the loss of a loved one, our hearts and our thoughts are always with you. We're reporting 3,052 new cases today, bringing the total number of cases in LA County to 1,570,230. The number of daily cases reported in LA County, similar to what was seen in New York City, did increase nearly threefold since the beginning of last week. To date, nearly 10 million people have been tested and had test results reported across the county. Our daily positivity rate is now 3%. Two weeks ago, test positivity was 1.2%. And this increase is another sign of increased community transmission. The daily average case rate has ri risen by 13 points since last week to now be at 26 cases per 100,000 people. That's a daily rate. CDC's estimate of our weekly case rate is now 167 new cases per 100,000 residents. Again, another increase. So we remain at a high level of transmission countywide. Uh, yesterday, there were 743 people hospitalized with COVID-19, a number that's been holding fairly steady these past few days. There are currently 169 open investigations at residential settings and non-residential settings where there's at least one confirmed case of COVID-19. We'll go to the next slide. For several months now, we've been looking at our case and other outcome data by vaccination status, where we've generally divided into two categories, those that are fully vaccinated and those that are unvaccinated. However, with the increasing recognition that fully vaccinated people who have received booster doses have additional protection from Omicron in particular, I wanted to share the data we have on case rates by three categories of vaccination status. Unvaccinated, fully vaccinated without an additional or booster dose, and fully vaccinated with an additional or booster dose. You know, as a reminder, high risk and older adults became eligible for booster doses on October 21st. You could see that with that blue arrow. And all adults became eligible on November 19th, indicated by the purple arrow. And then uh, teens uh, became eligible, 16 and 17, became eligible on December 9th. Uh, you can see here cases have been highest and have recently begun to increase rapidly among those who are unvaccinated. And that's represented by the dotted line at the top, reaching a rate of 272 cases per 100,000 unvaccinated people on December 11th. So this was almost two weeks ago. Meanwhile, cases among people who are fully vaccinated but have not yet received boosters, represented by the dashed line, were much lower and only recently began to trend slightly upward. And that rate there is about 68 cases per 100,000. It's reassuring to note that the case rate among people fully vaccinated who also received an additional or booster dose was nearly flat at 12, not much higher than it was in September. These data support other findings, findings from around the world, suggesting that boosters are offering us a layer of protection that is critical to maintaining high levels of antibody defense. In previous briefings, I've talked a little bit about monitoring what we call rate ratios. This is the ratio of outcome rates in unvaccinated people to the outcome rates in vaccinated people. And we do this to see if there's a change in the protection that the vaccines are offering. The higher that rate ratio, the more of an advantage people with some level of vaccination have over those who are unvaccinated. If I look at these numbers, the case, the case rate ratio on December 11th was four for unboosted fully vaccinated people and 23 for boosted vaccinated people. Obviously these vaccines continue to work and the advantages offered by boosters are impressive. Next slide. Our hospitalization rates among fully vaccinated people are still too low for us to meaningful, meaningfully be able to compare people who have received additional or booster doses with those who have not. But we do continue to gather data about each of these groups. 
On this slide, though, I'm able to show you the differences in hospitalization rates between unvaccinated people represented by the dotted line and fully vaccinated people represented by the solid line. While hospitalization rates reached 25 hospitalizations per 100,000 among unvaccinated people, they remain nearly flat at one per 100,000 for fully vaccinated people. This is a consistent gap that we've seen between these two groups, indicating that even when transmission is moving upward, vaccination continues to be highly protective against hospitalization. And if we were to do the calculation on the rate ratio here around hospitalizations, the hospitalization rate ratio on December 11th was 25. This means that unvaccinated people were hospitalized at 25 times the rate of those who were fully vaccinated. Next slide. Uh, while death rates due to COVID generally do not increase until a few weeks after we see our cases start increasing, the difference in the risk of dying from COVID by vaccination status is, as you can see, significant. Unvaccinated individuals are 20 times more likely to die than those who are vaccinated, and we'll continue to follow these trends closely. Next slide. Given the significant protection that's offered by vaccines and boosters, we're reassured that with vaccines now available to everyone five and up, we're continuing to make progress in vaccination coverage across the county. As of December 12th, 97% of LA County residents, this is really December 22nd, sorry. As of December 22nd, 97% of LA County residents, 65 and over, have received at least one dose of the vaccine. After about six weeks of vaccine eligibility, 20% of children five to 11 have received a dose of the vaccine. 80% of teens 12 to 17 received at least one dose. And when we look at all residents 12 and over, 84% receive one dose and 76% are fully vaccinated. Among LA County residents that are five and over, 78% received one dose and 70% are now fully vaccinated. And to date, more than 2 million LA County residents have received additional or booster doses. While these numbers are impressive and they represent the tireless efforts of hundreds of vaccine providers, there are about 2.2 million eligible residents who have not yet received their first dose of vaccine and 3.1 million residents that are currently eligible for boosters that didn't yet get their additional dose. As we see these worrisome increases in cases, it's clear we urgently need to get more people protected by vaccines. In particular, we're gonna to need to close the gaps that we see in booster uptake in communities with less health affirming resources. As of December 16th, about 14% of residents in our hardest hit communities have been vaccinated compared to 23% of residents in our other zip code communities. While some of this difference can be explained by the later uptake in the initial series, these disproportionalities need to be resolved to reduce the additional inequities and outcomes that often follow surges in transmission like the one we're seeing now. Next slide. And as we prepare to manage the winter surge, one of the areas of most concern is how to protect our hospital system from being overwhelmed. Modeling studies that were done by Dr. Peterson and others at the University of California at Berkeley estimated how Omicron would affect hospitalizations statewide, depending on its ability to cause severe disease, which as I mentioned, is a question that's still under investigation. This work also looked at how increased rates of vaccination and boosting and decreased rates of contact between people that leads to transmission of the virus could affect the impact of Omicron on hospitalizations. While every model has its limitations, and some obviously make some assumptions that turn out that can turn out to not be true, there are nevertheless some helpful lessons that I think we can take from this particular model. When you're looking at this slide, the dashed black line that runs across the length of this graph, just above the 20,000 mark on the y-axis, it indicates California's peak hospital census from January 2021, which was at the worst of our winter surge. The solid red line, the uppermost line on this graph, indicates a statewide hospital census we could expect if the Omicron variant turns out to cause disease severity similar to Delta's, 
and we have no changes in our vaccination rates, our booster uptake, or our effective contact rate. This line reaches all the way up to about 50,000, which is more than double the state's hospital census during the worst of last winter's crisis. And it's made an even more unbearable thought by the healthcare worker burnout and staffing shortages that have followed not only in California, but nationwide in the wake of that terrible time. The solid blue line that rises as high as the 25,000 mark indicates the hospital impact we could see if Omicron turned out to cause about half as much severe disease as the Delta variant. And we again saw no changes in vaccine and booster uptake or in the close contact rates. This is still pretty much a nightmare scenario for the state and obviously for our county. The dotted red line comes up to about the 20, the dotted red line that you see below that comes up to about the 20,000 mark is the level of hospitalizations that we could expect to see even if Omicron causes as much severe disease as Delta did, but we did three things all at the same time. We doubled our rate of boosting, we increased vaccination rates to 80%, and we decreased transmission through close contacts by 10% for about 30 days. While this is still a very high rate of hospitalization, it's slightly lower than the California peak last year. The lowest line is the dotted blue line representing the same interventions and a lower severity Omicron variant. Although 10,000 hospitalizations a day across the state are far more than we ever want to see, it is more manageable than the alternatives. As you can see, even if Omicron causes half the severe disease that Delta does, and that's realistic because we have a lot of people vaccinated, it can still be a major threat to our hospital systems and our residents. Realistically, to avoid the worst of the scenarios, we need to uh, work right now to increase vaccinations and booster uptake. These are key. And our robust mobile vaccine infrastructure gives us the ability to reach residents in our hardest communities, hardest hit communities with these vaccines. With 70% of our eligible population fully vaccinated, this number has room to grow, but it can grow quickly. Additionally, rapidly ramping up boosters among our residents would have a tremendously protective effect. And widespread testing would allow individuals who are infected to then know that they should stay home and avoid getting others sick, reducing that transmission from close contacts. Today, we begin distributing 600,000 test kits to various uh, agencies. It's over 350 agencies across the county serving the communities that are hardest hit by COVID-19. And this will give us a good start towards being able to have people use testing as a manner to decrease transmission from infected in individuals to others. Next slide. Our priorities for managing the upcoming winter surge of transmission haven't changed. Our number one priority is to protect the people who are most vulnerable to severe illness from COVID, which includes residents at skilled nursing facilities and in settings that serve people experiencing homelessness. This translates to ensuring access to vaccines, boosters, and testing for all staff and residents in these settings, requiring routine testing for staff, residents and visitors to school to skilled nursing facilities and vigorously managing outbreaks and providing technical assistance at sites serving people who are most vulnerable in our communities. Our second highest priority is ensuring our hospital systems are not overwhelmed. Efforts to protect our hospital system are coordinated by the state and the medical health operational area coordinator under DHS. And there are ongoing conversations that the entire region is prepared to manage additional cases. This winter, it's also important to ensure that healthcare workers are fully boosted given the huge advantage offered by the additional dose. And we know from our past, if our planned efforts do not succeed in keeping the hospital stable, we may need to institute additional community mitigation efforts where they're appropriate. Next slide. Every new piece of information we get about Omicron increases the importance of having as many residents as possible vaccinated and boosted. If you've been waiting to see if the vaccines are safe, to see if they're necessary, to see if they're right for you, we're hoping that you sense the urgency of this time. Omicron is a very big threat to our well-being and our recovery journey, and it's shuttered theaters, 
on Broadway and here in LA. It's postponed sporting events, closed holiday celebrations across the world, and required entire countries in Europe to impose significant restrictions. Getting vaccinated and boosted will protect lives and livelihoods. It's easy to find a vaccine site, and we encourage those needing to get vaccinated or boosted to bring a friend or family member to provide support and to ask as many questions as you need to so that you know what to expect. Demand for testing has been increasing, and we're grateful to those that are taking steps to know their status before gathering with the people they love, before or after traveling, if they were exposed to someone who has COVID, or if they're feeling sick. We want to thank the state and the network of over 350 community providers that stepped up this week to provide free home test kits to residents in some of our hardest hit communities. And we're grateful, of course, for the president's new commitment to in January being able to ship kits directly to people's homes. To find information about how testing helps or instructions on using a home kit or to find a vaccination site near you, you can visit our testing website at covid19.lacounty.gov slash testing or our vaccine website at vaccinatelacounty.com. And while I know we're all hoping for the day when we can ditch our masks, that time has not yet come. Masking remains really important given that our vaccines aren't as powerful against Omicron. And masks that fit well provide a good physical barrier against an airborne virus. Given that Omicron is widely circulating, it's also best to consider upgrading to medical grade masks when you're gonna be in close contact with others not in your household. These include surgical masks, KN95 masks, or respirators. While continuing to add on these layers of protection is exhausting, I appreciate that two of the layers we're able to use this year weren't available last year. Vaccines and an ample supply of tests. And for this, I am grateful. So while we all need to be very cautious and make significant efforts to protect each other, we can be together this holiday season in ways that just weren't possible last year. And this is progress during a pandemic. On behalf of the entire department, I wanna wish the supervisors and their entire teams a safe and peaceful holiday. And I'll be glad to answer your questions uh, after Dr. Galley's presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Ferrer. Dr. Galley? Yes, thank you. Good afternoon, supervisors. I'll briefly cover hospitalizations, vaccinations, and testing, and then would be happy to take any questions you have. If you go to slide two, please. This shows the current number of COVID-19 positive inpatients in the DHS hospitals over the past month, the four hospitals at the bottom, and then the blue line, which is the total at the top. As you can see, the COVID census has run pretty steady around 40 to 50, 45 to 55 or so COVID positive inpatients, and it's remained there and has not yet bumped up. Over half of these patients represented in the chart are in the hospital for something other than their COVID infection, but they were noted to have a positive COVID test on admission. As community transmission increases, this number will also increase. So always take caution when interpreting the data as not all COVID positive hospitalizations reflect people hospitalized for COVID. Though certainly as those, hospital, those COVID testing numbers uh, go up, we also do expect that that will translate into an increased number of individuals hospitalized for COVID. To put these numbers into context, I'll remind you on the next slide, slide three, please, of the scale of the surge in the winter. <laughs> this was the four hospitals and the peak census that we experienced over the winter surge in 2021, where we had a peak of almost 550 inpatients at any one time, and then the smaller peak in the summer up to about 100. We're still only at half of that smaller peak in the summer, but I'm cognizant and please realize as you look at this chart, how very quickly those numbers can climb. And so when you look at the surge, it went from the uh, rate really very similar to what we're at now in October up to that peak in December and January over the course of just several short weeks. On the next slide, this shows the age trend in the population that we're seeing as COVID inpatients. Hospitalization rates among pediatric populations, that blue line down at the bottom, continues to thankfully be very low. The highest rate that we're seeing is among those aged 18 to 49, in part because of their somewhat lower rates of vaccination among this population. 
DHS has not yet had a need to curb non-essential surgeries or procedures. We will certainly do so if it is needed, but we intend to preserve the access to our patients that those procedures represent for as long as possible. As many of our patients are still receiving care for conditions that was delayed or rescheduled during the pandemic or for which they sought to delay themselves and, and wait before entering uh, medical care. As has been true throughout this pandemic, the biggest barrier to expanding capacity during a potential surge will be securing sufficient staff to operate any available beds. The data that was just shared by Dr. Ferrer is concerning in showing the potential likelihood of what those graphs might look like and how we could very easily reach levels of hospitalizations that were seen during the 2021 winter surge. Hospitals across LA County and California, including but not limited to those within the Department of Health Services, are not likely to be able to flex their beds as high as they could last winter. Staffing is just more limited this year due to a variety of factors, and those include a high number of individuals who retired during the course of the pandemic and are no longer in the workforce, the shift of some staff out of inpatient and emergency department clinical areas choosing to take jobs in outpatient clinical areas, staff also that have been removed from clinical assignments due to non-compliance with mandated vaccination orders and other factors. So remember, hospitals will be stressed and overwhelmed far earlier and faster than they were last year. The best option that we have to manage the situation is to move everyone toward vaccination and boosting, as well as to continue the steps of masking and testing, as Dr. Ferrer just mentioned. If you go to the next slide, with respect to staff, vaccination rates are a critical element in protecting our workforce protecting both their own lives, but also reducing the likelihood that they have an infection, even a mild one that would cause them to call off work sick and thus make them not able to take care of patients and reducing the risk that they would transmit the virus to others. As you can see on this slide, DHS has a very high vaccination rate within our facilities. The rate is still as it has been highest among the physicians uh, and other clinical staff and somewhat lower among our non-clinical staff. Uh, overall, though, we're at just over 95% of our DHS employed workforce that is now documented as being fully vaccinated. Getting the booster shot out to these staff as well as to others is also now a core part of what we're focused on. So on the next slide, slide six shows the latest booster shot data. We have delivered over 8,000 booster shots to DHS staff. The vast majority of those provided within DHS facilities. We do not have the ability to query the state immunization registry for data on workforce members. We can only do so for patients. So we only know if staff have been vaccinated uh, at a non DHS facility, if they provide us with the documentation of that dose. So this definitely represents an undercount on the booster rate that we have within the DHS workforce. We are encouraging staff to provide this data and we'll update the slide as we can in the future. So you can see here, we're also working to get the booster shot out to patients. Over 28,000 booster shots have been given to date. The evidence is increasingly clear that the booster shot is an essential piece of safeguarding both in individuals and also the community's health in this phase of the pandemic. All those who are age 16 and older who are six months or more out from their last dose are eligible for a booster shot. And this is really a public health necessity. The reason why the booster shot and the vaccines in general are encouraged so widely is not because it protects the health of the person who gets the shot, though it is certainly that is true as well, but because it protect, protects that community's health. And I just want to comment briefly on Omicron. As Dr. Ferrer shared and as was shared by the CDC yesterday, it is now the predominant strain in the United States. If people's response to these variants and to their continual emerging in our society is that it keeps them from getting vaccinated or stops them from getting vaccinated or stops them from getting a booster shot because they think it's not working, then the problem of the variants will just escalate. The core public health rationale for vaccination is to protect not the health of the person getting vaccinated, but the health of everyone else around them. The vaccines and boosters, when needed, reduce transmission of the virus, reduce infections, and in doing so, reduce the risk that that virus will continue to mutate and mutate potentially into a form that's more virulent and puts everyone's life at risk. That is what we're trying to avoid. 
So ultimately getting vaccinated isn't just about protecting one's own personal health. So that is true as I've mentioned, and it is communicated as such, but it's really about protecting everyone else's health around you. That vaccination, that booster shot is our only safe way out of the pandemic. I'll shift very briefly to testing and then we'll close. If you go to the next slide, uh, slide seven, this shows the current utilization of the community testing sites across the county. You'll note that the city of Los Angeles closed all of their community testing sites as of December 4th. The remaining testing sites um, used to be listed in yellow. You can see it listed as city, county, but now those, those yellow bars and the dark blue bars represent county capacity only. Even with the closure of the city sites, we have 60% of our available ca capacity currently uh, unused and available. Uh, we have ramped up and down throughout this pandemic, the availability of community testing based on demand and are able to ramp it back up as needed in the future. So thankfully with testing much more widely available uh, through many other locations, places of work, schools, uh, the regular healthcare system, uh, there's many more opportunities for people to be able to access testing than what is located just on this slide. Uh, next slide, slide eight, is a reminder just for you of, of where the community testing sites are located. And there's information about all of these sites on the, the county's COVID testing website. And then finally, slide nine focuses on persons experiencing homelessness. The test positivity rate remains low, though there's been some increase uh, over the fall in the test positivity rate under the unsheltered population, but um, most recently has declined again. Uh, that will continue to be monitored, and we have a lot of outreach teams uh, working in partnership with a number of other entities and community-based organizations to do outreach to both the sheltered and the unsheltered population. Uh, I will close there, but more than happy to answer questions, and thank you so much for your support, and I wish everyone a happy holidays. Thank you very much, um, both doctors, Ferrer and Galley. Um, first up, we'll hear from Supervisor Salif followed by Supervisor Barger. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, and thank you uh, to our outstanding uh, staff, uh, Dr. Ferrer and, and Dr. Galley. Thank you so much for all the work that you've been doing uh, up until now and as we go into the holidays. But I wanted to ask uh, specifically about this new initiative that the president announced today, the delivering of 500 million tests to homes across the uh, country. And I'm wondering how we are going to actually uh, provide that supply uh, to our communities, but more importantly, how we are going to tell our residents, those that don't have access to our website, those who don't have electronic abilities, how we're going to reach them, and especially for homebound individuals. So uh, that's my first question. So uh, Dr. Ferrer or Dr. Galley, Dr. Galley. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much, Supervisor. Um, we're still waiting for the details, obviously, from the White House. The plan that we've heard from uh, the president's office is that people will be able to sign up uh, electronically uh, on a website um, to be able to uh, get these kits distributed. You know, really, they'll be mailed. Uh, it will be managed at the federal level. Uh, they'll be mailed to individuals, individual households. It doesn't appear that there's uh, any targeted groups that are being singled out, uh, but rather this will be an effort that will be available to every uh, single person uh, living in this country. Uh, we, have, of course, uh, have the same concerns you just raised. We want to make sure that people who don't have access to computers or can't easily figure out how to sign up, get support with that. Uh, we continue to recommend that in addition to uh, that strategy that has people signing up, we continue with the strategy we're using right now, which is focusing on in our hard hit communities, working with uh, all of the provider organizations that provide a whole host of services to folks uh, to allow them to be able to distribute uh, these test kits uh, to uh, people who uh, obviously, like the rest of us, would like to do more testing, uh, particularly as they're gathering with others not in their household. Um, so we'll wait until we get more details for, from the White House, but we and the state are committed to continuing with the strategy uh, that we started implementing this week, which is making sure that as people go to our food pantries, our houses of worship, 
Uh, they're getting other services and support from community-based organizations. Uh, those organizations are able to distribute uh, those test kits. Every test kit will have a sticker on it so people will know what to do if their test is positive and a phone number where people can call us uh, if they need help and support. Um, so, so we're anxious to, to immediately start this. So uh, we trying to obviously have as many people as possible get uh, hold of these kits uh, before uh, they start gathering uh, for the Christmas holiday, which is which is right in front of us, um, and and other holiday celebrations that people are going to have over the next two weeks. So, so Dr. Ferrer, just to clarify, then, for example, our federally qualified clinics won't get a supply of these tests; they're going to be mailed directly to people. To their that's, homes? The, I mean, that's the plan that was unveiled today, but there were earlier plans that really did talk about uh, making sure that federally qualified health centers were going to get a supply of these kits. So our, our hope is, is this is in addition to the earlier plan that was in fact going to use a distribution mechanism uh, that would be based with our federally qualified health centers, as well as other clinics that serve uh, people with uh, less economic means and higher need. Uh, and I'm glad you you stated that we're going to continue to push out in different ways, especially during the holidays, since we don't have school. Many of yeah. our public schools and our schools are going to be closed. So a need to continue to get the testing out and the vaccines and going to those non-traditional places, not just shopping malls, but swap meets, places of worship and what have you, um, and, which I, I think is great. My next question is really for Dr. Galley, and it's really more about how uh, we're going to be dealing with individual residents who have difficulty properly quarantining or getting access to the county's quarantine and isolation sites if they can't isolate safely because they share maybe a, a room with two or three people or uh, multi-generational. Uh, what outreach and what plan do we have in place for quarantine and isolation sites? My supervisor, thanks for that question. Uh, we continue to operate uh, quarantine and isolation sites in the county. Those uh, are currently about 60% of the capacity is available right now, and we have the ability to further expand the capacity uh, with some appropriate lead time. So we'll be watching those numbers carefully and ramp it back up uh, uh, if we need to in the future. If you'll recall, uh, several months ago, earlier in the surge, we were operating um, uh, six additional sites more than what we are today. Uh, so we understand, uh, though, while well, hopefully we don't get there, we understand that we may need to increase capacity in the future. Um, we want that resource to be available for anyone that needs it. And the Department of Public Health operates an access line that we work in close uh, collaboration with them on it to be sure that when people are notified of a positive COVID test or an exposure, uh, that they are made aware of the resource that's available to them if they don't have a safe place to quarantine and isolate. We also work to get that messaging out through the number of the community-based organizations that we contract with who are out in some of the hardest hit communities, often in areas where there's crowded housing or where they may not have safe places to quarantine and isolate so that people are also aware of that resource from that angle. Great, thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Chair, appreciate you. Both. Thank you and your staff. Thank you. Just a quick follow up before I go to Supervisor Bark or follow up on Supervisor Solis's inquiry. You know, I, I, I remember, you know, the FQHCs and community clinics weren't first up to get vaccines and they had to push hard and then we had to fight to make sure they had them and, and thank goodness because they've helped us. So I'm hoping that that infrastructure will be um, supported in getting home testing kits too, just because so many of our community members um, are going to those community trusted uh, resources uh, around vaccines. I hope home tests will be given to them to distribute to their client base as well. Moving on to Supervisor Barger, who will be followed by Supervisor Hahn. Supervisor Barger. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I want to thank you, Dr. Furr and Dr. Galley, for the updates and your continued service to our communities. Um, you both highlighted um, really the concern that we've heard in the community, and that is the surge um, and just what it's going to be as we move into the holiday season. And I think you pointed out, Dr. Ferrer, that, that our approaches order is not going to be the same because of the fact that we now have the vaccination as well as therapeutics that are in play, but we still need to encourage 
our residents in LA County and throughout the state and quite frankly the nation to get vaccinated and when appropriate to get the booster because we know that that is the most effective tool to protect our communities. Um, but I wanted to point out there, there was an article that was written in the LA Times by Melissa Healy um, and I, I thought it was an interesting article. It talked about South Africa which has a different situation going as it relates to the age of, of the residents there um, versus here in the United States. But but it, it pointed out a couple of things that I, I found that we need to kind of take a step back and recognize. And one thing it talked about is that it said that microbiologists and epidemiologists um, and evolutionary biologists um, who have pondered how the pandemic will end, a cluster of mutations that defang the virus ability to sicken while boosting the transmissibility has long been a favorite scenario. So in other words, we know that, that um, that you're going to have mutations. I mean, that that is kind of what we have with the flu. Um, but how would you respond to that? Because there are public health experts that do feel that this may be a blessing in the long term, the Omicron. Yeah, it's such a good question, Supervisor. Um, I think, again, you know, the, the question that remains to be definitively answered is how much severe illness is caused by Omicron. You know, if it if it's going to continue to cause a lot of severe illness, and it's going to infect people at a higher rate than Delta, um, so if it causes even the same amount of illness that Delta did, but it infects two or three times as many people, it can easily, as as we've all looked at the numbers, it can easily overwhelm the healthcare system. And I think that's the issue: is you need a variant um, that's going to really cause a lot less severe illness so you could tolerate the spread uh, because mostly it's resulting in a very mild illness and or illness that only very small numbers of people and again it'll probably be similar to other viruses those that are you know most vulnerable end up needing a, a lot of additional care provided by the healthcare system we just don't have evidence to date to suggest that that's omicron um, so, so right now, a lot of folks in this country are looking at the data and saying much more likely that what we have is a variant that's not going to cause more severe illness than Delta, but probably is going to be equivalent. Uh, and that for us could end up being problematic. Um, so I do think we have to be prepared um, to, to really protect the healthcare system uh, and, and be ready uh, to move forward with sort of strategies that are doing that. I think you're absolutely right, though. You know, we have a lot of evidence that the three things we're suggesting people do uh, will make a difference. Uh, I think at the end of the day, uh, we have to find out exactly how much of a difference that's all going to make in protecting both those most vulnerable. So right now, the data coming out of our skilled nursing facilities is pretty positive. Uh, we have very high rates of, of residents being vaccinated, certainly working hard to get the staff uh, to be boosted. Uh, residents boosted at over 85% already. Um, and for boosted residents at skilled nursing facilities, uh, their rate of very bad outcomes when they become infected, i.e. going to the hospital or dying, is very, very low. So we have statewide data that just again says these very strategic uh, strategies or, you know, uh, very targeted strategies are going to be helpful uh, with Omicron. But I think the question for all of us is, are they going to be helpful enough? And and I appreciate that because I know that right now they're estimating, I think you may have said this, 73% of the cases in the United States are the Omicron right now. Yeah. That is, um, yeah. and, you know, I mean, and, and again, this article, I was, I was reading it and I, I was reading it because I realized, and I know you know this because you do the, I mean, this is this is your life, um, but there are varying opinions on how this Omicron is going to play out across the country. And I've talked to several people who have um, tested positive um, and have had the Omicron who say it was like having a bad cold. And and this article does point out that um, that uh, this virus could become an, an um, endemic nuisance virus, joining four other coronaviruses that have settled among humans and are key causes of a common cold. Which actually, I remembered that this the corona is our cold, common cold is in that family with the coronavirus, correct? Yes, okay. uh, absolutely. And, and, I'm not and, and I, I think that's that's you know what what everyone feels you know would be the the very best that could happen. I think folks are 
not feeling so good about Omicron right now, though. And I'm not diminishing the the seriousness of this, yeah. but um, I I do recognize that that um, that the severity if immunized, and again, I think that's where we really need to talk about vaccinations because yeah. while it's not a hundred percent, it's not as effective as it was against the Delta. It still does prevent the hospitalization. Um, as it relates to what we're seeing so far with the Omicron. It, would that be a correct statement? Absolutely. And and that's why, you know, we continue to say, you know, uh, we never, we, no, no vaccines are 100%. And, and the biggest um, and most important um, part of our vaccination efforts is to protect against severe illness and death. And these vaccines are holding up really well, uh, especially uh, the mRNA vaccine, Pfizer, and Moderna against Omicron. So absolutely, as, as Dr. Galley said, no reason for people who are not yet vaccinated to say, you know, I don't need this. It's not going to help. It's helping enormously. And it is our chance at just seeing lots of mild illness and not lots of severe illness, because uh, that's likely what will happen uh, for the vast majority of people that are fully vaccinated and, if eligible, boosted. Thank you. And then, Dr. Galley, just I want to make sure I heard you correctly, because we hear, you know, in our reports and even on the news, they report um, uh, people in the hospital with um, uh, COVID-19. But you pointed out that those people are being admitted to the hospital, not because of COVID, but for something else when they're tested. So oh, about 50 percent. Of- yeah. OK. Yes, that's right. It's about half and half. Half are there for COVID. The other half are there for something else. They may have had a car accident or some other condition and they happen to test positive. We test everyone on admission. And then are we monitoring, and I don't know if we can um, because of HIPAA, but are we monitoring of those that are hospitalized in LA County um, that were hospitalized for COVID? How many have been immunized and how many have not? We monitor that and, and that's why I'm able to show that slide that shows the, num- the rates for people fully vaccinated and hospitalized and the rates for unvaccinated and hospitalized. Because, yes, we collect that information. Uh, it's a, you know, it's part of the reporting requirement. We don't get it on everybody, but we get it on almost everybody. And, yes, we're able to, to actually track on that. Because I think that's an important, I think that paints an important picture as it relates to those that are not vaccinated, um, um, you know, the potential of being hospitalized and and again I know someone who was in the hospital for three weeks not immunized um, and is now having to go through physical therapy um, in order to gain um, strength because um, they underestimated this virus and so I think it's important for us to recognize that and and again I don't I'm not saying with the um, Omicron it could be it could be the because the, the Delta is still here correct yes Delta is still here um, but rapidly, Omicron is overtaking Delta. So I would say within the next two weeks, it's almost all going to be Omicron. As a matter of fact, we people ask us all the time. We don't obviously sequence every single positive case. And they ask us, well, you know, what should I do? And we now say to them with the 73% rate, we say you should assume it's Omicron and be as careful as possible. Uh, and make sure that you're giving us and talking to us about close contacts that you're really isolating uh, because you're highly infectious. Right now, I, I have two two final questions, and I think they're going to be easy. The, the White House and Secretary Becerra have echoed what you've spoken about regarding the need to focus on the severity of cases, not raw case numbers. Um, can you again explain why there, it is less important to look at the daily case numbers and the priority focus should be on hospitalization data? I just want to understand that. Yeah, I think, um, especially now when we we think Omicron is going to cause a big surge in cases, but we also think because we have more than half of our population, and here in LA County, it's almost uh, almost three quarters of our population is vaccinated, and that will provide a lot of protection against getting serious illness. Uh, If you look at cases and make all your decisions just based on the caseload, and as you noted, Supervisor Barger, most of those cases are mild, um, you could end up in a situation where you're overreacting to high case numbers that are neither translating into threats on on, uh, human life nor overwhelming our healthcare system. So we have to strike that balance. 
Uh, and the way to do that is to be looking at, you know, that's why I, I try to talk a little bit about the rate ratios, because that's telling us how well our vaccines are performing in real time. Um, and then looking at hospitalization. So all of us are, uh, with this go round, uh, we're very, um, we're, we're tracking very carefully what's going on with our hospitals. And obviously, uh, we will set thresholds uh, of what can be tolerated fairly low, knowing that um, if your cases start going up, it takes 10 days to two weeks to see an increase in hospitalizations. Uh, so if you're tracking on hospitalizations, you need to move quickly enough if you're trying to mitigate against overwhelming your healthcare system, knowing that two weeks after you act, it, you'll first start seeing an impact on hospitalization. So we have to just take into account the lag time. But it is the hospital care system uh, that we need to protect. Got it. And then my last question, and then I will say thank you when you're done. But um, have we, have, is there any recent update regarding the American Pfizer COVID therapeutic treatment pills? Um, and has, have the, have the feds communicated with you what the distribution plan for these pills will look like when approved? Yeah, that's such a great question. Um, and I'll get back to you supervisor with all of the details on that. Um, there is, um, a plan in place. Uh, there's going to be very, very limited supply. So there is a plan in place. Uh, that the state is managing, we are not managing it, um, that will distribute um, that supply to a variety of providers uh, in our communities, really targeting um, the, the providers that deal with folks who will likely, if they get sick, have the worst outcomes. I, I think, again, you know, we're going to start with scarcity and then we're gonna be able to, to move to a much wider distribution network. We have been trying to, we have been working with the state to make sure that even the initial network allows for a good penetration uh, among people uh, at high need and takes into account that it's not just uh, paying attention to their medical needs, but we've gotta make sure that that access issue is dealt with as well. But I can uh, provide I can provide an update to the entire board. None of it's been distributed yet. Um, that's at the federal level. We haven't received the the medications yet, as as far as I know, for this newly approved drug, which was actually uh, not the Pfizer dose, uh, but the dose from Merck. Uh, sure. Pfizer, we're still waiting to figure out uh, what the distribution will be for that and the approval for that. So, um, but the Merck drug. And there's also a sort of a prep drug that can that can be given. Uh, it's a transfusion uh, at a hospital site or an outpatient clinic. Those are where the plans are now. But I'm I'm happy to give you a, a more a more complete update. That would be great. And again, thank you and thank you, Dr. Galli. And I think my colleagues would all agree the greatest gift you can give during this holiday season is to be take this seriously, but uh, get vaccinated and you know wear the mask. I mean, I I find now that Omicron is out there in the community and on any given day, whether I'm at the market or anywhere, I'm sure that there is someone around and I, it's not a false sense of security, but I do have a sense of security um, knowing that by wearing a mask, I am at least protecting um, myself. Um, so I would ask people to take this seriously as we go into the holidays. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Hahn, followed by Supervisor Kuehl. Oh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, uh, and thank you again for these updates. Uh, you know, it's amazing me how quickly the Omicron has swept this country. Some seventy-three percent of all the cases are now uh, Omicron, which has just happened really fast. But I guess that that um, uh, you know verifies the fact that it is so contagious. Thank you again, Dr. Frere, Dr. Gali, for giving us this update. Um, and I, uh, you know, I agree with uh, how my colleague, um, Supervisor Barger, just ended her remarks by reminding everybody to, to take this seriously, um, you know, wear your mask, it does make a difference. However, um, I was just going to ask you a question, Dr. Farrar, having said that I'm, you know, wearing my mask and I believe in it when we go out and when we're in public, 
I do have a city that I represent who immediately uh, brought to my attention the fact that uh, San Francisco and some other Bay Area counties were granted an exemption by the state to their indoor masking mandate because they already had a health order uh, in place that allowed certain businesses like gyms and offices to be exempted from the indoor mask requirement um, if they uh, were all vaccinated and they checked for proof of vaccination. Um, so these cities that contacted me have very high vaccination rates and we're wondering, uh, would is that something that they would also be allowed to do to um, loosen their indoor mask requirement in a small office setting where everybody's vaccinated? Um, and is that something, Dr. Ferry, um, I mean, can we make a request to the state to allow um, certain cities who have a high vaccination rate um, to follow the same model as San Francisco and how would that even work? That's my question. Thanks so much for that um, and appreciate the concern obviously by that city. I, I think a couple of things are worth noting. Uh, what, the, what the state did is they grandfathered in existing health officer orders. Um, so where there was an existing health officer order, they didn't want to uh, actually uh, just make a, make a huge disruption uh, in that health officer order. That's not our existing health officer order. I also want to note um, that those were uh, health officer orders that were issued before Omicron. Uh, Omicron evades vaccines more than Delta. Uh, wearing the mask is, uh, it's not even just sort of a, uh, if you're vaccinated, you know, you're going to kind of put it on maybe, but you don't really have to worry. Uh, all the data I just shared shows that you still have a pretty decent chance of uh, perhaps getting infected. You aren't likely to get very sick. You aren't likely to end up in the hospital. Uh, but A, I don't think most people want to get infected. And B, if you get infected, you can infect someone else who isn't uh, as lucky as you are about not getting, uh, not being at risk for serious illness. So I don't think this is the time to be lifting indoor mask mandates. Um, I think this is the time for all of us to be more cautious, not less cautious. Uh, those masks add an, an important layer of protection when vaccines aren't working as well as they used to. And I would suggest everybody keep them on. Uh, certainly happy to look at this uh, as we get uh, away from the winter surge. Uh, but right now, you know, masking remains a critically important layer. And, you know, we're encouraging people upgrade your masks, you know, go to a surgical mask at this point. Uh, be really, really careful because you need all of these layers uh, to be able to enjoy all of the things we want to enjoy over the holidays. Thank you for that. I will definitely pass on uh, your answer uh, to the cities that have been uh, requesting that. But let me uh, change subjects a little bit to the, um, the city of Los Angeles has a, an ordinance a little different than ours in relations to um, proof of vaccination required, particularly as it relates to the restaurants in LA City. Um, and I was just gonna clarify for, again, some people that have asked me, um, is it your team that is enforcing the proof of vaccination requirements for restaurants in LA? Yeah, thank you, Supervisor. Um, I think that's important. I'm glad I have an opportunity to explain how this is working. At the restaurants, our inspectors are in fact checking uh, at the restaurants whether or not they, if they're in LA City, whether or not they're in compliance uh, with the city's uh, vaccination requirement, particularly that they're verifying uh, that people are in fact uh, fully vaccinated if they're indoors. If they are not, what we do is we make, give a reminder to the restaurant and we send the name and the address of the restaurant to the city of LA for them to do the follow-up and to make sure that, you know, after our reminder, they're coming into compliance. If there are gonna be citations issued, they will be issued by the city of LA. Thank you for that clarification. Um, and again, I, I, I know uh, for some, uh, 
restaurants, uh, it's a it's a divisive issue, but I do know that uh, I think the the uh, the majority of the public uh, feels much better about this, and in fact, is choosing restaurants uh, that require proof of vaccination. So I just want to uh, encourage all the restaurants to know that the, the public is is generally on the side of dining in a place where proof of vaccination is required. And then my final question, Dr. Pereira, do you think um, based on how quickly uh, Omicron is taking over and even though the cases might be milder, we are seeing an increase uh, in hospitalization, are you envisioning any changes to our local uh, health officer order to prevent our hospitals uh, from being overwhelmed again? We're obviously going to, you know, look very carefully at what are the strategies that are appropriate uh, as we see uh, more and more cases. Um, and I, but what I what I do want to note is we we're not where we were last year. We have new tools, so we don't need to do what we did last year. You know, I, I know lots of people are most concerned about you know, closing everything down. I think if there's a decision to sort of close things down, close schools, send everybody home, that would be made at the state level. And that would really be that it was catastrophic again. Uh, and our healthcare system just couldn't provide the services that are essential. And we, nothing we're doing is slowing down transmission. We got two good new tools here. We got vaccines and boosters, and we have lots and lots of testing capacity. My sense is if we can, again, all get behind using these tools, keeping our masks on, uh, we have a chance at being able to do this without that more uh, restrictive measure. That doesn't mean that there aren't smaller things that we could do uh, to protect us at some of uh, the places where there might be very high risk. So those uh, large mega events, <laughs> Um, you know, we need people to keep their masks on. So there may be things we do to, to make it easier for people to keep their masks on. Um, we need to make sure that uh, in certain places we're getting uh, people their booster doses um, so that, so that again, we reduce risk. Um, but I know the, the thing that's top of mind is do we see in this near future closing back down our stores, you know, telling people they have to stay home. And, you know, my hope is no. Um, but that's a hope, and it really depends on us being able to use these new tools we have to the best of our ability uh, to actually be able to mitigate against this uh, pretty big threat that we play that we all face with Omicron. Yeah, thank you so much for that. I mean, those are really encouraging uh, words from you because I, I agree. I feel like we're talking about this differently than we did a year ago, and. I think the fact that we have something to say, we hope we never go back to uh, that devastating time when we did have to close down uh, restaurants and stores and, and, and people's livelihoods were at stake. The fact that we have that at least to compare with this year and say, if we do all these things, we will be uh, hopefully avoiding any other uh, monumental uh, uh, lockdown of businesses or people. I think that is encouraging uh, note to end on. So thank you, Dr. Fair. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Kuehl, do you have any questions? I do, Madam Chair. Thank you so much for asking. Um, batting cleanup here, I, I want to unpack a little bit uh, several things that have been said about vaccinated and unvaccinated people. Uh, there is a growing concern among a lot of people, uh, especially those who are more vulnerable, like my age cohort, about the dangerousness to us of unvaccinated people with whom we might come in contact, uh, people we don't know when we're in you know, various places. So I wanted to ask you to clarify uh, if you would, Dr. Ferrer, um, a little more. You've indicated that even though I'm vaccinated, I can still become infected, though I would very likely have much milder symptoms, which is good. You've indicated that even though I'm vaccinated and boosted, I can still sort of carry and pass this on. And that 
we don't know about the virulence of that or haven't been told. People who refuse to vaccinate, the refuseniks, as we used to call them, um, indicate a lot of times, including those in our own ranks, and I find it very troubling, well, it's my body. I'm making a decision for me, it's my freedom. And even as you know, usurping the messages that we developed in the women's reproductive rights movement. But it's not just your body. Um, and I think it would be good if you might clarify for us, because in your modeling, you show that if more people get vaccinated, we will ha not have the spike. Uh, and so that means to me, it's the unvaccinated people infecting us and also providing a welcome host for these new variants that is a major part of the problem. So I'd like to understand, do we want people to get vaccinated not only for their own safety, but because they are a threat to others? Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Supervisor Axiol. I, I think this is an important question and you know, I know it's top of mind, um, you know, and I also think, and I want to thank uh, Dr. Galley, you know, who made it clear that, you know, there are two reasons you get vaccinated. You know, one is it does give you, as we've shown, a lot of individual protection. But the second is, and it's just as important, is that it also protects lots of other people. And as a reminder, I want to note that children under four still cannot get vaccinated and, and they have to rely on people around them being fully vaccinated. And for older people, people who are immunocompromised, people with serious underlying health conditions, even if they're fully vaccinated and boosted, uh, the, the very nature of their bodies makes them more vulnerable. Their immune systems in general don't work as well. So uh, that makes them more vulnerable uh, to what still is a deadly virus. So I agree with you. Uh, unvaccinated people unfortunately create risk, not just for themselves, uh, but for many others. I'd like unvaccinated people to understand that um, this, like many other social obligations we take on when we're part of a community, um, are important for people to really understand. Um, you don't get to drive a car unless you follow the rules of the road and get licensed. Um, in many of our workplaces, you need to get certified that you actually have skills and a license to do a particular job, even if you think that you're fine doing it. Uh, we have requirements. Uh, we have requirements that prevent us from hurting each other. And this is a similar requirement. And I, as everyone knows, am in favor of the targeted vaccination mandates that recognize uh, that in some places it's really essential that our workforce go ahead and get vaccinated. And we're always here to answer people's questions. We recognize that there's been a lot of misinformation circulating around social media. A lot of people who aren't getting vaccinated aren't because they're scared, not because they're trying uh, to be, you know, sort of this, this bad person. Uh, they have a lot of questions. They've heard a lot of things about the dangers of this vaccine and, and it stops them uh, from taking uh, an action that would be appropriate. Uh, so we're here to continue to answer questions, but we do at this point uh, say, you know, the evidence is just overwhelming around the safety and the effectiveness of the vaccines. And we really need the unvaccinated people to understand that they're the fuel for this virus spreading and the fuel, unfortunately, for us continuing to deal with lots of more dangerous, potentially more dangerous variations. So. Uh, of the virus, these these variants. So so please, you know, now would be the time. Get your questions answered. Come in, talk to people, talk to, at the vaccination sites, talk to your provider, uh, because we do need everyone uh, to come in as quickly as possible and take advantage of these uh, protections. Well, as I think I've mentioned before, I love going to the movies, and of course now I only go in the city of Los Angeles. Right. Because, well, I mean. Because, you know, I mean, Spider-Man opens, a lot of people want to see it. There's people there. I feel much better that uh, at the bottom of the stairwell, before you can even get into the theater, you are stopped at a desk. You must show proof of vaccination. You must um, show your ID. Um, and I hope that they'll change it to require proof of boosters um, as well, because I think that's an important 
addition and you get a, a wristband and you know like it's a really cool club um, and I, you just feel better in a situation because it's going to be, um, you know, it's not as limited as it used to be, which leads me to my next question. I wonder if there might be a way for us to set different limits for businesses that check and businesses that don't, or at least to explore it, um, because it gives a choice, which everyone seems to be madly in love with these days. Uh, if for instance, if you check and only allow people who are vaccinated and boosted to eat in your restaurant, you can have a greater capacity indoor and outdoor. But if you don't, you must have more, much more widely separated tables. I do understand the problem that this, you know, provides for checking on them. But I wonder if there's a way to um, reward businesses that check. Uh, I know the city of West Hollywood required proof of vaccination for all of their bars, knowing that those bars were always very crowded. Um, and it was a boon to the business in a way, um, as well as, you know, still limiting indoor capacity and outdoor capacity. So I wonder if you know of any jurisdiction that has made this distinction in terms of uh, capacity, uh, kind of the ability to do business, essentially, uh, is rewarded. Yeah, thanks so much, Supervisor uh, Kuehl. I, I don't know, but we'll obviously go and look and see if anybody's, um, you know, issued any kinds of requirements that make, you know, that separate uh, what can happen in a facility in terms of capacity uh, depending on whether or not people are fully vaccinated. I do want to note, and I want to support Supervisor Hahn also who noted this, uh, that we have very high compliance at, at all of the bars and lounges. And I mean, very high, like over 90%. And in the city of LA, these first couple of weeks that we've been out and about uh, checking on compliance at the restaurants, it's also above 90%. Um, so I think it is true that many businesses are somewhat relieved uh, to find out that there's an opportunity to actually blame somebody else for a requirement that actually keeps them, their staff, and their customers uh, safer. Um, and, uh, and, and we've appreciated that and frankly, you know, thank all of our business partners for that. It's just been a very different picture of compliance around the vaccination uh, uh, verification requirements. And I think it's because, first of all, you saw the numbers, well over 80% of folks in LA County over the age of 12 are, are vaccinated. So, you know, we the vast majority of people also appreciate the fact that they can be vaccinated. And I think that helps as well. Well, I think people are relieved. I mean, I um, have admitted to going to the movies every weekend when it was quite separated and there would be five people in the theater, maybe seven. And as soon, but as soon as LA put in their requirement that everybody had to be vaccinated, I noticed a, a, a noticeable uptick. I'm not saying it was jammed. I'm just saying that twice or three times as many people, and that's still only 15, might be in the theater. Um, people felt, really felt relieved about it. And I, I hope that other cities and perhaps our own uh, county uh, will also explore it because it has not resulted in a whole long line of people complaining about having to show, you know, their IDs, et cetera. Um, so just to recap, people who are unvaccinated are not just a threat to themselves, but more of a threat to other people. And not only their own health would be um, attacked worse, but also they would, I guess, be more infectious to other people. Um, and uh, we want everyone to continue, not just through the holidays, but certainly through the holidays, to make certain that they follow masking requirements. And even if you don't know if it's required, to mask up. Because uh, even if you get a little sick, but millions of us do, that is a real burden on the system as well. So I thank you so much for this work. You must be exhausted. Um, and, um, you know, we'll, we'll do our best to back you up. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Thank you, uh, Supervisor Kuehl. And to your point, Supervisor Kuehl, uh, popped up on my news feed not, not 10, 15 minutes ago. The city of San Jose is um, moving toward requiring booster shots. So that may be uh, a direction municipalities see themselves going. So uh, we'll keep our eye on that and see if um, Drs. Ferrer and Galley think we should go there. And I also think it's important, uh, as the LA Times business section noted yesterday with regard to our concerns around um, the business community. Uh, notable outbreaks in several of our large employers in LA County, SpaceX being one of them, uh, one of the FedEx um, sites near LAX, and a mid-sized restaurant had a significant number of positive tests. So I think continuing to adhere to our new tools, I believe, as Dr. Ferrer mentioned, um, the new tools being vaccines, which we didn't have a year ago, is really going to be important. A couple of quick questions for me as we wrap up. In your slide that made the suggestions on what we should do, you talked about testing before family gatherings. I think the question really is how far in advance of the family gathering should one test? Because you can test too early or perhaps test too late. So could you give us some advice or counsel on that? Uh, that's a great question and, and thank you. Uh, thank you, Supervisor Mitchell. The testing, um, the testing issue uh, for, you know, sort of what that time frame should be really depends on, on a couple of variables. But in general, the rule is the closer to the time you're gathering that you can get tested, the better you are. Because obviously, if you test too far in advance, uh, you can test negative on a Wednesday and then on a Thursday or Friday, uh, you can actually, if you were to test again, be positive because you had an exposure and it's taken that long uh, for you to have enough viral load for us to show up in a test. Um, so we generally say to folks, you know, the closer to the gathering, the closer to the event you're attending, uh, the better off you are. And that generally means using one of those rapid antigen tests. Now, those rapid antigen tests are not quite as powerful uh, as uh, what we call those molecular PCR tests that we are mostly familiar with, because that's all that was available for so much of this pandemic. But they're accurate enough, and, uh, and they're worth using, particularly in this situation where you're going to a gathering. We do recommend that people who have symptoms, A, please don't go to a gathering. And you may want, if you have symptoms, to go ahead and get that PCR test, because it is the more accurate test. Um, and in general, because we have a lot more testing capacity, even for those molecular tests, you're getting your results within one to two days. Um, so that also means that that's also, you know, good enough. I mean, I, I think this is sort of the good enough rule. Uh, the best thing to do is to be able to test as close to the time you're gathering as possible. If that's not possible because you don't have access to a rapid antigen test, please go to a community site a day or two before uh, where the tests are free and you can go ahead and get tested and still have a negative test result in your hand before you gather with folks. I hope that's clear enough. That's helpful. I appreciate it. And one last thing, you know, messaging has been my concern. I think we are privileged, quite frankly, to have direct access to you. And those who follow board meetings or, or have computers that can access the county website are privileged to get this information directly. And we know far too many Angelinos are not who don't feel that they have access to the information or just for whatever variety of reasons aren't encouraged to take advantage of the tools you've talked about primarily vaccinations uh, and boosters. And so um, Supervisor Solis had a great motion at uh, the end of November that encouraged uh, the engagement with local ethnic media, social media podcasts, community-based organizations. I'm wondering where we are in the utilization of those tools in keeping with her motion, as well as given the status, the data you shared with us uh, in your presentation, our low numbers of five to 11 year olds um, that have begun the vaccination process. And we've had a couple of outbreaks in Inglewood and Redondo Beach. So could you reply to respond to those two questions? Yes, thank you, Supervisor. Um, uh, so yes, and, and we appreciated that motion and, and obviously have, have been doing a lot and will continue to do a lot. Uh, we think it's really important that 
we make use of lots of different ways people like to get their information. And, and as you've noted, for, for many, many people, uh, it is not through press conferences or even our town halls that are now virtual. Uh, they like to get their information from someone they know, uh, someone they trust at a community organization uh, that provides them with other services and through local, more local, uh, either social media that they're following or local newspapers and outlets. So uh, we are, you know, now, um, con you know, I, I don't think it's con, we have a robust media campaign uh, with local Black and Latinx community newspapers. Uh, we use print ads, we've offered to do columns. Uh, we're partnering with about two dozen local media, uh, social media influencers. These aren't our folks, they're folks that are widely followed by others uh, who are willing to, uh, again, uh, amplify some of the messaging, particularly around vaccinations. Uh, we're also, and I think um, most importantly, uh, are our community-based organizations that we contract with and all of the community health workers. You know we have a community ambassador program, a parent ambassador program, a student ambassador program uh, to really take advantage of the possibility of having more peer-to-peer -peer exchanges. And that's really targeted again uh, in some of our hardest hit communities. Uh, in many places, I, I wanna note that we report out those mobile vaccination teams uh, because it's important access, but it's also important for sharing information because every place you see a mobile vaccine team, there's a community partner. And that community partner really takes a lot of responsibility for getting good information out to the community um, about this opportunity, but also about the opportunity to get their questions answered about vaccine safety and efficacy. Um, so the work I think is, is very layered. Um, obviously trying to do a better job using some paid media, which is where I think in the past we haven't been as targeted. Uh, we've got billboards, we've got, what are they called, like bus tails, I think, uh, bus shelter um, uh, billboards, and all targeted in communities um, that are, you know, really hardest hit and have the lower vaccination coverage. I will say my own personal experience, just, you know, sort of being at our sites, doing door knocking is, um, the the best way for us to share information right now is to give people the opportunity to ask questions, uh, to share with us what their concerns are and feel like we're listening um, and uh, trying to understand their concerns and approach information sharing from that perspective. So we had a huge effort with our faith community. Uh, we asked them uh, to be very, uh, you know, to provide information at, from their pulpits, I think that was pretty successful. Uh, we've done something similar, sending letters to every single parent and household uh, before children went home for the holiday break. Again, you know, with a public health alert, asking people to be mindful of the steps that we need to take to protect each other over the holiday. And I think we have to continue to look for those, um, you know, more direct and in some ways, you know, they we move a little bit slower, but I actually think that will have a bigger impact in the long run. I appreciate that. And let me just uh, reiterate on behalf of the board how deeply we appreciate the two of you, your staff, um, the CBO outreach workers, the community clinic network, the pop-up sites, all of those who will, even though we are entering the holiday season, will continue to do this work to make these additional tools available to every Angelino um, from the bottom of our hearts, we thank you. Um, it's necessary work, it's critical work to help keep Angelino safe. And so thank you both very much and we wish you uh, safe and happy holidays. Thank you. Uh, this report is received and filed. Hearing no objections, that will be the order. We're gonna move on now to our pending items. And we'll begin with item four, the Los Angeles County Social Connectivity Initiative, which was held by Supervisor Solis. Supervisor Solis, you have the floor. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair and uh, colleagues. I know we are all very laser focused on what unfortunately seems to be another COVID-19 surge stemming from this new variant and the serious health consequences as we just heard from our two uh, health uh, directors. 
But we also need to turn our attention to the increase in loneliness and social isolation, especially as this pandemic drags on. Did you know that the increase in social isolation has been driven in part by the pandemic when we were abiding by the safer at home order, spending time apart and away from loved ones? The increase in loneliness is almost paradoxical. We are more than connected than ever through technology, but it is very clear that social media cannot replace relationships with family, friends, and community, that personal touch. Social isol isolation, as you know, is not limited to one age group either. Instead, it's affecting individuals who are at a range of different ages, young people, older adults, and those in between. And studies members have shown that millions of Americans are socially isolated, lonely, or both, negatively impacting their quality of life and health outcomes. In fact, social isol isolation was accompanied by a 29% increased risk of mortality, and loneliness was accompanied by a 26% increase of risk compar comparable to other risk factors associated with obesity and cigarette smoke. And approximately 42 million adults over the age of 45 are estimated to be suffering from chronic Ill loneliness, not illnesses, loneliness. And an online survey of more than 20,000 young adults found that nearly half reported they sometimes or always feel alone. When President Joe Biden appointed Surgeon General Dr. Vikik Murthy, there is an opportunity, I think, for us to tackle this issue head on. His recent book, Together, made a strong case for why loneliness is a public health issue. It contributes to and worsens epidemics like drug addiction and violence. And I believe that right now we have an opportunity and responsibility to address social isolation head on. And as we begin to build our society, social safety net better, and hopefully with the promise of passing the Build Back Better legislative plan in Washington, we find an unmatched opportunity right here in LA County to see how we can ensure that our residents have, have a sense of community, whether it's through activities at our beautiful parks or senior centers or support from the Department of Mental Health. This county can work, I believe, to ensure our residents are connected to their neighbors and to others. This motion members directs our CEO working with relevant county departments like DPH, DHS and DMH and others to report back with the roadmap for this board. This report back will explain what the issues are when it comes to social isolation, which departments are most relevant to helping us address it, and what we as a county can do on this issue overall. I do believe that this issue is very pervasive. It might even be one of those silent killers that's out there, but we need to provide more public awareness about this. So I hope and my expectation is that this motion does just that. And I would respectfully ask for your I vote on this motion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, um, Supervisor Solis. Supervisor Hahn. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Supervisor Solis, for, for bringing this forward. And, you know, I, I thought a lot about this um, this year, particularly when uh, the county lays to rest uh, the unclaimed souls in LA County, uh, people that die uh, and have no one to claim them. We actually keep them, uh, keep their bodies for three years, you know, thinking, hoping, wondering if someone might come forward to claim them. And then, you know, we have this ceremony every year where we uh, lay them to rest. We laid to rest 1,700 uh, souls this year. But I talked about it in my remarks that day as I, I presided over it and all the different ecumenical um, pastors and priests and activists come and everyone sort of speaks to this idea, wouldn't it be great if we could solve this loneliness problem first somewhere in their lives and they probably wouldn't end up uh, you know, dying alone and uh, having no one uh, come forward to, to um, claim them. So I think this is important and I think it really will begin to uh, address this problem and hopefully we can find these people somewhere in their life much, much earlier 
uh, who are suffering from loneliness and see if we can't change the trajectory of their life in a positive way. So I wholeheartedly support this and intend to vote yes. Supervisor Kuehl. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Hilda, I love this motion. I really, really do. And, you know, it's not just about loneliness, though. That is a, an important result. But isolation is something larger than something that is only something that a person does themselves. For instance, um, our, our, I'm hoping that by including our new um, separating out department for aging, which I is also an idea that I really strongly supported and support. Um, there are various transportation um, services provided, one of which has just been canceled. And so I don't want to be isolated, but I am re reliant upon transportation because my kids took my keys away, i.e., and I can't drive myself anymore in my 90s. Okay, I'm, I'm not in my 90s and I don't have any kids and nobody has taken my keys away, but I'm just saying as an example, but I didn't do anything to become isolated. Suddenly, I just don't have transportation. And it's really kind of the same when we look at these um, the electricity cutoffs where you know I am now suddenly really isolated. I can't charge my phone. I don't know what to do. I can't communicate with anybody. I can't even make the buzzer work for the guy downstairs that comes up to help me get out of my apartment, et cetera. So I'm hoping that, not saying any way to amend this, but I'm hoping that in as these departments look at this issue, that they take into account the responsibility of our own services for failing to help people not be isolated and how that is uh, an important aspect of what in the report back, we don't mean to do it, we don't mean to cause isolation, but we're in some cases part of the problem. So I really like this because we're looking at effects. I want us to make certain that we also look at causes, I guess, in a way I'm saying. And um, I, I very enthusiastically support this motion and thank you very much for bringing it. Uh, I too wanna, Supervisor Barger. Go ahead. I'll make, I wasn't going to say anything, but I, this is a great motion, uh, Supervisor Solis. But I just want to point out when you said that, Sheila, it brought up something. That is a case where they become isolated. There are those in, that, that isolate themselves because of depression and, and are at a higher rate of suicide. And I know this board has really talked to Dr. Sharon about being proactive, especially among our youth who have been isolated out of school. Um, who are having a hard time assimilating back into that system. So again, I think it's important for us to keep this on our radar, both for the situation that you talked about, Supervisor Kuehl, I 100% agree, but also for those that are beginning to withdraw, what signs to look for, what are triggers so that we are have a better understanding, especially during the holiday seasons, which tends to be a time when people do um, face a lot of challenges and depression. So. I wholeheartedly support this motion. Thank you. Thank you, and I'd like to echo everyone's um, sentiment. I'd like to thank um, Supervisor Solis for accepting the amendment to actually you know, call out our newly reorganized Department of Aging. I think that's important. And the only thing I would add, I echo what all of my colleagues said, is I think this is an important space for government to occupy. I don't know if any of you all remember, but years ago, 60 Minutes did a expose on the nation of Bhutan. And I fortunately had the opportunity to travel there in the last several years. You know, not only do they have, are they a net zero carbon producing country, but they measure gross national happiness. <laughs> like we measure gross national product. And what's significant about that is because they measure it, and you know what you measure, you focus on. As a government, they focus on addressing what makes their, um, country men and women happy, and what role government must play to create opportunities for that. So just like isolation and loneliness, what role must government play to directly 
provide relief. Um, it, it's not something I think an area where government has occupied space, but just as it's so interconnected, as Supervisor Barger said, to mental illness and isolation and perhaps suicide, ability, what role government plays in exacerbating loneliness because loneliness, we've cut off transportation, whatever. So really thinking about it in terms of our role as provider of services and making sure we're not exasper exacerbating the situation. So thank you very much for bringing forward the motion. I too will be supporting it. Are there any other comments anyone would like to make? Madam Chair, I yes. just quickly want to close by saying thank you to my colleagues, but you know, it dawns on me that there are so many other segments of our society that should be doing a lot more with us, including our colleges, universities, where we have some of our young people now uh, in their dorms and they are taking their distance learning classes there. They're isolated from their family and that's another burden. And these are our young people. In addition, when we talk about isolation and seniors and, and others that have their electric electricity or their phone connection cut off, uh, SCE and our big corporations need to know that and, and be ready to help provide any compensation or assistance. Um, we've had to do this several times when we've had outages in our community, especially in unincorporated areas where they're kind of the last folks that actually get uh, attention. So I agree with all the statements made and hopefully we'll learn more and we'll be able to, to have a greater impact on this issue that is really I think taking taking hold, unfortunately, and we really do have to provide a wraparound assistance in a more meaningful and strategic manner. So thank you all and ask for your eye vote. Thank you. And hearing no other comments, item four is before us. Moved by Supervisor Solis, seconded by Supervisor Kuehl uh, to approve this item. Executive officer, please call the roll. Item four is before you. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn? Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger? Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell? Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you. Moving on to item five, modernize and updated terms for pipeline franchise agreements. Um, I... Um, held the item myself. How do you like that? So uh, first I'd like to thank Supervisor Kuehl for co-authoring the motion with me. And I'd also like to thank the CEO and the Chief Sustainability Office, the Director of the Department of Public Works and County Council for their really hard work and collaboration. We worked carefully with these departments to ensure we created a thoughtful and intentional policy. This work takes time and so this will not be the last time the board will need to deliberate on the actions discussed in today's broader motion. This motion follows the Chief Sustainability Office's recent report back on action taken by this board in September to phase out oil and gas and to protect communities near oil and gas sites. The Chief Sustainability Office's report back included several recommendations regarding pipeline franchise agreements that help to align the county's larger efforts on the phase out of oil and gas with these agreements. These agreements have been seen as pro forma arrangements between operators in the county, but I think it's time that we reconsider this arrangement and take our power back, quite frankly. Franchise pipeline agreements are mechanisms to negotiate contracts with oil and gas companies, and today's motion directs our county departments to implement changes on these agreements that will modernize their fees and create standards to hold operators accountable. This includes new requirements for data sharing and processes for when, owner oper when operator ownership changes or when pipelines are abandoned. More work remains to align franchise agreements with our plan to phase out oil and gas. This motion today also directs county departments to continue their work plan on that. We've asked the Chief Sustainability Officer, Gary Gerald, to make himself available for any questions that any of you might have. And I ask for an I vote. Any questions? Uh, Supervisor Kuehl, floor is yours. Uh, just uh, thank you so much, Madam Chair, for allowing me to co-author this uh, with you. We, uh, as I think we all know, as a county, we have committed to phasing out oil and gas drilling in the county. But as we do so, it's not done yet. It's also important that we update 
our long outdated pipeline franchise agreements uh, and the fee structures to stay on pace with inflation and also the number of surrounding jurisdictions so that we're not uh, you know, looking like a sort of a cheap date where uh, drilling can go on because it's more expensive other places. Uh, we haven't updated our fees in a really long time and we're at the bottom end of the range of what other jurisdictions in the county uh, impose as fees. Uh, so even if our fees were to double, we'd still be in the middle of the range for franchise fees in the county. So, um, and this is important because we wanna use these additional fees to support the Office of Oil and Gas in our just transition work. We remember that we are committed to helping those working in the industry be able to train and move to other similar jobs uh, and not have to be dependent on the oil and gas industry. Very grateful to you, uh, Madam Chair, for bringing this forward and uh, for allowing me to co-author. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Solis, I know you have comments and an amendment you'd like to read in. Yes, thank you very much, Madam Chair. And I want to thank both you and Supervisor Kuehl for authoring this very important motion. A discussion about fossil fuel activities is very timely. We know that, especially for low-income communities and particularly communities of color. They, as you know, continue to shoulder the unequal burden of environmental injustices, as we heard early today, from the extraction of oil and gas and a number of other pollution sources, such as battery recycling plants, rendering plants, and highways in the neighborhoods they live in. As my colleagues have raised, research has shown that oil development can elevate health risks for populations living near extraction sites. This is a higher risk for developing cancer, increased upper respiratory illness, higher hospitalization rates, and of course, asthma. These underserved communities have been overlooked and taken advantage of due to bad corporate policies and frankly, um, corporate greed. I understand the importance of health, safety, and well-being for all of our county residents who live in these long-term and life-altering public health threats. As a county, we must strengthen our commitment to public health and environmental justice for clean air to breathe, equitable and sustainable land use, and of course, living wages. Just this past Sunday, members, I'm reminded that we had an accident that resulted in 1,300 gallons of gasoline in the county-maintained Alhambra wash that connects to the Rio Hondo Channel in the county's flood control system. Currently, we have limited means to seek restitution and remediation to address negative health impacts resulting from this incident. And that's why I want to offer a friendly amendment today, which reads as follows. I therefore move that the Board of Supervisors instruct the Director of Public Works and the Chief Sustainability Office in consultation with County Council to also include in the 120-day report back recommendations for creating a dedicated funding source for environmental cleanup and health and housing-related resources for residents and constituents impacted by oil and gas related incidents. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I respectfully ask for uh, support on the amendment and on the motion. Thank you, Supervisor Solis, if I could just ask you, um, having just seen your proposed amendment um, a little while ago, just if, if County Council, if, if the County Departments you reference have weighed in, have commented on the language, I asked that question, but I didn't get a note back. Just checking in with you. Yes, yes, they did. They have all been contacted, and we worked with County Council on putting this together. Excellent. Thank you. Any other comments or questions from members on item five? Okay, seeing none. Hearing no further comments, item five, as amended, is before us. Uh, the amendment, again, was just read in by Supervisor Solis. Uh, I'll move and ask Supervisor Kuehl to second to approve this item. Executive officer, please call the roll. Item five as amended is before you. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries five to zero. 
Thank you. Moving on to uh, item number seven, memorandum of agreement for provision of mental health services to justice-involved individuals, which was held by Supervisor Hahn. Supervisor Hahn, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just to set the stage for this, colleagues, the LA County Department of Mental Health and Department of Health Services have uh, been working hard over the last few months to agree on terms for an official memorandum of agreement on the provision of services for our Office of Diversion and Reentry. This MOU, MOA is going to allow the Office of Diversion and Reentry to draw down Medi-Cal funds from the state for mental health care provided to its clients, which they have been unable to do before now. And we know that unfortunately the Office of Diversion and Reentry has faced a structural deficit for many years because they haven't been able to access these state funds and have instead relied on one-time funding from the county's general fund. So this MOA is going to give us the opportunity, hopefully, close that deficit and maybe even look at expanding those services. I know it wasn't easy for uh, our two departments to reach this agreement, but they worked really hard to get to this MOA. And now they just need our authority to sign it. So that's what this motion does today. It gives them authority to sign this MOA. Uh, Supervisor Mitchell, I do know that you submitted an amendment uh, on the green sheet. And uh, at, at this time, I'm not in favor of it um, for several reasons. Um, both of these departments reached the MOA together. Um, there might be kinks to be worked out as they move forward, but that's something that I believe the departments have the full authority to work out together. I think it's unnecessary to ask them to spend their time writing reports for us on the impacts of this MOA at this time. I uh, would really much rather they spend their time uh, implementing these programs and adjusting this MOA if needed. Um, and in fact, they do have the authority to amend this MOA as needed. And I've even included a requirement for them to notify us, uh, notify the board before an amendment is uh, happens so that we're aware, well aware of the changes they're making. So I appreciate the attention of your amendment, um, Supervisor Mitchell. Uh, but the point of my motion today was simply to let uh, the two department heads sign an agreement um, that they have already reached. Uh, Supervisor Solis, I know you're my co-author this. I don't know how you feel, but um, I'm, I'm not willing to accept that amendment today. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Not a problem. Um, Supervisor Solis, uh, let me let you speak and then I'm going to, then I'd like to just take a moment to respond um, to the uh, my desire in bringing forward the amendment. And after I do that, then I uh, will recognize you, Super Supervisor Kuehl, fair enough? Supervisor Solis, as co-author. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Supervisor Hahn, for inviting me to be a co-author on the motion. Uh, I think um, you hit, uh, you know, the nail on the head there, just defining the roles of the Department of Mental Health and Department of Health Services. That this is really a care first process and we really do need to get busy to bring down uh, dollars from Sacramento so that we can get reimbursed for some of the work that we're doing. So I believe that um, what's being presented here today will help us better to streamline uh, eligibility for these very critical resources that we know are very much needed and to ensure that we provide the very best care and services for our community. The motion, uh, a memorandum of agreement will establish the roles and responsibilities of Department of Mental Health and DHS for the provision of mental health services to the most vulnerable in our county. And understand, um, uh, Supervisor Hahn, that uh, the Department of Mental Health and Department of Health Services, including County Council, have reviewed uh, this motion as well, set forth by Supervisor Mitchell, and, and they don't believe that it's necessary to be included in the directives in this MOA. So um, I just wanted to say that. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. And let me clarify that I fully support maximizing Medicaid funding to expand ODR services. Um, have brought several motions before us to make sure that we can find a permanent funding source for ODR. So I hope that we actually are able to do this. And I am glad 
It was three years in coming that the two departments were finally able to get an MO MOA. Uh, appreciate your perspective as well as that of county council and feeling that the, the amended language is was unnecessary. So let me just say what my intention will be in terms of holding the two uh, departments who have signed this MOA accountable to making sure that the MOA does nothing to reduce the direct services provided um, to all of our shared constituency. Implementation of this agreement will be complex. That goes without saying. That's why it took so long to get in one. And will require intentional oversight to ensure we deliver the care that our clients need. So it's my hope that the agreement and its operational components will eventually result in an expansion of services for our residents, including ODR's clients, and an improvement in the quality of care. As the departments move forward with negotiating the operational components, we really have to be mindful of the need to prioritize services to ODR's clients. We talked earlier um, on a previous motion about the importance of accountability. And I think there is a difference between accountability and onerous bureaucracy. And so what I am hoping is that through this MOA and others that will be forthcoming is that these departments are mindful that they don't um, require onerous, excessive reports from their community-based uh, organizations partners. Having been the, the CEO of a CBO that had a contract with the county, I understand what that can feel like and what that can be like. And so we can't, in, in one context with ARPA dollars, talk about we want to streamline the process to make CBOs uh, readily available and their ability to access these resources, and yet in another one, continue to put onerous, um, perhaps not even substantiated requirements on them in terms of their reporting. That was my only goal. Uh, through a report back is to make sure that we are clear that we are expanding services to people who desperately need them coming out of both of these departments. So I fully respect um, um, your unwillingness to accept uh, the amendment, but please let the two departments um, be on notice that those are the kinds of questions that we will be asking of them through this MOA process on a consistent basis. Supervisor Shule, uh, Q Shule, That's Sheila and Kewell combined, Supervisor Shule. Hey, Supervi just call me Sam. That's my nickname in high school, and it's, if it works for you, that's Hilarious. Fine. Supervisor Kuehl followed by Barger. Supervisor Kuehl. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, this has kind of been a long time coming. I mean, there has been a lot of work uh, by uh, county council and CEO to try to get these two departments to finally get to an MOA that they're, you know, willing to sign. Um, and I really understand your concern about our providers, but I think we also need to do more technical assistance so that they can participate because sometimes it's not our requirements. For instance, I was concerned personally that um, the amendment, which I know you put forward to, to really protect CBOs and help them be able to do their services would uh, in a way would allow have allowed our contracted providers to say, oh, these Medi-Cal drawdown requirements are very difficult to understand and we have to fill out all this paperwork. And yet we have been telling them, you have got to do Medi-Cal drawdown because otherwise ODR's funding is all NCC and we cannot sustain that. I mean, to say they're not getting enough funding, we are trying to find a way that they get more funding and the Medi-Cal drawdown, as you know very well, Madam Chair, since you've been very um, uh, cognizant of it, is a really important way to do it. So I'm glad that we may find a way to encourage them to continue to participate in all of these programs and maybe find another way to help them do it. Um, that's one of the things that I think we've done. The other thing is uh, ODR is a very, very valuable service, but it's only at a particular point in the entire panoply of mental health services that we are trying to provide uh, in uh, so many, uh, for instance, in our justice involved population, uh, such as we're talking about in this motion. 
and um, we want to make certain that the departments are working in tandem so that we can do all of the different intervention points and not have uh, it stuck in, I'll just use this word, in the pipeline. Um, and so I thank you so much, uh, Supervisor Hahn and Supervisor Solis for bringing this and I feel very strongly uh, supportive of it. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Of course, Supervisor Barger. Thank you. Um, I have a question for Fizia, and because you know I, I was reading this, and first of all, I hope people can access mental health services faster than it took us to get an MOU between two county departments. Um, but having said that, um, my understanding is that now under this MOU, we can draw down federal dollars that were currently being used, and, and NCC was uh, being used prior to this. So is that going to free up and redirect um, an allocation of funding, Fizia? Thank you, Supervisor, for the question. I don't think it's going to, to free up an allocation of funding um, in the sense that we know that ODNR has a structural deficit. I think what it will do is allow ODNR additional funding. So they can provide a local match and then they can draw down uh, the Medi-Cal match. And so my view of it is that basically it will grow the pie, but to the extent that they have a deficit, um, I don't think it, it's probably not the best description to say that it would free up funding. Okay. And I stand corrected that, that that's what I meant. I mean, in other words, this is going to provide us, I mean, I know they were operating in the red, so I, this will provide us with additional resources moving forward. So what yeah. I would say to my colleagues and across the board is, that I hope that there are other areas where we're not having missed opportunities. Um, we are one county family. ODR is an offshoot of many different departments, recognizing that we have to put together community-based services. So I would hope that it doesn't take this board directing departments to do the right thing and put together an MOU. But on this, I'm 100% in favor and accountability, Supervisor um, Mitchell, and, and really looking at the outcomes is vital. And I think that's been a common statement throughout the course of not only what we're doing with ODR, but with homelessness, looking at the outcomes and seeing what we're doing well and where we need to do better. And so I think on this, we're gonna have to, to if it took an MOU to get us here today, I think it's important for us to monitor to see how this plays out to make sure that, that it is doing what in fact is um, written in, in this motion and, and part of the MOU. So I, I'm gonna support this. Um, I think I think that um, I just, I, if I sound frustrated, it's because I am three years. So thank you County Council for playing Solomon. Uh, thank you, Supervisor Barger. And perhaps we'll, we'll lock arms to really ask the two um, departments to keep us updated. There, there's no report back. The, the, I'm not bringing forward the amendment. There wasn't support for that from the two authors, but perhaps we can join together to make sure we figure out a way if CBOs need technical assistance that the two departments do their due diligence to figure that out um, and make it happen. And we will trust that they will do the right thing. With that, item seven is before us, moved by Supervisor um, Han, seconded by Solis to approve this item. Executive Officer, please call the roll. Item seven, as originally proposed by Supervisor Hahn and Solis, is before you, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries five to zero. We're cooking with grease, colleagues. Let's move on to item eight, resolution of acceptance of grant deed modification for Bruce's Beach. Supervisor Hahn held the item. You have the floor. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, and you're the co-author uh, of, of this item today. And colleagues, this is a journey that we've all been on together. And I want to just, uh, again, thank all of you for uh, you know, locking arms on this one since the very beginning, we have really moved along this journey and we're one step closer uh, to returning Bruce's Beach to the remaining descendants of Willa and Charles Bruce. Uh, just to remind everybody uh, in September, 
Governor Newsom signed SB 796 into law. He did it actually at Bruce's Beach in Manhattan Beach, uh, which directed the State Department of Parks and Recreation to amend the land deed to remove the restrictions that prohibited us from transferring ownership of this property. And so now the state has delivered the amended deed to the County of Los Angeles. And this modified deed recognizes the historic injustice that was inflicted against Will and Charles Bruce when their land was taken from them as a part of a concerted racist effort to drive out a successful black business and its patrons. Because of this history, the deed eliminates the restrictions on transfer, paving the way for the County of Los Angeles to return this land. So today, we are issuing a resolution to accept this new deed. Uh, and it seems like a very simple act, but it really has taken a lot of work for us to get here. Um, you know, I, I'm sure you remember when I first realized that the county owned the exact uh, parcels uh, that were taken from Will and Charles Bruce back in the 20s. Um, I just knew in my heart that we had to give it back. So I called our county council and they reminded me that we couldn't transfer this land because the state prohibited it. So we needed to get a law uh, to do that. Uh, Senator C. Bradford was the champion in Sacramento carrying the legislation. It passed unanimously in both houses um, and then the governor signed it. So here we are, um, uh, we're ready to accept this deed. It's sort of the final uh, thing that we do before we then will actually transfer and hand over that uh, parcel, that piece of waterfront property to the remaining Bruce's. Um, and, you know, I, I just wanted to take this opportunity to say that as of last week's redistricting, uh, redistricting commission, I uh, will no longer uh, represent Manhattan Beach. It is no longer in the uh, fourth district. I know we've all felt some shockwaves from, from the redistricting process. Uh, Manhattan Beach has always been in the fourth uh, district uh, from the beginning of time, but now it has been moved into the second uh, district. Uh, and I know my colleague, uh, Holly Mitchell, who has been my partner in this effort in the very beginning, uh, will make sure that we all uh, get this across the finish line. So I, I just wanted to say I've been honored uh, to have had Bruce's Beach in my district. I feel extremely honored that um, uh, I was representing Manhattan Beach when I finally literally woke up and saw uh, and heard and read about the story of Bruce's Beach. And I've, I've said it before, I, I sort of feel like, um, you know, apologizing a little bit that, you know, I grew up in LA County. I learned to swim uh, in El Porto, uh, which is blocks from Bruce's Beach. And I just never realized that we had um, a, a story like this of such immense racial injustice right here in LA County. Um, but, you know, Los Angeles County will be a model um, as we finally transfer this property. We will be a model for the country um, in how you can right a wrong, even if it's 100 years old. And I've said this before, I... I hope we spend the next 100 years in this country looking at all the possible um, opportunities we have to tell the truth and then reconcile and amend and heal uh, the past that you know we were either a part of knowingly or unknowingly. So I'm committed to seeing this uh, through and getting to the, to the finish line, and I have complete confidence that my colleague uh, Holly Mitchell will uh, also uh, take as much stewardship of this as as I have in the past. So thank you, colleagues. Let's accept this deed. It's kind of like one final step before we uh, right this historic wrong. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Hahn. And, and let me say that it's been uh, my absolute pride that you invited me to work with you on this uh, project. Wh who knew then that this additional kind of transfer uh, if you will, was going to happen. None of, neither of us could have ever imagined. Um, but, you know, as I've said previously, you know, 
access to public swimming spaces and swimming equity is a very real thing in this country, in this state, in this very own county. And so this has been an important measure I'm proud to join you with. Uh, this is a very tangled web that we are unweaving. Um, and I look forward to taking the baton and leading as we go forward to figure out what the next steps will be for the county. I don't think this will be our last motion, Supervisor um, Hahn, and I look forward to um, continuing to lead in this effort to make sure that we do this right for so many reasons, prim primarily because it's A, it's the right thing to do, B, because the eye of the country is on us and doing it right will create opportunities um, for other uh, jurisdictions um, to follow in a holistic, comprehensive, and appropriate way. Uh, with that, are there any other questions or comments on item number five? Item number eight. All right, seeing none, been moved by Supervisor Hahn. I will be proud to second that we approve this item. Executive officer, please call the roll. Item eight is before you, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Supervisor Barger? Aye. Supervisor aye. Barger? Sorry, I said aye, 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 aye. Aye, aye. Supervisor Mitchell? Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Moving on to item 25, armed and unarmed security guard services, sole source contract amendments, which is held by Supervisor Hahn. Supervisor Hahn, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, colleagues, um, this board letter um, extends a contract between our Sheriff's Department and Securitas and Allied Universal Security Services. Uh, the sheriff's in the process of writing an RFP for these services, but it won't be done before this existing contract expires. So the extension is for five months plus uh, an, an optional extension for six months. Uh, and this board letter is an example of how important it is for us to look at our contractors and the benefits um, that they provide for their employees. A few weeks ago, my staff met with members of SEIU USWW who represent the con contracted employees like these. And they told us that their members don't have access to affordable health care. Some of the employees have to pay $850 per month, which is unaffordable on their salaries. And that's on top of high co-pays. Uh, you heard many of top of high copays. Uh, you heard many of those employees called in today and uh, talked about they want this contract, but they want to know is there a way for us, you know, to make it better. And I was particularly struck by those who are security guards at hospitals. Um, so they're providing security for people who are accessing health care, and yet they are having a tough time even if affording health care uh, on uh, with these uh, salaries and in these contracts. So this is why Supervisor Solis and I authored a motion at the last board meeting to look at the feasibility of requiring these contractors to provide 100% employee-sponsored health insurance. We expect our CEO to look into this issue and report back with options for the board to make sure that our contracted employees have access to affordable health care. Uh, options like amending existing contracts to make this a requirement, or poss possibly we could even look at including it as future uh, requirements for RFPs. Um, and of course, I always want to look at the possibility of bringing these jobs back in house. Uh, and the contract in front of us is where those options could come into play. So here's what uh, I think we should do. So I propose that we um, vote to uh, approve this five-month extension because it's you know going to be up. And we did hear from many of the callers they want us to approve that, but then they want us to see if there's any room to to improve the contract. 
And we're expecting the report back from the CEO uh, with our options before the five month extension will be up. Uh, but I think we should remove the delegated authority to extend for another six months after this initial five months. Um, I think it's important that we, um, the board sees those options that we'll get back from our CEO uh, before extending this contract, you know, uh, another six months. Uh, so I'm making a motion to amend the board letter to strike the option of extending the contract for an additional six months. And on directive one, I'm proposing to strike the phrase plus an option to extend for up to six additional months in any increment. And then I propose to strike the entire second directive, which reads delegate authority to the sheriff or his designee to execute the additional six months option period in any increment provided it is in the best interest of the county. I have a written uh, uh, what I just said. I think you all have that, but basically, I think we should extend this contract for the five months, get the report back from CEO on, on if there's a possibility to change this amendment, but then just remove the, the authority that the sheriff could extend it another six months before we have an uh, opportunity to see if we can make this contract any better for, our, for the employees and uh, all those workers um, who stand uh, to gain uh, if, if we can improve their benefits. So I hope that's understandable. Thank you, Madam Chair. Supervisor Barger. Thank you, and and I hear you loud and clear, um, Supervisor Hahn. And, and again, I will offer up the fact that this board, not six months ago, entered into a contract without coming to the board um, to contract, I think it's with Allied, it's either with Allied or Universal, um, uh, that is currently providing security. We backed out um, sheriff and put in um, contracted um, security. So if we are going to do this for the sheriff, which um, you know is going to add additional cost to his budget, um, but it's also going to add additional cost to ours. I think we need to do it across the board. Um, we need to lead by example. And again, I bring that up because. And by the way, um, they are a tremendous group of workers in this building. Um, every morning, and I know Supervisor Solis, you know, it's happy Tuesday, happy Wednesday, happy Thursday. Um, great individuals, so I hear you loud and clear, but I want to be consistent. So if we can amend this, but I also want us to know that, that this agency is contracted throughout the county. Um, and, and that we need to be um, with an even hand across the board how we go about applying this. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Solis. Yes, thank you. Um, also, uh, I want to thank Supervisor Hahn for bringing this issue before us. And I agree with uh, what she has laid out um, that any extension to these types of contracts should be considered together with the information that we requested in the motion that you co authored with me earlier this month, Supervisor Hahn. There are people who work, as we well know, in the county, in our county hospitals, our jails, and other offices but they still can't afford health care coverage, which is unfortunate. And we directed CEO to provide the impact and cost of requiring these same employers to provide health care for their employees and dependents, as well as employee benefits. And while we don't want the existing security services to lapse, we should not extend the sheriff's contract <clears throat> any further than immediately uh, until we have the information that's being requested in this, in this motion. So, I wholeheartedly second Supervisor Han, Han's motion to amend the uh, sheriff's board letter and know that we'll have to take a broader view at looking at everything that we do here in the county with respect to contract employees. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. And uh, I, too, um, thank uh, Supervisor Han for bringing this motion forward and, and would go further and say that I think that it's important that we um, evaluate um, the circumstances under which we've delegated authority across the board. I think that's an important responsibility that we have. Any other questions or comments? Okay, seeing none, hearing no comments, item 25 is before us as amended. Moved by Han. As a, okay, yeah, I was gonna ask, so as amended, okay, thank you. If that's, that's your desire, correct? Excellent. Moved by Han, seconded by Solis to approve this item as amended. Executive officer, please call the roll.
Item 25, as amended, is before you. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Moving on to item 31B. A request for a five signature letter urging Riches Products Corporation to bargain and approve a contract with the Bakery, Confectionery, Tobacco Workers, and Grain Millers International Union, Local 37, which was held by Supervisor Hahn. Supervisor Hahn, you have the floor. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, I, I'm really proud to be introducing this motion in support of solidarity with the 175 workers of the Bakery, Confectionery, Tobacco Workers, and Grain Millers. International Union Local 37. Um, many of them uh, also called in today, some from the picket line. Uh, the majority of these workers are Latinx women who have been striking with their children out there on the picket line. These workers have been on strike for the last 51 days at John Donaire Desserts in the city of Santa Fe Springs. This company produces ice cream cakes that are sold in the frozen uh, dessert sections of stores like Bonds, Walmart, um, and also it's, they told me it's the mud pie that's sold in uh, the Red Robin uh, restaurants. Uh, the work the workers do is so labor intensive and as many as 38 cakes per minute move down the production line. In addition, uh, they told me that they are forced to take mandatory mandatory overtime up to 16 hours um, in some cases, having no more than 10 minutes notice uh, before that shift starts. All the workers are asking for is a fair contract that includes a working wage and benefits. One of the main requests is for $1 an hour wage increase each year for the three years to help with their cost of living. The union also represents workers in Tennessee who make on average $6 more than the workers here in Los Angeles. Um, I had the opportunity to go out and meet with them. I think Supervisor Solis, uh, you also took the opportunity to go out and uh, talk with them and we got to hear their stories personally of their mistreatment. And uh, even though this company has harassed the workers, hired temps and shockingly turned the water sprinklers on them I can tell you with full confidence that their resolve is strong and they told me this strike will last as long as it takes. Um, this is why uh, this motion lets Rich's Products Corporation, the parent company of John Donaire Desserts, know that the County of Los Angeles supports these workers and urges the approval of a fair contract. I know personally I'm not going to be buying any ice cream cakes. Uh, from Baskin Robbins, uh, Cold Stone, uh, Vons this holiday season. Uh, it isn't worth it uh, for those mothers who are out there striking in the cold rain with their children. Thank you, Supervisor Solis, uh, for co authoring this motion. I think you have an amendment that you'll be reading. Uh, you know, sometimes we wonder, um, you know, why this board would take up uh, uh, this uh, and add our influence to something like this. But I thought colleagues for us, it's particularly poignant since um, this is majority women uh, who are doing this work. And as an all woman uh, board of supervisors, the first in the history, I know many times each of us have talked in different ways about how we govern differently, how we look at things differently, how our perspective is different, how our life experiences um, shapes the way we govern uh, the County of Los Angeles. And I think this is one of those times when the five of us showing solidarity to, to those women uh, who, again, have been out there since way before Thanksgiving, I think um, goes a long way uh, to uh, really um, ending this and coming to a fair resolution for both sides. Thank you, Madam Chair. Of course, Supervisor Solis. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you also, Supervisor Hahn, for allowing me to co-author this um, really important motion. You know, it strikes me that some of us have served in different capacities. You have served in the Congress. I have served in the Congress. 
I've served in the legislature with um, Sheila Kuehl, my colleague, and it, it doesn't surprise me that we would often uh, bring up uh, legislation or we would bring up topics like this where we saw an injustice happening. Remember, we had full blown hearings on the Thai worker women that were in sweatshop conditions in a, in a complex in my district. So it strikes me that this is just part of what we do because we know that public policy has a place to play here when people are being uh, taken advantage of. And I was proud to join the women yesterday that I met there. Yes, they are Latinas, most of them, a few men. Most of them are immigrant women. Most of them live in the fourth and the first and as far out as in Orange County in Anaheim. And many have been making the, the trip there for many years, helping to provide uh, these wonderful uh, desserts for our county. Uh, and yet, um, they, we find ourselves where their uh, corporate leader there doesn't want to provide them with a, with a balance in terms of giving them better wages and also benefits. And uh, you know what I would say to him is maybe he needs to spend some time outside as these women have been on over 51 days outside of the building, in the cold, in the rain, going through four shifts. And it isn't just the women, it's also their families and their children. So I was very proud to meet with them yesterday. One of, one of our former labor leaders who comes out of SEIU, Raina Schmidt, is the one who contacted us and allowed us to meet the women firsthand and to see what they've been going through. Was proud to hear earlier Ron Herrera chime in, the uh, CEO of AFL-CIO LA County, also in support of the strike. But finding that we really need to lift up the messages when it's women that are being taken advantage of in, in, in this manner. So I do have an amendment uh, that I would like to present and I'd like to read it in. This, the second directive would read as follows. We further move that the Board of Supervisors direct the CEO to send notice to the California Labor Commissioner, the California Labor and Workforce Development Agency, and the National Labor Relations Board, urging them to assure the implementation of fair labor practices through the monitoring of good faith bargaining between Rich Products Corporation and a parent company of Donier Desserts and BCTGM Local 37 in their representative capacity. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I urge your eye vote. Uh, thank you, and I am thrilled to hear about the amendment. Um, uh, I uh, absolutely support the concept of the five member letter, but I just have to say what concerned me given the gravity of what we know that those workers are experiencing was um, if we thought the letter was enough. Um, and uh, having been recipient some time of five member letters when I was a member of the legislature, um, and I'm sure many of you who have been members of Congress having received uh, resolutions from the state legislature, um, it it's, can sometimes be perceived as symbolic, but a passive action. But those actions included in the amendment where we're going to talk about reaching out to the Labor Commission or, or even the National Labor Relations Board, I think adds teeth to this, and I fully support that. I think not just a letter from the CEO, but perhaps calls from us to the owner and to those entities would be even more appropriate. I support the signature, uh, the five signature letter, but um, you know, to hear testimony today that sprinklers are turned on people is reminiscent of past history where water hoses are used against protesters, and I think uh, it requires a similar kind of active action on our part as well um, to not simply send a five-signature letter, but to do all that is within our power as individually elected and a collective board. So I'm very glad to hear the amendment and will be happy to support it. Supervisor Barger. Thank you. And, um, you know, I, I actually have tried to call to talk to the president. Um, I think a five signature letter. I mean, we have a difficult time dealing with our own unions, and we're grappling now with making sure that those that we contract with are providing fair wages and all, and yet we're going to go outside of our ability to, to try to influence something else. And um, there was no answer, so I hope we haven't put them out of business so that now that people don't have jobs. Um, but having said that, um, you know, I am reluctantly going to support this because I really do believe this is a slippery slope that we are going down. Um, but at the same time, you know, based on what I've heard today, and that's why I want to talk to the president, because the kind of tactics used, I want, 
As my mom would say when she would hear from my brother and I on a fight, the truth is somewhere in between. Um, and I think on this one, I want to better understand what is going on um, before I start to throw the full weight of at least the county or at least the fifth district behind um, something. I want to make sure that we have all the facts and I'm just laying it on the table. And so I am going to go straight to the source. You guys mentioned you're absolutely right. I think that communication and words are far stronger than a five signature letter that gets filed away. Um, I think it's important for us to communicate um, because I have a feeling that based on what we're doing today, you're going to have many more coming forward asking this board to win. And um, what I will say is, is that, that, you know, what's right for the goose can right for the gander. In that case, we're going to have a lot of people weighing in with us in terms of how we are treating some of our workforce. And we've had calls today from workers at Martin Luther King. We've had calls from, you know, contract employees that the county contracts with. So, you know, it's going to be a two-way street in terms of how we roll this all out. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Seeing no additional hands raised. Uh, and here, no other comments. Item 31B is before us as amended, as the read-in uh, amendment was just provided. It's been moved by Hans, seconded by Solis, to approve this item as amended. Executive officer, please call the roll. Item 31B, as amended, is before you. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuhl. Aye. Supervisor Kuhl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger? Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell? Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries 5 to 0. At this time, it would be appropriate to hear from supervisors on items not on the posted agenda to be presented or referred to staff or placed on a future agenda. These are our specials. Supervisor Barger. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have one special. Um, it's a reward offer in the shooting investigation of victim Jason Castillo. On Friday, December 3rd, 2021, at approximately 3.10 a.m., Los Angeles County Sheriff deputies from the Lancaster Station responded to a car-to-car -car shooting call on Challenger Way and Avenue K in the city of Lancaster. Upon arrival, responding deputies found Jason Castillo suffering from gunshot wounds to the head and torso immediately performed emergency treatment to victim Castillo. Victim Castillo uh, was subsequently transported to a local hospital and is currently listed in critical condition. It was later learned that after victim Castillo called 911, he drove to a Shell gas station and he was waiting for deputies. The suspect drove his vehicle into the gas station parking lot. The suspect exited the vehicle, approached the victim and shot again as he laid helpless on the ground. Detectives from the Operation Safe Streets Bureau responded to scene and began conducting an extensive investigation into the incident. During the investigation, detectives determined the suspect was a male wearing a green shirt, black shorts, baseball hat with an LA Dodgers logo, white socks, and black shoes. The suspect was last seen driving a white four-door BMW sedan. The vehicle has visible traffic collision damage to the front driver's side and passenger side of the vehicle. Any individuals with information about this crime are urged to contact the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department Operation Safe Streets or Crime Stoppers. I therefore move that the Board of Supervisors offer a reward in the amount of $10,000 in exchange for information leading to the apprehension and conviction of the perpetrator or perpetrators responsible for the shooting of victim Jason Castillo. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, um, Supervisor Barger. This special will now become agenda item 33A. Are there any uh, members who would like to speak on it before we take a vote? Seeing none, agenda item 33A is before us, moved by Supervisor Barger, seconded by Supervisor Mitchell. Uh, Executive officer, please call the roll. Item 33A is before you, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you very much. We are moving into our adjournments in memory. At this time, it would be appropriate to hear them. We'll begin with 
uh, Supervisorial District 1, Supervisor Solis. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, today, I'd like to move that when we adjourn in memory, that when we adjourn, I'm sorry, let me start that over. I'd like to move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Patrick Henning Sr. He passed away recently at the age of 75. Many people in the labor movement throughout this great state of California are mourning his loss. He was a leader in so many ways, and I had the honor and privilege of working with him as he worked for me as staff director to both the assembly and the Senate labor committees in Sacramento. In particular, he helped me pass a statewide initiative in 1996 to increase the minimum wage from 425 to 575. He was so skillful and committed to this fight for workers throughout the state. He went on to serve as the state's labor commissioner and the director of the state's employment development department. He was also executive director of the Catholic Labor Institute of Los Angeles, chair of the Developmental Disabilities Area Board, and a staff sergeant in the United States Marine Corps Reserve. Patrick, as many of you know, was a humble man who cared deeply about others. He is survived by his wife, Gina, of over 50 years, three children, four grandchildren, and a whole host of family members who will miss him dearly. May he rest in peace. Hilda, I'd like to join you on that if I might. Thanks Absolutely. So yes, thank you. I also would like to move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in the memory of Vicente Fernandez. The singer was known around the world as El Rey, the idol of Mexico and the king of ranchero music. He passed away last week at the age of 81. Generations of Latino households around the world grew up with his music, including my family. The passion in his voice will never be forgotten as he truly touched many hearts with his songs. His iconic rendition of the song, Volver, Volver, propelled him to fame. But it is in another major hit, Portu Maldita Amor, that displayed his themes of love and loss. His musical influence extends far beyond Mexico, permeating much of Latin America and the United States. May he also rest in peace. Thank you, Madam Chair. Hilda, can I join you on that one? Me too. Corto maldito amor. Yes. Beautiful. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on to the second district, uh, I ask that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of a member of the uh, county family, Deputy Probation Officer Marisha Collins. DPO Collins, a dedicated employee of the LA County Probation Department for 27 years, was the innocent victim of a street racing accident on December 10th in Fontana. At the tragic time of her passing, she was on her way home from purchasing gifts for children whose parents are incarcerated as a part of a church charity event that she was organizing titled Angel Tree Program. Collins lived a life of service both at work and in her spare time. She was dedicated to all those affected by the juvenile justice system, both directly and indirectly. In her most recent position, she worked as a family finding specialist with the probation, child welfare, placement permanency, and quality assurance unit. She is survived by her loving husband, Emmanuel, two children, Marlon and Melissa, sister Myron, and brother-in-law, Byron, who worked for the probation department also, and a host of family and friends and colleagues. Her lasting impact in the lives of the youth she worked with, her kind heart and infectious smile will be deeply missed by all who had the honor and privilege of knowing her. When we adjourn today, I ask that we adjourn in memory of Alvin P. Seabrook. Mr. Seabrook, lovingly referred to as Al, was born July 1st, 1924 in Savannah, Georgia, and he passed away this past November 14th at the Tender age of 97. After graduating from Savannah State College with a bachelor's degree in business administration, Mr. Seabrook followed in his mother's footsteps and secured a career as an educator where he taught math at high, at high school in Georgia for several years. In 1953, he married the love of his life, Danella, who happened to be a teacher at my alma mater, 42nd Street Elementary School. And two years later, they moved to Los Angeles. In Los Angeles, he passionately taught math at middle and high schools in the Compton Unified School District and taught real estate classes at LA Southwest College. In 1972, he received a Master of Arts degree in education from Cal State Dominguez Hills 
And in 1984, he retired after 30 years of service to the students in Compton Unified. Mr. Seabrook lived a full life and will be remembered as an educator, activist, loving father and grandfather who enjoyed listening to jazz, music as a saxophonist, traveling and spending time with family and friends, and telling jokes. He survived by his daughter Tamara, two grandsons, David and Ross, and many family members and friends who will miss him dearly. And lastly, colleagues, I'm not sure how many of you are aware, but we lost uh, a former elected official um, here uh, in the passing of former Assemblyman Willard Murray, Jr. Uh, most recently, Mr. Murray was director of the Water Replenish Replenishment District of Southern California, um, where he served for over 20 years. Mr. Murray was 90 years old when he passed away just in the last few days. Again, he was a member of the Water Replenishment uh, District for 20 years and served in various leadership roles, including board president, vice president, secretary, and treasurer. And again, prior to be joining the board, he served as a California State Assembly member for the 52nd Assembly District for four terms from 1988 to 1996. In addition to his vast legislative and political experience, uh, uh, many of us are well aware of his long-term engagement in politics, particularly in South Los Angeles. Um, uh, he's very, very active for many years. He also probably served in the United States Air Force during the Korean War from 1951 to 1958. After returning home from the war, he became very active in the civil rights movement here locally. He will be remembered as a policy shaper and public servant as well as a loving husband uh, to his wife Barbara who passed away a number of years ago and father um, to uh, um, two leaders in their own right former State Senator Kevin Murray, uh, and to Melinda Murray, who is a member of the county family. He will be remembered by many for his uh, gregarious laugh, his cunning wit, and truly his political acumen. I see hands going up. Do you all want to speak, or do, would you like to be like added? All, it looks like all members. Well, of, course. Join you on this. of course. Of yeah, course. So I didn't know if any of you, them, you know. if any of you served with him, if you wanted to speak, but absolutely, please, all members, join me. Supervisor Kuehl. Thank you so much. In 1994, when I was elected, so I overlapped with Willard for two years. Kevin was also elected to the assembly, uh, Willard's son, and um, it was the first time in 25 years that uh, the Democratic Party had not actually controlled the assembly. It was exactly an even split. 4040. Um, and um, there were a number of recalls um, instituted, and we actually had a Republican speaker. Uh, we had about 14 different speakers as we were going through those first tumultuous two years. And at one point, the, uh, the new speaker decided that it would be a great joke if he made Willard and Kevin sit next to each other on the floor. <laughs> and they were both quite fine about it. Uh, they certainly did not want anyone to think that was a joke at all. But I remember that Willard was always very um, kind and, you know, always would find a, a, the, the humanistic point to make in caucus. Um, and one that, that we may not have thought of and one that we really appreciated. Uh, and I have to also say that as the first gay person elected up there, I wasn't really sure what kind of a, you know, greeting I was going to get. And Willard, Willard was just great to me. So I, I am so sorry to see him go and would really like to join in this adjournment. But I think, as Janice said, we, we're probably all going to want to join in. But thank you, Madam Chair. Absolutely. I um, gladly invite everyone else to join in. Would anyone else like to speak? Thank you very much. I, yeah, I would just say, you know, I would just say, yeah, we've, you know, I feel like I've known Willard my entire life, longtime friend of my family. And of course, I've been friends with Kevin uh, for a long time, too. He, uh, Willard, as you said, Sheila, just really, uh, you know, found those moments, those kindness. Um, there was uh, one time I was in a, uh, a, a campaign, a, a political race against someone else, and he didn't want to 
uh, come out publicly against that person, but he, he made it very clear to me uh, one time when, when we were together that he was going to do everything he could behind the scenes uh, to, to help me. So uh, just a, a, a good man, lived an incredible life, uh, served uh, the people of California uh, for so many years. And again, his, his family is one um, that has dedicated their lives as well to public service. So our condolences certainly um, to the family. And I wanted to give a special shout out to, to Kevin and, and know what it, it's always hard to lose a dad, even when they're, um, you know, 90 or so, it's, it's hard to lose a father, particularly if you've, if they have had the same uh, political interest. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for that. And again, ex extending our condolences to both Melinda, a member of our county family. She works for the district attorney, the district attorney, as well as Kevin and his wife and children. We'll move on to District 3, Supervisor Kuehl. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I uh, ask that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Ken Cragen, a uh, top entertainment producer, a manager, and a philanthropist uh, who just passed away last week. He was a uh, Harvard Business School graduate uh, whose credits included producing the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour and the Gambler television movies that starred Kenny Rogers. As a talent manager, he worked tirelessly on behalf of his clients, some of whom included Kenny Rogers, uh, Lionel Richie, Trisha Yearwood, the Bee Gees, and uh, Olivia Newton-John. Uh, his most famous project began uh, in late 1984 with a phone call from Harry Belafonte, who was anxious to raise money for people who were starving in Africa, uh, notably in Ethiopia, where a famine had killed millions of people. Uh, and according to Belafonte, Ken was hesitant at first, but eventually said yes to helping Belafonte organize a number, and I mean a large number, of very well-known singers for the famous song and album, We Are the World. It went on to sell tens of millions of copies and won Grammys for record and song of the year. It raised $64 million for poverty alleviation across Africa and the United States. Uh, and uh, Ken later received a United Nations Peace Medal. Uh, he continued to be very active in charity events, organized a number later in his life, including Hands Across America fundraiser in 1985 with a cross-country human chain of 6.5 million people holding hands across the entire country, uh, including a few that we recognize like, oh, President Reagan, Yoko Ono, I don't know if they were holding each other's hands, um, and Robin Williams. Uh, he survived by his wife, Kathy, and uh, their daughter, Emma. He was quite a force, a lovely man, and never really reluctant to take a risk when it meant that something good would come out of it. I mean. Think about those events. Um, and I ask that when we adjourn today, we also adjourn in honor of Jack Norris, who was a brilliant engineer whose career included the design of hydraulically powered flight controls for Boeing aircraft, audio animatronics for the Abe Lincoln and Pirates of the Caribbean rides at Disneyland, the NASA Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo space controls, and was technical director for mission control of the Voyager nonstop around the world flight. He served in the uh, US Air Force as an engineer in the Technology Center at Wright Field in Dayton, Ohio. And he owned and flew a 1947 Luscombe for 60 years for all you aviation fans. He was a proud member of Wings Over Wendy's and he survived by his daughter, Cheryl. And I ask that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in honor and memory of a man who was tangentially uh, a relative of the third district for a long time, Arthur Nisman, who died on November 28th. He graduated Stuyvesant High School at the age of 16. And after college, he worked in advertising, moved to LA in 1966 to work with Ogilvy and Mather and was creative director and copywriter and ultimately formed his own agency. Maybe most importantly to the third, 
He was a very active and beloved member of the Topanga community. He committed himself to Topanga's disaster radio team, volunteered with friends of the Topanga Library, served on the Pierce College Foundation Board, the Topanga Symphony, and the Topanga Community Center. For Arthur, as you would always say, there were no strangers, just people he had not yet met. He survived by his wife, Susan, who was a longtime member of our county family, um, working with Zev all the time he was here, and uh, their three children, Zoe, Max, and Peter. And uh, finally, I ask that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Eve Babbitts. We've been reading a lot about Eve in the paper and uh, from her many, 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 many friends and uh, admirers. She was the once and future it girl of Los Angeles, wrote with sharp wit, connoisseurs, enthusiasm of our LA outsized characters, our sensuous pleasures from taquitos to LSD and got great critical acclaim and a new audience late in life and sadly passed away just four days ago. Part West Coast wild child, part boho intellectual. She was born in LA, the child of an artist and a violinist, and her love of music was instilled in her through her father and godfather, Igor Stravinsky. After graduating from Hollywood High School, she became known all over LA as a hedonist with a notebook. She hung out at the Troubadour, the West Hollywood Club where she met and designed album covers for bands and singers like Buffalo Springfield, The Birds, and Linda Ronstadt. In 1963, she created a pretty big stir in Los Angeles culture when photographer Julian Wasser photographed Eve without a stitch of clothing on, playing chess with Marcel Duchamp. The black and white image became so famous, it actually is included as a poster in the Museum of Modern Art. She tried to get a book published at the age of 20, but failed. So she moved to New York and worked for an alternative village paper. She also introduced Frank Zappa to Salvador Dali and worked as a secretary for a Madison Avenue ad salesman. In 1974, at the age of 30, her first book, Eve's Hollywood, a memoir in shard-like essays, was published. In the dedication, which runs to many, many pages, she thanks her orthodontist, her gynecologist, the Chateau Marmont, Freeways, Sour Cream, and Rainier Ale. She would then go on to write five more books, autobiographical novels like Sex and Rage and L.A. Woman, featuring her alter egos uh, and essay collections like Slow Days, Fast Company, The World, The Flesh, and LA, as well as countless magazine articles. But in the past decade, she's had quite a revival with a generation of young book influencers like Emma Roberts, Instagram's Bellatrist, trumpeting her work, reissued by several publishing houses starting in 2015, so that she's now published in 12 countries and has made 10 times the earnings that she made in the first round of book sales. She was one of a kind. And there are so many people wanting to write about her. I really encourage everybody to read anything you can about Eve Babbitts. She was an original. She survived by her sister, Mirandi. And those are my adjournments. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Moving on to District 4, Supervisor Hahn. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in the memory of uh, the Honorable William C. Applegate. Uh, Bill, a former Torrance Council member, uh, passed away at the age of 78. He served in the United States Air Force and worked as a cryptographer. After his military service, he moved his family to Torrance. Bill was very active in the community and served four terms on the Torrance City Council. Bill will be remembered for his dedicated volunteerism. He was the longest serving member of the Board of Directors for the YMCA of Metropolitan Los Angeles, having served more than 38 years. He was also on the YMCA's National Board of Directors and was active with the Torrance South Bay YMCA's 
Board of Managers until his passing. Bill is survived by his wife, Linda, his sons, Mark and Eric, three grandchildren and two great grandchildren. I also move that when we adjourn, we adjourn today in the memory of Taiko Iwanaga, who was a resident of Torrance and passed away at the age of 96. Taiko grew up on a farm in Torrance, but during World War II, she and her family were uprooted from their home and sent to an internment camp in Jerome, Arkansas. It was at the camp that she finished her studies and earned her high school diploma. After the war, she returned to Torrance with her husband and they lived out the rest of their lives there. I also move that when we adjourn, we adjourn today in the memory of Doris Topsy Elford, uh, affectionately known uh, by the community as Mother Doris. Uh, she passed away, she was 90 years old. Mother Doris had a long career in public service and worked for the Los Angeles County as a deputy probation officer for 19 years. In 1992, Mother Doris made history as the first black woman elected to the Long Beach City Council. She later co-founded the African American Heritage Society and received a number of service awards and recognition over the years, including being named Woman of the Year in 1994. In 2003, she broke barriers, again becoming the first black woman to serve on the Long Beach Harbor Commission. Mother Doris will be remembered as a loving trailblazer who helped pave the way for many women, particularly black women. She is survived by her husband, Ralph, and many, many family and friends, and I would consider myself one of them. I knew Doris uh, for so long, and she was always just a delight to be with and always encouraged me uh, in my uh, political pursuits. She lived a great life and certainly left Long Beach uh, a better place than where, when she found it. I also move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in the memory of uh, Dottie Hill, who was a legendary resident of San Pedro. She passed away at the age of 95. Dottie always thought of her life as a Cinderella story. She grew up with meager means in New York City, became a nursing cadet, married the man of her dreams, and moved to Los Angeles to start her family. Later in life, she went back to college and graduated from Cal State Long Beach with a BA in home economics and a teaching credential. She went on to become the chair of the home economics department, remember when we had that, uh, at Southgate High School. And Dottie went on to become a substitute teacher at Dodson Middle School in San Pedro. And after retirement, because she just couldn't stand the thought of sitting around all day, she joined the team at Trader Joe's in RPV, where she worked as the store ambassador until the age of 93. There was Dottie when you walked into Trader Joe's with her trademark um, white hair up in a bun, saying hello to everyone. And uh, I remember uh, when my um, son would take my grandchildren when they were teeny tiny uh, to Trader Joe's, uh, for some reason, Dottie just captured their imagination and they would always uh, speak and wave uh, hello to Dottie, even sometimes when they, they wouldn't speak to other people. Uh, Dottie's life was always one of service to others. She was never more evident than in her service that she gave to her church. Um, she and I were both members of the First Presbyterian Church in San Pedro. She was there for over 60 years. Um, I'm really going to miss seeing Dottie. Uh, she lived a good life. She's survived by her three sons, Bill, Mark, and Matthew, four grandchildren, and three great-grandchildren. Rest in peace, Dottie, you deserve it. I also move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in the memory of Jerry Ronan, who was 95 when he passed away, resident of Torrance. Jerry served in the Navy for two and a half years, which led him to his 37-year teaching career at Torrance High School. Um, he taught English, history, served as a guidance counselor. After retiring, uh, in 1992, he joined the Torrance Historical Society and was instrumental in the Veterans Memorial Project known as the Names on the Wall. He served the community of Torrance with his involvement with the Torrance Cultural Arts Foundation, the Torrance Theater Company, the Downtown Torrance Association, and served on the selection committee for Torrance's Students and Government Day. Jerry was awarded the prestigious Jared Sidney Torrance Award for his lifelong dedication to the community of Torrance. 
He's survived by his sister, Helen, his niece, Kay, and nephews, Timothy, Tyrone, and Thomas, and numerous grandnephews and grandnieces. And my last one, uh, colleagues, I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in the memory of, of Mary uh, Utrinich, a longtime resident of San Pedro who was 89 when she passed away. As a young adult, Mary moved from Slovenia to San Pedro where she met her husband and started a family. Mary was a devout Catholic with a special devotion to Jesus and Mary. She attended Holy Trinity Catholic Church in San Pedro for many years and was active in the parish's Ave Maria Society. Mary is preceded in death by her husband, John. She survived by her five children and seven grandchildren. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. And we'll move on to Supervisorial District 5, Supervisor Barger. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move that when we adjourn today, we do so in memory of Frank Bla, the longest serving coach in the Antelope Valley College history, died December 3rd at the age of 66. He retired from coaching football at the Antelope Valley College after the 2004 season, serving a 27 year tenure that was the longest of any ABC coach. He also had a four year run as head coach of the Marauder baseball team. Frank retired from the Antelope Valley College as a professor in 2016 ap after teaching at the college for 37 years. Frank was inducted in 2012 into the California Community College Football Coaches Association Hall of Fame. Frank was born on September 14, 1955 in Palmdale and grew up on his family's Antelope Valley farm. Frank played football at ABC in 1973 and 74 earning all-conference, all-state, and all-American honors as a defensive lineman both years. Frank was captain of the 1974 team that won ABC's first state championship. Survivors include his wife, Gayla, daughter, Ashley, father, Andrew Blau Sr., and brothers, Andrew Jr. and Matthew. Also that we adjourn in memory of Travis Clark French, a beloved teacher at Joe Walker Middle School in Quartz Hill, who passed away unexpectedly on Thanksgiving Day at the age of 54. Born on December 5th, 1966 in Libby, Montana, Trevis grew up on a ranch in Salmon, Idaho. While at college, he met and married the love of his life, Shannon Selway, in 1988. They had two children, Chatre and Zachary. After graduating in 1989 from Western Montana College, Trevis worked, went to work teaching at Joe Walker Middle School Stealth Academy in Lancaster, California. In 1991 and 92, Trevis taught math in Libby, Montana, then returned to the Antelope Valley. Trevis taught algebra and geometry for 32 years and was named in Who's Who Among America's Teachers and was honored as Teacher of the Year on multiple occasions. Every summer, Trevis went home to Montana to help on the family ranch, working with cattle, harvesting, hay crops, etc. Trevis was also a talented artist designing handcrafted works in leather, metal, and wood. Trevis leaves behind his wife, Shannon, children, Chatre, and Zachary, his parents, two brothers, and a sister, along with many aunts, uncles, cousins, nieces, nephews, great nieces, and great nephews. Also that we adjourn in memory of Glenda June Kennedy, longtime resident of Pasadena and sister of Lena Kennedy, and Pasadena Council Member John J. Kennedy, who passed away on December 8th at the age of 56. Glenda attended schools in Pasadena, including San, R San Rafael Elementary School, Cleveland Elementary School, McKinley Junior High School, and Blair High School. She worked for the U.S. Postal Service. She was a faithful member of Lincoln Avenue Christian Church for over 35 years. Glenda will be missed by her family, the Kennedys, who are close and a loving family. And she is survived by her sisters, brothers, 38 nieces and nephews, and a host of relatives and friends throughout the community. Also that we adjourn in memory of Antonio Souza, who served on the Palmdale City Council from 1976 to 1984, who died October 22nd at the age of 93. Born December 17th, 1927, at his family's ranch in Coswell, Arizona, Antonio grew up in Los Angeles. He joined the Merchant Marines in 1945, then served in the U.S. Army for 22 years. A member of the U.S. Army Marksmanship Unit, he won five gold medals and one bronze medal 
at the International Military Sports Council Tournament in 1961 in Rio de Janeiro. Antonio became a Palmdale resident during his last posting at the Nike Hercules missile site on Mount Gleason. He retired from the Army in 1972 with the rank of Chief Warrant Officer. Antonio then went to work for the Pacific Telephone Company as a telecommunications manager and later was hired by Lockheed. He retired again in 1993. While residing in Palmdale, he was a member of the Veterans of Foreign Wars, Knights of Columbus, and other organizations. Antonio married Margaret Margot Escobado in, on April 21st, 1951, and she died in 2012. Antonio survived by four children and their spouses, three grandchildren, and five great-grandchildren. And last, I move that the Board of Supervisors adjourn in memory of the following individuals who were identified as, as indigent veterans by the Los Angeles County Medical Examiner and were subsequently buried with dignity and honor at Riverside National Cemetery in the last month. Stephen, March, Stephen Martin Corchado, Marine Corps, Michael Scott Derry, Army, Drew Bradford Feldman, Army, Joseph Theo Cornell, Army, James E. Harris, Air Force, David Rodman Meyer, Navy, Larry James Miller, Army, James Henry Reed, Navy, Lawrence Edward Rogers, Army, Willie Charles Starr, Marine Corps, and Jerome M. Zimmet, Army. May their contributions and their sacrifices in service to our country never be forgotten. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Supervisor Barger. And if you would allow me, I'd like to join in the uh, adjournment in memory of Glenda June Kennedy of, as well. Thank you very much. So thank you all. We will take all the motions as seconded. If there are, is no objection to a unanimous vote, such will be the order. Executive officer, will you please read us into closed session? Thank you, Madam Chair. In accordance with Brown Act requirements, notice is hereby given that the Board of Supervisors will convene in closed session to discuss item CS1, conference with legal counsel regarding anticipated litigation, and item CS2, department head performance evaluation, as indicated on the supplemental agenda. Thank you. Thank you.